Hey everybody, welcome to the project overview video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. So in the next series of videos, you're going to learn how to build a data analysis library completely from scratch using the Python programming language. The end result is going to be a fully functioning library that's going to be very similar to Pandas and we will affectionately call it Pandas Cub. The target student is someone who already understands the fundamentals of Python. So this project is not for beginners and it is assumed throughout that you have already acquired these basics. It is for students who desire to immerse themselves in a larger and more comprehensive project. It is for those who desire to learn more advanced Python topics particularly uh, usage of the Python data model, which should be touched on in several of the steps. And it's for those who wish to learn more about basic software development. So you're going to learn about setting up your own environment and conducting unit tests. This is a very long project. You're not going to be able to complete it in just an hour or two. It's going to have 40 steps in it. There's going to be one video per step. There are a hundred unit tests that have already been written that need to be passed in order for the project to be completed. And it'll take approximately 10 to 20 hours to complete. Just a little bit about me. My name is Ted Petru. I founded a company called Dunder Data. We specialize in training those who are interested in the fundamentals of data science and machine learning. I have written a few books. Panda's Cookbook is a book that uh, covers recipes on how to use, use the Pandas library effectively on real-world data sets. I have written an introductory Python book for those who have no experience programming. It is called Exercise Python and it has about 100 free exercises. It is available for free on my website. I have an upcoming book called Master Data Analysis, Master Data Analysis with Pandas. This will be even more thorough coverage of the Pandas library and how to um, do data analysis with it uh, idiomatically. I've also authored two Python libraries called Dexplow and Dexplot. Dexplow is very similar to Pandas and it does data exploration. It is uh, what was the genesis of this particular project, actually. So Dexplow has a little bit more functionality than Pandas Cub, but it is uh, built uh, somewhat similarly. And Dexplot is a library that does plotting, um, and it's very similar to the Seaborn plotting library uh, in Python. All right, yes, and I do offer uh, data science and machine learning classes, and you can find them at dunderdata.com along with all my books. All right, so the prerequisites um, in terms of what knowledge you need to have before taking, this, taking on this project, you certainly need to know all the basic types in Python, and uh, the common data structures, tuples, lists, sets, and dictionaries, we'll be using all of those very frequently. So you'll have to be very familiar with those data structures in order to uh, be able to complete the project. Um, control flow, obviously uh, if-else statements, very important. Um, a little bit more advanced are for loops, when, uh, especially when iterating through lists or dictionaries. We'll be doing that quite, quite often. Something that is not um, terribly common for, for beginning beginners is raising and handling exceptions. Now this is not a maybe a strict prerequisite you can uh, learn these along the way, but it will help if you have had exposure to them before. Um, you will need to know the basics of classes and object-oriented programming, so I'm not going to cover the very basics of, of classes, and, um, but it's something that you definitely need to be uh, familiar with and know how to at least um, define a, a basic class. There's some very good videos by a guy named Corey Schaefer that I've linked in the description. I would recommend watching a few of those before uh, embarking on this project if you have not done any work with classes before. 
So we are going to heavily rely on the NumPy library. So exposure to NumPy is going to be quite important. If you have not had exposure to NumPy, um, you will probably still be able to um, get by. There, I have linked in the description a quick start to NumPy. Um, exposure to Pandas is also helpful. We will not be using Pandas to build our library, but uh, we will be making our library so that it is similar to Pandas. So if you have uh, if you have experience with Pandas, then it will help you understand uh, what the what our what our library is attempting to do. All right. So here are the major objectives for uh, for this entire project. So yes, the end result, as I've already mentioned, is to build a library similar to Pandas. So we're going to have one main class, and that's the data frame class. It's the same main class that, that Pandas has. The data will be stored in NumPy arrays. We will, uh, our, we will be able to read in data from a comma-separated value file. So it's very important that we can uh, at least read in data and not have to manually type it out. So we'll have a simple way of getting data in from text files. We'll, be, we'll have a nicely formatted display of the data frame in the notebook. So if you're familiar with pandas, you'll, you'll know that it, it shows its, um, its data frames as a nice HTML tables in Jupyter Notebooks. Our data frame will be able to select subsets of data with just the brackets. That's a universal way of selecting subsets of data with Python as the brackets operator. Our data frame will be able to do that. We will also define many special methods and these are covered in the Python data model. So more details on that when we get there. Our data frame will implement all the basic aggregation methods, such as sum, min, max, mean, and median. Aggregation methods are those that return a single value. They summarize a sequence of values with a single number. And then we'll have uh, you know, several non-aggregating methods, the ones that don't return a single value. So for instance, is and a just returns whether uh, a value is true or false, or whether a value is uh, missing or not. It returns a Boolean, true or false. You know, unique will be able to return all the unique values of a column and, and so forth. So there are many other non-aggregating methods that we will implement. A very common thing to do in a data analysis is to group by one uh, column or more than one column. Our data frame class will be able to group by one or two columns and we will be able to aggregate uh, another variable. So it's a very important um, fundamental you know, functionality that we will uh, include in our data frame. And lastly, uh, we will have methods specific to string columns. So string columns are handled uh, you know, certainly differently than numeric columns. Uh, many of the aggregation methods don't really make much sense with string columns such as sum, you typically don't sum a string column, you can't really take the mean or median. So we'll have a specific functionality just for those string columns, like making it uppercase or lowercase. It will coincide with the string functionality available in regular Python strings. Okay, a little bit uh, that you'll learn about software development. So we will be creating a specific environment just for this project, which will help isolate um, know our work so that we can ensure its quality and a very large part of the project is going to be based on something called test driven development and I'll talk about that more later but this will ensure quality again by making sure that our data frame is able to pass all these tests and we're going to be using the excellent PyTest library that uh, helps out with unit testing all right, so that concludes this first introductory video. I will go through some examples in the very next video inside a Jupyter Notebook. All right, uh, looking forward to it. Follow me there. Hey everybody, welcome to the second video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we're gonna be looking at some specific examples from the Pandas Cub Library which is the final product that you will produce at the end of this project. So I have a Jupyter Notebook here 
that's open that I will use to show you um, some of these examples from Pandas Cub. So the first thing I'm going to do is just simply import uh, Pandas Cub into my namespace. I'm going to alias it as PDC. Pandas is by convention aliased as PD. Now, um, one of the first things that I will show you is how Pandas Cub is able to read in data from an external file. So Pandas Cub has a function called readCSV. It's the same uh, function that's available in the Pandas library, but it is far simpler. It only has one parameter available to it, and that is a string of the file location where the CSV is located. So we'll be able to read in only comma-separated value files and only very simple comma-separated value files. So there is an employee.csv file in the data folder in my current setup that it will read in as a data frame. So that's nice that it is read in this data, but um, as an analyst, it's important to actually have a visual representation of this. So we're going to learn how to format a display of the data frame inside of a Jupyter Notebook. So if we put the data frame variable name, df, in one of the cells by itself, we will display uh, the representation of it. So as you can see here, we're going, we have a nice display in our notebook that has um, the columns and the rows um, just like this. So that uh, completes these two uh, tasks up there. There is a head method that returns just the five, first five rows. I like to use this to shorten up the output and to not pollute um, the notebooks with, with lots of rows of data frame. All right, let's move on. Our data frame will also be able to select subsets of data with the brackets operator. So the brackets operator is a universal way that Python has given to developers and to users to select subsets of data. So let's go ahead and look at the, uh, the data frame again, at least the head. So uh, there are many types of functionality that are available to the brackets operator with pandas cub. The simplest one is to, to select a single column of data with uh, just the string name given to the brackets operator. So for instance, if I wanted to select the department column, I would just simply put uh, the, the name of that column as a string inside the brackets and I would get just that column. So head here is used again just to get the first five rows. I'm going to cover a few other examples of what Pandas Cub is able to do. So not only will it, able, will it be able to select a single column, but it will be able to select multiple columns if you give it a list. So for instance, let's say I want to find or ret retrieve the department and um, salary of our data frame. Well, then I can just give a, a list of the column names inside the brackets operator, and I will get that. So that's how you would get uh, multiple columns. Now, it'll, you can also select uh, rows and columns simultaneously. So rows you can select with their integer location. So for instance, if, um, if we wanted to select rows 10 and 50 and 30, they don't have to be in any order, and we wanted to select the columns, uh, let's just do the same columns, department and salary, we could give the brackets operator both rows and columns separated by a comma. So this will do simultaneous selection of rows and columns. <clears throat> and in this case, we return three rows and two columns. Uh, so those correspond to the 10th, 50th, and 30th rows and the department and salary columns. Now, the data frame will also be able to select with slices so for instance, if we wanted to select um, you know, rows 10 through 20, along with columns, uh, let's keep the same columns, say a department and salary, you could do this. You could also select with uh, numerically like this, so from the second column to the end. Okay, um, so there are other combinations um, that are available to you. But I want to show one more, and that is Boolean selection, a very um, necessary, you know, uh, a ne very necessary thing to do with uh, 
and data. So Boolean selection selects data by the values and not by the column names or the, the row locations. So for instance, if I was interested in selecting only those employees that had a salary of greater than 100,000, we could first create a Boolean mask like this. And I could save this to you know, some variable name. It's called filt for filter. I'll go ahead and output the first five rows. I can then go ahead and use this. I can pass this into the brackets and it will select only the rows which are employees, only the employees that have a salary greater than 100,000. So um, Boolean selection will be possible. You can also select um, particular columns. So if I want to select just department and salary along with uh, just those that are greater than 100,000, uh, we could do that and dot head to just get the first five rows. Okay, so that is subset selection with pandas cub. Let's scoot on down over here. So you will learn <clears throat> the next section is uh, using special methods defined in the Python data model. So I'm not going to show you the special methods here, but I will show you what they allow you to do. So the len function, the built-in len function, this is built into Python itself. We will cover how uh, a special method may be used um, within your class so that your object, the data frame in this case, will be able to work with this len function. So this returns the number of rows for us. You can also do um, you can also, you'll also learn how a special method is able to allow us to use this plus operator. And in this case, I'm going to just going to add $10,000 to everyone's salary. And um, the special method is required so that, so that our object, our data frame, can understand how to work with this plus operator. So there are many other special methods that are available. Um, that will allow us to interact with Python's functions and operators, and we will discuss them or we will encounter them uh, several times during the, this project. Okay, moving along, the next thing that our data frame will be able to do is be able to aggregate the columns. So there will be several, many uh, aggregation methods that are implemented. An aggregation method, by definition, is something that summarizes a sequence of values by a single number. So for instance, typically you're aggregating numeric columns, and we only have one numeric column here, the salary column. If we wanted to find the mean salary, we can use the mean method, and this aggregates it and returns a single value. Now, some aggregation methods do work with strings, so department, um, typically don't find the minimum you know, of a string, but it, it is allowable. Um, so the, I guess, m string highest up in the alphabet is health and human services. So those are the aggregation methods, sum and median max, and several more. All right, our data frame will also be able to do non-aggregation methods. So a non-aggregation method is something that just does not return um, a single value for each column. So let's just look at our data again. We will see that, uh, let's just choose the unique method for instance. This operates a little bit differently than pandas. So what unique does, it returns a list of data frames. So for every column that you have, it'll find the unique values of that particular column. All right, so um, if I look at this, it's going to look a little strange. It has a list of data frames. So to actually look at the unique values, I'm going to have to get, uh, I'm going to have to, uh, yeah, DFS is a list. So I'm actually going to uh, use the brackets to actually get one particular uh, data frame. So the first one is just the department column. As you can see, these are the unique values of the department column. So if I want all the unique values of the race column, I could get the uh, index one in there. If I want to see the unique values of the gender column, I can do that. There are going to be, uh, there's salary, there's there's many unique values. So if I do this, I can just do dot head and uh, see those are the unique values uh, of salary. 
All right, so that takes care, those are some non-aggregating, uh, that is one example of a non-aggregating method. And let's move on to the next uh, piece of functionality, which is grouping. So it's very important that our data frame be able to group uh, by at least one variable. Our data frame will be able to group by one or two columns exactly. Pandas is able to group by any number of columns. So we're uh, going to, so, so what Pandas Cub offers is a pivot table to do the grouping. So let's go ahead and look at the head so we can see our columns again. So the pivot table method uh, will allow us to group by one or two columns exactly. So if we wanted to find, say, the average salary by every combination of department and race, we could do that. There's uh, two, uh, uh, the, the grouping columns come first. They go into the rows and columns parameter. We put department and race. And then values will be what we're aggregating. So we're going to aggregate the salary column. And there's an ag func parameter, and this tells you how we're going to aggregate. So we're going to aggregate uh, by getting the mean. So this returns a pivot table. So we have uh, on the rows, we have the unique values of the department. The column names are now the unique values of, of race. So we have Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native American, and White. And then inside here, we have all the, the, the mean of those values. So that is the that's, is, that is how pivot table works. Here we group by two columns. You can group by a single column as well. So say you just wanted to group by department, well, then you can just get rid of the columns uh, parameter, and this will uh, find the mean of every department. Okay, so that's grouping. And the last piece of functionality, a major piece of functionality that Pandas Cub will have, is that it will have very specific uh, functionality for, for strings. So um, let's again take a look at this. So strings are typically handled differently than numeric columns. So if we look at, say, the um, there's an str method. So it's uh, accessor, I should say. So str is just like with pandas. So let's say we wanted to use the count method. So we want to count. <clears throat> And this looks a, a little bit different so, than pandas. So you're going to put in the, the column name here. So if we wanted to count, say, the number of, I don't know, A's in every, um, in, in, ev in every value of the department column, we would do this. Okay. So this will return a one-column data frame with the number of A's for every single value in the department column. And there are many string methods that uh, will be implemented here. These are all the same string methods that are available in regular for regular Python strings. So if I just press tab here, you can see these are all the string methods that uh, our data frame uh, string columns will be able to use. And there are um, quite a few of them. Okay, so that wraps up the examples for, for Pandas Cub. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next installation for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we're going to be downloading the material from the GitHub repository where it's located. So the URL where it's located is right here. It'll be in the description below. I've already navigated to it in my browser over here. So this repository, this page, uh, contains all of the instructions and all of the material that are necessary to complete the project. And in fact, the previous videos have already covered some of the material uh, on this page. And But all we're going to do in this video is simply download the material so that we have a copy of it on our local machine. So if you're familiar with Git, you have Git installed, you can go ahead and clone it. I'm not going to assume that you do. Instead, of, we're just going to download it uh, onto your machine. So if you click this green button on the right-hand side of the page, you'll uh, have a box that says Download Zip that will appear. So go ahead and just download the zip. And it should download pretty quickly because it's, uh, there's, there's not a whole lot of... Uh, there, the, the file sizes are, are not very large whatsoever. Um, it's a small library. So 
uh, it's going to go ahead and uh, it's gone into my downloads folder. So it's going to attach the word master, which is the master branch to it. So you don't have to worry about that. But it'll, the full name will be pandas cub master dot zip. Go ahead and unzip this. So, uh, and when you unzip it, you'll see the contents of the entire repository or right here. Uh, you can open up this uh, PDF of the README, and this is basically just the full instructions on uh, on that are that are found on that uh, the GitHub repository homepage. So, um, yes, so you can actually have the instructions out as a PDF and not have to refer to them uh, on online. Okay, so once you have the contents of the repository unzipped. You know, you probably should move this out of the downloads folder. I'm simply just going to put this into the documents folder right here. Okay, so that's all I wanted to cover in this short video. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next installation for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we're going to be opening up the project in VS Code. So VS Code stands for Visual Studio Code. It is a code editor distributed by Microsoft. It is free and open source, and it was ranked as the number one code editor in the 2018 Stack Overflow Developer Survey. So it is powerful, and it is popular, and it is a, an editor that I like to use. In the last video, we ended up downloading all the material uh, of pandas cub from its github repository onto our local machine and in this video we're going to be opening up all that material with visual studio code so i already have visual St studio code uh, downloaded and installed and have an instance of it running right here now this video tutorial is not going to cover the ins and outs of visual studio code i'm merely going to uh, open up the files open up the project with it, and then continue on with the rest of the steps. Now, um, my particular VS Code, I have uh, installed several extensions, um, and I will link to all the extensions that I use uh, to help for, for my development environment. All right, so uh, this is the opening screen that you'll see if you have not started a project. So we'll, what I'm going to do is going to go ahead and open up the Pandas Cub folder so I place this folder in my in the documents folder, and there it is right there. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up. All right, so here are the contents of that folder, and these are the exact contents that I downloaded from GitHub. Now, when you first open up, uh, when you first begin this project, you're going to want to open up the readme.md file. So this contains the underlying markdown of all of the instructions that you uh, need to follow in order to complete the project. Now the markdown isn't particularly pleasant to read, so Visual Studio Code provides a markdown preview that's available. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, make this much more readable and place this preview over here. So you're going to want to keep this markdown open at all times during the project. So this, this is your roadmap uh, for completing the project. All the instructions are here. Every step um, has detailed instructions on how to complete it. So you'll definitely want to uh, keep this open uh, so that you can follow along and um, read it. So I'm going to be keeping this open as well. All right, so I, this is uh, the end of this tutorial and we'll begin our creation of the uh, development environment in the next video. Hey everybody and welcome to the next installation for the project to build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. This video is going to cover setting up the development environment. So in the previous video we opened up our project in VS Code and we opened up the readme markdown file. So this file contains all of the instructions that are necessary to complete the project and you should keep it open at all times whenever you're completing the project. <clears throat> so if you scroll through here, you'll see that we've actually already completed uh, the first few sections. We've already covered them. And 
Soon you'll get to the section on setting up the development environment, and that is what we are going to cover in this video. So what exactly is a development environment? Well, it's simply, uh, it's simply an environment where you develop software and where the software gets executed. So I always recommend creating a new environment whenever you start a new project. Now, whenever we create a new environment, this will isolate it from any other part of your file system or any other previous, uh, any other installations of Python in any other environments that, that uh, you already have. So for instance, when we create a new environment, we'll be sure to know exactly what um, what libraries are in there, what version of Python is in there, and have more security and more confidence that our code will work with the current specifications. And then, hopefully, we can set up this environment on other systems and have it uh, uh, and, and replicate the environment in other systems so that our code will work in other systems as well. All right, so I'm going to be using a tool called Conda to set up the development environment. Now, Conda is, uh, is more well known as a package manager, but it can also uh, create environments. So if you do not have the Conda tool, then you'll need to download it. Now, Conda is not the only tool that creates environments, but it is a popular one, and it is one that I am going to use. So the company that creates Conda is called Anaconda, and they're very well known for the Anaconda distribution which is a distribution of Python packages that contain um, um, most of the popular data science libraries. Now, whenever you install Conda, it will automatically have a environment called uh, base. So there will already be a uh, environment there for you. But, but when we start development, we want to have our own environment. So we're, gonna, we're just about to create our own uh, development environment. And there are actually a few ways to create environments with Conda itself. So I'm going to use what's called a YAML file, this environment.yaml file. And I'm going to go ahead and open this thing up and put it on this side. <clears throat> so it's a simple text file that gives uh, some instructions on how to create uh, the environment. Number one is the name of the environment. So here we're simply going to name it pandas cub. And then uh, under the dependencies section, we have the version of Python. So we're going to pin the version of Python to 3.6. And then we'll also install pandas Jupyter and PyTest. So we're not going to um, be strict on the versions here. They will just install whatever the latest version of these are. So our package isn't um, going to be so uh, fragile that will depend on very specific versions of these libraries. So we'll be a little bit lenient here. So it'll install pandas, Jupyter, and PyTest. But it will, stand, it will also install all the dependencies of pandas, Jupyter, and PyTest. So there'll be many, many other libraries that will be installed. The main dependency of pandas is a library called NumPy, which is a dependency for many of the data science packages in Python, or many of the scientific computing packages in Python. Okay, so with that said, we will go ahead and use this YAML file along with the Conda uh, environment tool creator uh, to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and if you go to view and then you click on terminal, you can actually open up a terminal right here and issue commands from here. So it actually opens up in our current working directory, which is very nice. Now, you'll see that, for me anyways, in parentheses, uh, preceding the prompt is the name of the current environment. So uh, here I am in base. So to create a, a new environment with this YAML file, you simply enter the command conda n create dash s uh, dash f and then the environment dot YAML. So um, there are many, many things you can do with Conda. It is a very complex tool and very flexible um, for managing packages and creating environments. So this is just one particular command that will create a, an environment, and it will use this file to do the environment creation. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. I've actually already created this environment because it will take 
um, it can take a minute or two to uh, download all of the all all the contents of that environment. Now, when you create a new environment, you are not inside of that environment. Okay, so uh, it is not what's called active. So there's always an active environment, and right now the base environment is active. And actually, you can see here where the environment was actually downloaded. So it's in this uh, folder over here within Anaconda 3 in this ends folder under pandas cub. So this is a completely isolated area in your file system that will not be contaminated by any of the other uh, installations you may may have created or any of the other environments on your machine. So if we do conda env list, this is a command that will list all of the environments on this machine. And you can see I have a few other environments besides uh, besides base and pandas cub. So the current environment will always have a star next to it, and then you'll have a location in your file system where that environment is. So base is our current one. Um, we want to activate pandas cub. So to activate pandas cub, you'll simply issue the command pandas, oh, pandas, uh, conda activate pandas cub. And you have conda activate in the pandas or in the environment name. So now that I've activated it, you'll see that pandas cub is now preceding my command prompt. And if I do conda end list, again, you'll see that that star has moved to pandas cub, and this is where the environment is located. Okay, so that has created the environment, and now I've activated the environment. <clears throat> now you should only use this environment to develop this library. Once you are done with this, uh, with this session, you're going to want to deactivate this. So it only uses, so conda deactivate is the command to return to your default environment, which will very likely be base. So that's um, how you get started with uh, creating an environment and activating uh, the environment. So, um, and we'll be uh, always developing within the pandas cub environment. All right, so that does it for this one. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next installation for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this particular video, we will be covering test-driven development. So we ended uh, the last video by creating our environment with the, uh, the Conda tool. Um, we did deactivate the environment at the end, but I went ahead and uh, reactivated it. So make sure uh, pandas cub is always active whenever you're developing uh, in this project. Now if you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see that the next section is on test-driven development with PyTest. So what exactly is test-driven development? Well, it's the idea that you write tests first whenever you begin a project or whenever you're adding a new feature to your software. You write tests first. So these tests will be failing tests. And then you go back and write the code that will pass the tests. So um, you do things a little bit in reverse than what you might normally, how you would normally approach a problem. So um, the idea is if you pass the tests, then you can feel fairly confident that your code will work in the future. So that's what test driven development is all about. It's about writing tests first and then writing the code that passes them. Now all the tests have already been written for you and there are about 100 tests that you must pass in order to complete the project. Now all the tests are in one file, this test underscore data frame dot pi file and that resides in the tests folder. So if we look over here on the left hand side You'll see all of the files in this project. And you'll see here's the test tests folder. So go ahead and open up this test uh, data frame dot pi file. Now it's not necessary to understand every last thing in here. You're actually not going to be editing this file whatsoever. But it is important to understand the structure of this file and um, how the tests are actually created. So the way this file is structured is that it, it is, uh, there are a number of classes. So 
Um, so for instance, there's a test data frame creation class, and then underneath this there's a test selection class. Now those aren't the individual tests. The individual tests are the actual methods within inside each class. So every time you see a def, you know, you're creating a method within this class, uh, that is going to be a test. So this test input types is considered one whole test. This test array link is another test. This test underscore Unicode to object is another test. So there are several tests within this test data frame creation class. So it is these individual methods that are the actual tests, not the classes themselves. The classes simply work to um, you know, subdivide the project into um, you know, tests that are, that are related to one another. So we're going to be using the PyTest library to test our code. Uh, and we can do the way we the way we use this is there's a, a command line tool uh, that PyTest comes with that's also named PyTest. And we simply give it the uh, the location of where the tests are located, and it will run all the tests for us. Let's go ahead and uh, run these tests. So if we type in PyTest and then the location of that file, the test data frame that Py file, it will run all the tests uh, for this entire project. Excuse me. <clears throat> I had uh, cheated and, and gave you uh, tested the answers. So let's go back and run all the tests. So they will all fail if you do this correctly. So you should have seen a bunch of red uh, letter F's that uh, filled the screen. So it says here 96 tests have failed. So there, there were uh, not exactly 100, but there's 96 total tests. They have all failed. None of them have passed. So the way this project works is that each step you're going to write a little bit of code, and then you're going to test that particular code to see if it runs. Now, PyTest allows you to test um, uh, you don't have to. You don't have to test all. You don't have to run all the tests in this file. So it gives you a way to test just, uh, for instance, run the test only in this class in the, in one particular class. So the way you do that is by running uh, the same command, but follow it up with two colons, and you say test data frame creation, for instance, if you would like to test just this class. And so it will only run these nine tests in this particular class. So they've all failed again. Now you can also just run a single test by appending two more colons than the name of the the name of that one particular test that you want. So here we can run test input type. So it's this one test that we're going to run. And you can see here that we got a red F and that we have one failed. So we failed all of the tests. So we'll have to pass every single one of these tests in order to complete the project, like I said. Um, and that's how, you would, uh, that's how you would run one single test. Now, PyTest has this idea of automated test discovery. There are rules for this, which are predicated upon the actual names of the files and folders and classes and tests uh, with, within those files. So uh, if you're interested in this, these rules for automated test discovery, you can go ahead and click on this link and find out more uh, there. So we, it actually is not necessary to go ahead and write out the exact file location. If you just call PyTest itself, it will find all those tests. You've collected 96 tests and they're all failing. And so that is called automated test discovery and so we will be using PyTest frequently throughout the rest of the project in order to see if we have uh, written the code uh, to correctly uh, pass the test. Alright, so that's it for this one. 
Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video we're going to be installing an IPython kernel for Jupyter. In the last video we ran all the unit tests in this project with the excellent PyTest library. Now we ran those unit tests down here on our command line and we have uh, when we ran those tests, we were in the pandas cub environment, which we had created in the previous step. So the pandas cub environment was active, and we ran those tests. So when we ran pytest, it went into this test folder, and this, uh, in particular, this test data frame.py file ran all these tests. Now, the only uh, the the only Python code and Python libraries that are available uh, to this project are those that are contained within the environment pandas cub. So whatever libraries were uh, downloaded and installed during our environment creation, that is what is available to us. So for instance, we downloaded uh, pandas, which also downloaded numpy, so we have those uh, libraries available to us. We did not download or install the scikit-learn library, so that library is not available to us. So that's you know one thing that environments uh, give us is just an isolated area with only the particular you know uh, packages um, that we installed in that particular environment. Now in this notebook or in this video, we're going to be launching a Jupyter notebook. So I particularly like Jupyter notebooks to test code and to sort of experiment with how you know my uh, my, my data frame class is you know looking and, and how it's interacting so and it's a great environment to get quick feedback and to iterate quickly so uh, you don't have to use Jupyter notebooks for this you can use uh, IPython the IPython shell which should be started in the terminal um, but I like uh, Jupyter notebooks so I want to teach you guys how to actually hook up Jupyter notebooks to your environment now Interestingly enough, if you launch a Jupyter Notebook uh, from the command line, even though you're in the pandas cub environment, you will not be automatically connected to that particular environment just because you've launched a Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter is actually disconnected um, you know, from uh, the actual machinery that's running the code. And the machinery that's running the code is called a kernel. Um, and that's uh, and you can create um, and we're going to create a, a kernel. Uh, we're going to install a particular kernel that will be able to connect directly to our pandas cub environment. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this uh, particular video. So just to get started, um, before we even launch Jupyter Notebook, I'm going to launch the IPython shell with the command IPython. So uh, it's not uh, apparent, at least just by running this, where exactly the uh, executable, executable version of Python is actually running. I know it says pandas cub over here, but there should be a way to verify this, and there is. So the uh, sys library, SYS, the system library for Python, which is a built-in, or is a standard library, I should say, can uh, help us get information on uh, on what, where our Python is running. So the executable attribute um, available in the sys library will tell us the location of where uh, actual, the actual Python uh, is actually running. So here we are. Um, we can see that we're inside this environments folder and inside pandas cub and um, in the you know, Python binary is right here. So we, uh, so so now we know for sure. We have verified that in fact, um, when we run IPython, we are actually within this pandas cub uh, environment. So if I uh, if I try to, I did not uh, download scikit-learn, but if I try to import scikit-learn, that is just simply not going to work. So let me go ahead and exit out of this. Uh, this particular IPython shell. And let me go ahead and deactivate this environment just to get to my base 
environment, um, which does have scikit-learn uh, installed. So, so I'm going to go ahead and run IPython again, just so you can see the difference. So I'm in here, I'm going to import sys again, and then get the output of sys.executable. And you can see that my base environment doesn't actually go in, there's no ends folder, the environments folder is not there. It just goes straight to this, uh, this binary uh, folder where Python is located. So you can see the where Python is executed is in a completely different uh, part of your file system, um, depending on what environment you're in. Okay, so let me get out of here and let me activate pandas cub again. So I'm right here, I'm in pandas cub. Now, the interesting thing is, I, if I want to launch a Jupyter Notebook, and I will do so right now with the command Jupyter space notebook. So this is going to open up in my browser. All right here. And uh, I have already created this test notebook that I will use to show you um, how I sort of manually test. But first we have to hook up the Conda environment to the Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so here we are in the notebook. I just opened it up. And I have that same uh, just uh, executable path right here. None of the cells are run. It's just a very short notebook. I'm going to go ahead and execute this first cell, and it's going to tell me exactly where the executable is. And it says, uh, so this is probably a surprising uh, you know, finding you, you, you launch a Jupyter Notebook, you're in your Pandas Cub environment, and all of a sudden you're met with this uh, unfortunate, um, you know, output here that says, actually, you know what, you're not, um, you're not in the environment that you think you're in, and if you try to import, say, scikit-learn, that will work because I have uh, scikit-learn in my base environment, but I don't have it in uh, the Pandas Cub environment. So what we need to do is we're going to shut this down. So let me close out of this. And I'm going to close out of the, the Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to shut down. So um, I have to issue one command to install a new IPython kernel just for this particular environment. Now, this is found within the documentation. So this is not something... Um, that you just sort of, it's not some magic. This is directly in the documentation and I have a link for it right here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy and paste this. So it's a command that begins with Python and we're going to install this IPython kernel um, just for the user. And um, the name of the Python kernel is gonna be called pandas cub. And the display name, this is just some extra that uh, um, we'll help you uh, find it a little bit easier. You can make this whatever you want. But uh, this is what we'll see in the Jupyter Notebook. It'll be called uh, Python and then pandas cub in parentheses. So this is the command you need to run in order to create this kernel, which will be able to execute only in your pandas cub environment. So a kernel is simply just a, you know, a program that uh, runs the code and introspects the code. Okay, so um, it's what communicates uh, the code that you write, um, uh, you know, in the Jupyter Notebook area and how it, uh, and, and, and finds the correct interpreter and um, uh, executes the code. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. All right, so it says installed kernel spec pandas cub in this directory. And if you run the command uh, Jupyter kernel spec list, you get a list of all the kernels that are available to you. So before we just had one kernel, this Python 3 kernel. Now we have pandas cub. So now if we launch Jupyter again, so I'm going to run the same thing, Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to go ahead and open up test notebook. So I'm going to go ahead and execute this one more time. Oh, and it says, okay, it says we're still not in the right environment. 
So, um, and this is correct. What you need to do is you have to go to you need to go to kernel, and then you're gonna this kernel menu up here. Click on kernel. Go to change kernel, and then click on. Now you have a list of choices: pandas, cub, um, or Python three. This is what we're currently in. Now, when you choose pandas cub, it's going to restart. So it's got a, uh, you know, all of your work will not be any variables in this notebook will be lost. Um, so it's going to restart the kernel, and you can see that over here it says restarting, and then it's ready. So I'm going to go ahead and re-execute this cell, and now you can see that pan. Now we're in pandas cub. So if I try to for instance, import scikit-learn, this is not going to work. I don't have scikit-learn in this current environment, in the pandas kind of environment. Okay, so uh, that's mainly what I wanted to show, but um, now that we've hooked it up to pandas cub, I'm going to actually go ahead and uh, save this. When you exit out, so I'm going to exit out of here again, and I'm going to exit out of the whole Jupyter Notebook system. Now that I've set the kernel for that notebook, the notebook has some metadata on it that um, informs Jupyter about what is the kernel. So if I go here and I click on test notebook again, you'll see that it automatically puts me in the pandas cub environment. And I just ran that and ran the first two cells again. And you can see that it is in the environment that I want to do. So you only have to set it up once Per notebook. Now, of course, you can go back and change the kernel back to any uh, to to whatever it is that you want. And um, if you have, you can have more than two kernels, so uh, you're not limited to just uh, two. Also, another thing: when you start a new notebook now, so on the left hand side, you're given a choice of which kernel you'd like to start it with. So that's uh, additionally how you can. Um, that's how you would set up the default kernel. So from now on out, this notebook will be opened up with the pandas cub kernel, unless you, of course, manually change it again from the kernel menu. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how you install a new kernel uh, uh, in the Jupyter Notebook. And again, this is just, uh, just unfortunate that it doesn't come uh, automatically there are a couple other libraries that are available, um, but it's just not as robust as doing it with this particular command. So unfortunately, this is the command that I'm going to suggest to use in order to uh, make sure that you've um, you know, hooked up your Jupyter system to uh, the correct uh, you know, environment. Okay, in the next video, we'll be manually testing out um, our code, our data frame in the Jupyter Notebook. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we're going to be inspecting the dunderynit.py file. Okay, so we did have open the testdataframe.py file and we did run all the tests using pytest but this is not the uh, file that you'll be editing for the project. There's a single file uh, that contains the source code for pandas cub that you'll be editing. So if we take a look over here um, in, our, uh, in our file system, in our file explorer, you'll see that there's a pandas cub directory. And in this directory, there's a single Python file. It's the dunderinit.py file. Now I'm uh, using the terminology dunder, which is special to Python, and it simply stands for double underscore. So uh, it is a file that begins with two underscores and ends with two underscores. So this file uh, contains all of the source code for pandas cub. This is the only file that you will need to be editing throughout the whole project. And you, this is the file that you'll be keeping open uh, for the rest of the project. So I want to I want to go a little bit more in detail uh, and cover what is actually inside of this uh, particular file. 
let me just give myself a little bit more room here inside the editor so we can get a better visual. Okay, so <clears throat> yes, as I said, this is uh, the only file uh, f uh, that will be edited during this project. Now, it is not a blank file, as you can see. In fact, there's actually several hundred lines, se about 700 lines of code that has already been written here. Now, this is simply a shell of the program that uh, has been written for you. There, are, there is one main class that has been defined, and there is uh, the data frame class. And within this class, there are many uh, dozens of methods that have also already been defined. So you're not actually going to define any other classes. You're not going to define any methods within a class. The only thing that you will be doing is editing the body of some of the methods within the data frame class. So if you scroll down just a little bit from the top, um, I will talk more about this uh, Dundry init method uh, in a later video. But you'll start to see the word pass uh, following in the body of several methods. So here we see there's the word pass. This is a keyword in Python that simply means to do nothing. So you can see there's uh, numerous times where the word pass appears. These are the methods that you will end up completing. So there's uh, something else that it, uh, you'll have noticed in every single, in almost every single method, is these. You'll see a triple quoted string underneath, directly underneath, the name of almost every single method. Now these are technically called doc strings, or a shortened uh, way to say documentation strings. So these are literal Python strings that you can write in here to explain how your, you know, how your method works. Now we're going to be using a specific style of doc string called the NumPy, uh, uh, NumPy doc string guide. So if you look down over here, you'll see that I have a link to the NumPy doc string guide. So we're only going to be using a few of the recommendations within the NumPy doc string guide. So basically this guide gives a, breaks down um, different sections that you can put inside of the this string to help the user. So the first section actually does not have a title. It is simply a description about what happens, uh, what this method does. So for instance, this head method has this description, return the first n rows. The next section, so each section, as you can see, has a bunch of hyphens that directly come underneath it. The parameters section will list every single parameter and its type. So here, this head method has a single parameter, n, and it is going to be an integer. That's what it expects it to be. And there's one more section called returns, and this is going to be the type of object that gets returned from the method. So that is the, those are called doc strings, and we will, uh, you will see them um, elsewhere as they pop up to give us uh, help um, in the notebook for, and they are specifically meant for our users to understand how to actually use these methods. So this is the file that we are going to be editing, and we're going to be spending essentially all of our time in for the rest of the project. It is called dunderinit.py, and I will talk a little bit more about uh, the, the specialness of this file when it comes to importing it uh, into our namespace um, in the next video. Okay, so that's it. Uh, all I have about this particular file, you'll become very accustomed to it and very familiar with it um, since it's the only file that we will be editing. Hey everybody, and welcome to Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we will be importing Pandas Cub. In the last video, we inspected the data frame, or excuse me, the dundrynit.py file, which contained the data frame class. In this video, we're going to see how to 
actually import our own library uh, into a workspace so that we can actually use it. So it's great that we have this file uh, open and ready to be edited, but I want to show you guys how to actually um, how the import statement works and how to utilize uh, what's what the code that you've been written that's been written in here. How do I uh, get access to this data frame? So I want to explain the machinery behind that. So we can do this in a Jupyter notebook, but I find that it is easier to keep everything in one uh, in plain view in, in, in just VS Code. So I'm going to use the IPython shell uh, to do this and we'll see it again in the notebook in the next video, but for now I'll just use the shell to make things a little bit easier. So I'm going to go ahead and run IPython. Notice I'm already, I'm, I'm just, I'm running it right here inside this pandas cub master. So I'm at the same level as data images, pandas cub and so forth. Okay. So I've, uh, I've opened up the uh, IPython shell, and we can verify that our exit, that we are actually in uh, panda, the pandas cub environment, like we did in a previous video, and you can see that we are indeed uh, you know, operated with, operating within the pandas cub environment. So that looks good. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and import in pandas cub. Okay, so that worked, that completed, there were no errors. So I want to explain, I want to go into the details of this statement. I want to explain what's happening when we write import pandas cub. So Python has a strict set of rules that it follows whenever you write an import statement. And what it does is it searches, it has a specific uh, there's a, a specific sequence of file uh, of directories that it looks into to find Python libraries. So this is called, uh, these directories are stored in this path variable from the sys module. So if you look at this module or this variable path, you'll see that it's, it's a, it is a Python list and it has a list of directories that Python will look through one by one in order until it finds the library that you've imported. Now, if it does not find the library, then it will raise an import error. So it goes through one by one, and then it actually gets to this interesting um, directory, which is just an empty string, but that represents the current working directory. So, and that's exactly where pandas cub is located. And you can actually output the current working directory with pwd. This is an IPython command. This is not a Python code. So it just outputs our current working directory. So we're inside pandas cub. You can even use ls to list out the contents of the current working directory, just like it's a normal shell command. So you can see here that uh, indeed pandas cub has been found. Now, you might be thinking, how can you import a directory? And the answer is you can. Uh, Python allows that, but if there is a dundery nit.py file, it will import that instead. So it doesn't quite make sense just to uh, import a directory. Um, you know, it's not a file, there are no contents, but if there's a dundery nit.py file, it will, um, it will import that and that is exactly what PDC is referencing. It is this particular init dunderinit.py file. So I'll just uh, I'll just write this here again. Um, <clears throat> this doesn't actually do anything. I just wanted to write it just so it appears on the screen again. So now PDC is referencing the contents of this file. This is exactly what we've imported in. So all of these names in here are available to us with PDC. So for instance, I can get, uh, we'll skip over NumPy, that's not as interesting. I can get the version like this. So it's actually just imported this in here. So every definition, everything that has an equal sign over here has been imported in and is accessible with PDC. So data frame has also been defined, so I can get that. I won't instantiate the data frame. I can just 
go ahead and reference it, and so forth. And there's a one function down below and, an, and actually another class that's defined, we'll get there later. But that is exactly what happens whenever you run the import statement. And we'll see that uh, in the notebook again. But I wanted to cover this specifically so you understood what happened and then the rules about importing in a directory. And this is a special file name. So if it's just called, if it's not dundery nit.py, it will not get loaded in. You have to name it dundery nit.py in order for it to be uh, loaded in when you actually import the directory name. So that is just some special rules that Python has created for imports. All right, so that wraps up this one. Hope you uh, enjoyed it. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we will be manually testing our data frame in a Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so we've already formally tested our uh, data frame, or at least all of Pandas Cub, with the PyTest library. But in this notebook, or in this video, I want to show you how to manually test out your data frame in a Jupyter Notebook. So oftentimes you want to, you know, really see how your data frame is behaving um, uh, with how you would actually use it. And since most or a lot of data analysis is done in a Jupyter Notebook, then <clears throat> um, it's a, it, it can be a good thing to go ahead and uh, use your data frame just as if you were using it uh, to do data analysis. So let's go ahead and uh, open up a Jupyter Notebook so I could show you uh, how I uh, work with um, the data frame as I'm building it and as I'm uh, testing it out. I'm going to go ahead and open up this test notebook. Okay, so first of all we can see that we're in the, we're using the pandas cub kernel, which means that, and then this will verify again that we're in the pandas cub environment. Um, so this is a this is a very important piece I want to show you. This is a magic function called auto reload, and so this is not a this is not Python code. This is what's called a magic command. So this will only work in IPython or Jupyter notebooks. It will not work if you want to execute just uh, normal Python. So there's a magic command that does something special, and in this case it will reload any changes to your files uh, back into the notebook. So <clears throat> normally, let's just say you're working uh, in this one dundery nit.py file and you make a change and you, um, if you already open up the notebook, that change will not be reflected unless you restart the kernel. So you would have to completely restart uh, your uh, the kernel and you'd have to re-execute everything that you've done up until that point. Now what auto reload does is it allows you to uh, change some code and then without restarting the kernel uh, see how the changes reflect um, as you're working. So this actually saves a tremendous amount of time um, when you're developing. So you can make some changes, check how they check, um, you know, visually ins uh, inspect what's going on and then uh, make some more changes and, and iterate like that. So it does uh, save uh, quite a bit of time. So this is, this is quite a useful magic function. So I'm gonna go ahead and execute that. I'm gonna go ahead and import our libraries. So NumPy will be used simply to help us make uh, our data frames. Pandas Cub at, the, at its current state is just the shell um, you know, program. There's nothing that has been implemented thus far. It is basically empty, although it will properly import, and we saw how to import it in the previous video. Pandas Cub Final is what the final version of Pandas Cub will look like. So I put this in here so you can play around with the final version of Pandas Cub and to see how it works um, when it's complete. And then I've also imported Pandas so that um, you can also experiment with the pandas data frame since our data frame is essentially meant to emulate the pandas data frame. Okay, so let's go ahead and execute that cell. Now, um, in this cell we create those three data frames, one from pandas, one for pandas cub, one for pandas cub final, and one for pandas. 
and it uses just a, a dictionary of strings mapped to one-dimensional NumPy arrays. And we'll see how that works out um, uh, later on uh, in the project. So I went ahead and instantiated. So what I did was I created three data frame instances, one for each of the um, libraries that I imported that have data frames. And now I'm going to output the visual representation of each data frame in the notebook. So DF is simply pandas cub in the current state, and there's actually no representation for it whatsoever. So you will not be able to see anything just yet. Again, it's just like an empty shell. So there's no visual representation. There's simply a you know place in your um, address in your computer where it's currently residing with uh, actually no data in it. Uh, DF final is the pandas cub final, and DF pandas is what it uh, what pandas is going to be uh, what pandas produces. So the end result, the data frame will look fairly similar or very similar to what pandas does, and I'll uh, I'll show you how to produce this uh, when we when we get to that step. But for now, I really want to focus on um, the the process of iterating back and forth between the source code and between um, you know the Jupyter notebook where you can actually see how things are uh, how things are working. So let's go ahead and let's go back to the source code and make some changes just so I can show you uh, what this does. So here's pandas cub, okay, and whenever a data whenever a you know whenever you instantiate your class, this dundry init special method is called. So this actually this method is actually already implemented. Uh, for you. Um, you won't be editing this one, but I do want to um, add something in here just so you can see what happens whenever um, we make some changes in the notebook. So in init method. So I just added a simple print statement, print function, uh, at the end of this initialization method, which always gets run whenever you instantiate a class. So if I go back over here, normally you would have to restart the kernel in order for this change to be reflected. But since we did auto reload, this will detect that change and automatically um, you know, provide those changes for us. So I'm not going to re-import anything over here. I'm simply just going to run the initialization again. So I'm going to run uh, this statement. In fact, I can just run this one just by itself um, in its own cell. So I have not executed any other cells yet. So let me just go ahead and execute this, and you can see that very nicely it has um, propagated those changes um, and it reflects those changes that I just made. So this will able to help you quickly prototype, quickly uh, write code without having to go back and forth. So this is why I'm showing you this method. I, it is something that I use, and I believe it is something that is uh, very valuable when you're developing, and it will, uh, uh, you know, uh, give you a way forward to to quickly iterate uh, your ideas. Okay, so that is how you would manually test out your uh, data frame in a Jupyter notebook. You know, it allow you to see. You know whether your results are matching. Instead of like just getting results from from PyTest, you can now go into the notebook and in fact um, you know see how your data frame is working here um, outside of just the the manual or the automated testing, I should say, that PyTest provides. Okay, so that's it for this one. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we are going to be getting ready to start Pandas Cub. Okay, so there's just a couple things that I'd like to cover before we uh, start editing the dundry init.py file and starting to complete the steps. So in the very last video, we added one line into the dundry init.py file, this print function. So let's go ahead and erase that and bring it back to its uh, back to its original state. So this again is the only file that you will be editing for the entire project. Now, 
One other thing is the answers to all the steps, and there are 40 steps. So if we look over here, we'll see they just begin at one, and if you go all the way down to the bottom, you will see that there are 40 steps. So the answer, the final version of Pandas Cub, is available in that Pandas Cub final directory, and it's a folder, it's a file with the exact same name, dunderingnit.py. So you can look at that to figure, uh, to see the code that will complete all of the tests. So I only recommend looking at this once you've at least attempted to complete each step and not beforehand. But this is uh, the answer key and, and what you can use uh, to, to compare your code against the code uh, that I wrote. Okay, so this is all, we finally covered all the necessary work um, getting set up for the project. And in the next video, we're going to begin with step one, which is check the data frame constructor input types. All right, see you there. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video, we are gonna begin coding. So this is where the real fun begins. And this is step one out of 40. And in this step, we will check the data frame constructor input types. So let's go over here and hop on over to VS Code, where we have our uh, dunderynit.py file open. Again, this is the only file that will be edited throughout the entire project. And the way the project has been created is that the methods that you are going to complete basically just come in order uh, on the way down. So you won't be, you, you won't have to kind of hop around the entire file. You should just uh, go vertically down and complete the methods as you, you know, come across them in order. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at step one, check data frame constructor input types. So this data frame, whenever our users are, are, are construct an instance of this data frame, they have to pass it a single parameter named data. This parameter, we're going to enforce that it is a dictionary of strings mapped to one dimensional NumPy arrays. And this is what this first step is going to do. It's going to check that data is in fact a dictionary that maps strings to one-dimensional arrays. So those strings will eventually be the column names of our data frame, and the NumPy arrays will be the values for those columns. So, yeah, so the this dundery knit method is what gets called when it, this is a special method, and this is what Python uses um, to initialize the, uh, the, the whenever the initialize the object upon uh, creation, so this method is actually already complete. So it has several other uh, method calls that it makes. You do not have to, you will not have to edit the dundery init method. Instead, we will have to edit uh, some of the methods that it calls. And in this video, in this step, we're going to uh, edit the check input types method. So we're down here. We're only going to be editing the check input types method. Now, the first thing before we get started is that you'll notice there's a single underscore preceding check input types. This is denoting that this is a private method. This is not meant to be accessed by the users. It is only meant to be accessed internally within this class, like in this file. Now, in Python, there are no, there is no such thing as private methods, technically meaning that our users can call this method if they so choose. But we use convention in Python instead of another keyword to denote that uh, this is strictly meant to be uh, used internally and is not a public method for our users. So, you know, IDEs like, uh, you know, Jupyter Notebook, whenever you're coding, will not by default even show these private methods because they introspect the code and they see that well, if it begins with a single underscore, it's not meant for public use. Okay, so um, this is exactly what uh, check input types is going to do. Number one, 
It's going to raise a type error if data is not a dictionary. Number two, it's going to raise a type error if the keys of data are not a string. So if it's a if um, the keys must be strings. And then again, another type error if the values are not NumPy arrays. And lastly, we're going to enforce that our users only give us one-dimensional NumPy arrays. So that's what this method needs to do. And once we complete these things and ensure that our data, um, uh, that the data parameter uh, follows uh, these four bullet points, then we uh, can see if we pass the test. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, delete pass and see if we can go ahead and complete the first part of this. So raise type error if data is not a dictionary. So if not is instance, so is instance is a function that is able to uh, check whether an object is of a particular type. So the way it works is that actually VS Code is nice and will pop up this help menu, the documentation. You give it an object first, in this case it's going to be data, and then we're going to check what class it is. Or you can give it a, a tuple of classes as well. So if you want to say is it an instance of, uh, of two or more classes. Or there's possibilities of it being um, not just one class. Okay, so we're going to check if data is a dictionary. So uh, dict is the class name. If it is not a dictionary, we're going to raise a type error. And so the raise keyword is how you, you know, raise an error. And if we have, if we don't have a dictionary, we're, going to, we're just going to give the user a message. We'll say that data must be a dictionary. Okay, so um, that completes that one part of it. Now, um, we can actually go ahead and test this out in the notebook. So I told you that it's good to manually test things out. Um, so you can just see if it's working or not before you run the formal test. So let's go ahead and do that. Now I'm going to uh, split this terminal real quick. I know my face is somewhere on the right hand side, but uh, so let me go ahead and move this up real quick. I'm going to, first of all, I have to activate this over here. I will go ahead and launch the Jupyter Notebook on this side of the terminal since this is the one covered up by my face talking. And I won't need to use that portion, so that's okay. Let me go ahead and put this back down. So this is just running the Jupyter Notebook, and I'll, I'll issue the other commands uh, over here. And you know what? We can actually minimize the left-hand side and give us quite a bit more room for on our screen. We don't need to look at the file explorer, um, you know, d during the during our coding for for this session. So let's go ahead and go back to Jupyter. And we'll open up a notebook. And let's go ahead and, and uh, so not, none of the code has been executed. It's important to run auto reload. So let's go ahead and run that. And then this is just some default data frame that we can use for testing. But what we want to test in this case is, is what we just coded. So we said if the input is not a dictionary, it needs to raise this type error. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Let's see if we can raise a type error. Let me give myself a little bit more room. So if I pass this, say, 10. 10 is not a dictionary. So I should uh, get the type error that I just created. So it says data must be a dictionary. OK, great. Fantastic. Now, um, so that, that is how I check my code um, uh, in the Jupyter Notebook. So it lets me uh, iterate uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Now, if I do give it a dictionary, so I'll just say D is, uh, I don't know, some dictionary. 
will just say this. So it's just a single item dictionary. And I try it again, pandas cup. Then I will not get any error at all. This is just the uh, current representation of it, which is um, not very useful at the moment. Okay, so that's fine. Now let's go and uh, finish the other parts. We can just do all of them or one at a time. All right, so let's keep going. So if we, if the keys of the dictionary, so if it, if it, if the code reaches this line, then we're guaranteed that data is a dictionary. So we could say if not the data, if the keys, so we need to check if all of the keys are not strings. So we're going to have to go through one by one of the keys and check and see if they are not strings. So because there could be multiple keys in the dictionary. So we're going to say for key in data. So we're going to go ahead and iterate through here. And you know what? We are going to um, The way you iterate through a dictionary to get to the way you iterate through a dictionary to return the key and the value is with the items method. So data is now guaranteed to be a dictionary. So this will iterate through every combination of, of key value pairs that are in the dictionary. So if we say uh, not is instance, if the key is not a string, then we're going to raise a type error. And we'll say that, uh, you know, we can say the, the keys of data must be strings. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this again. So let's make this key something else. So if we run this, we're not going to get an error. But if we now, if we say our dictionary is uh, some integer with as the key, so 10 is a would be the key here. Then I'm gonna it's gonna raise a type error. So the auto reload automatically um, reloads the the new code. So it just says uh, so. So I just triggered that error. So it looks like everything is good. The keys of data must be strings. So I need to have some string here. Okay, good. So that passes that. It's a dictionary with all the keys um, as strings. In this case, we just have one key value pair. Okay, great. So that takes care of this one. Now it says raise a type error if the values of data are not NumPy arrays. Okay, so if it passes the string, we still need to check and see if the value is a NumPy array. So we're going to say if not is instance value, and we want this to check whether it's a NumPy array. Now, I have already imported, the NumPy library is already imported as the first line in the file up here. So if you're not familiar with NumPy, you might not know what the object, the underlying class is, but it is a ND array. That is the name of the class. So if this is not a NumPy array, we're going to raise a type error and we'll say uh, values of, values of, I use the back tick to signify a, you know, this is like a, a some of the code. Values of data must be NumPy arrays. Okay, good. So I think that takes care of that one. Let's go back to our notebook. So here we have our dictionary, and maybe we'll just call it data so it maps exactly with what we have. Now our value here is a integer. So this should create the error that we just did. It says values of data must be NumPy arrays. Okay, great. So let's make sure it is a NumPy array. So we'll just say um, ARR is I've already imported NumPy up there, and we'll say it's uh, an array. And you know what? We will make it a uh, two-dimensional array. Oh, 
Okay, so just so you can see what this array looks like, um, this is a two-dimensional array. Let's make it uh, three rows and and two columns. Okay, so now we know for sure it is two-dimensional here. Okay, so yes, so now if we run this, it should pass the test, and I did not uh, actually put it right there, so data did not get uh, written properly. So data is going to be an array that has a key, that's a string, and a value that is a NumPy array, and now this will be valid for my, for my constructor at this point in time. Okay, the last step to this is raise a value error if the values of data are not one-dimensional. Okay, so we need to check that this value is a one-dimensional array. So in this particular example over here, our array is two-dimensional, so this is not going to fly. We need to check the number of dimensions. So now we're not checking an instance. It's no longer going to be a type error. It's going to be a value error. Um, you can raise whatever errors you want, by the way. There's a number of different errors that are... Uh, available uh, right out of the box that Python gives you. But type error and va value error are, um, are two of the most common errors that uh, you, you will raise and these are basically uh, just about the only errors we will raise. So we either have some wrong type or there's some sort of wrong value. In this case it's the wrong value. We have the wrong number of um, we want to check and see if the, the, the dimensions are, are correct. Alright so now we're guaranteed that value is a NumPy array so if a value, and you would not know this unless you know NumPy, the ndim attribute returns the number of dimensions. So we're going to say if number of dimensions is not 1, so we have to, we're going to be forcing it to be 1, we are going to raise a value error, and we're going to say uh, values of data must be a one-dimensional array. Okay, so let's go back here and to our Jupyter Notebook and let's rerun this and see if we get that value, if we've triggered that value error. So there we go, it says values of data must be a one-dimensional array. All right, fantastic. So we've done all four cases right here. And it looks like check data frame constructor input types is all ready to go. Now, We've manually verified it. This is what I mean by manually testing. So everything looks good. So if we look back in the Jupyter Notebook, we can uh, force, let's just create a new array, say array one, and we'll make this one dimensional. Let's put in some random numbers. So instead of data having this uh, two-dimensional array, we'll just say it's one-dimensional, and just so you can see it right here, it is a single-dimensional array, and now data we should be able to not give us any error, and it does not. All right, now, just because we've passed the manual test does not mean we have, comp we have passed um, the automated test in PyTest. This is what we need to do. We are going to run a single test. It's contained in the testdataframe.py file, in the test data frame creation class, and in the test input types method. So let's go ahead and look at that test. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and open up the test folder. I'm going to open up test data frame. Under test data frame creation is test input types. So this is the test that it needs to pass. This one right here. So this is, this is what PyTest is going to run. It's going to run this method and see if it passes um, this test right here. So let's go ahead. You can just copy and paste this command into your terminal. So here it is. And if you've passed the test, it'll say we've only run one test. So it says it collected one item. And there'll be a single green dot. And then it'll say one passed. If you failed the test, 
and we'll say one failed. So this passed and we're happy with this. We'll close out of that. So it looks like check input types has passed our test and that's what we're required to do to continue on to the next step. So we're gonna, I'm just gonna stop there. Um, let me just uh, recount what we did. So we fired up a Jupyter Notebook so that we could manually test the auto reload, which is the first thing that was, uh, one of the first things that was run, helped us tremendously because we were able to make changes to our code and then go back to the Jupyter Notebook and see the changes happen like in real time without having to restart the kernel. So that's a, ver that's a valuable tool. And we went ahead and raised four errors for four different situations the end result is that we have a NumPy array with, uh, uh, sorry, data is going to be a dictionary of strings mapped to one-dimensional NumPy arrays. All right, so that's it for check input types in step one. Hope you uh, enjoyed coverage of step one and are looking forward to the other 39 steps. So we're going to check the array lengths next. Hey everybody, welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we will complete step two, check array lengths. In the last video we completed the method check input types. This is the very first method that is called in the data frame constructor, this dundery mit, dundery knit method. So Within this method, we check that data, which is going to be provided us by the user, is going to be a dictionary of strings mapped to one-dimensional NumPy arrays. In this method, the check array lengths, in this video, excuse me, the check array lengths method will be completed and filled out. So within here, we are going to check that all the arrays in our dictionary have the same exact length and these and this is because data frames um, have to have the same number of elements in each column so we're going to go one by one through the values of this dictionary this data dictionary which is again being passed uh, it's the same data that our user passed it's being it's it will be um, passed into this method we will iterate through the values of that dictionary, and those values are NumPy arrays. And we will check to see that they are all the same length. So let's go ahead and begin iterating through here. Now, when I uh, iterate through here, I'm going to uh, use the enumerate method. And this is because I'd like to keep track of or enumerate function. I'd like to keep track of uh, what iteration it is. So if it is the first iteration, so if i equals zero, I'll create a new variable that is assigned to the length of just that first array. So what this is going to do is it will iterate through all the values of the dictionary. So the values method returns a uh, an, an iterable uh, object that uh, of just the values of your dictionary. In this case, these are NumPy arrays. So, for the very first iteration, so i equals zero, the what I'm going to do is assign this variable length to the length of the first array. So, if it is not, uh, if it is not the very first iteration. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to test to see if this length is now uh, equal to the length of the new array. So uh, value again is just uh, uh, the next NumPy array. So if there is a mismatch in length between the first one, so length is equal to the length of the very first array versus the current uh, array length, then we will raise a value error. And we will we can say something like all arrays must be the same length. 
and that should do it. So um, I still have my Jupyter Notebook open. If I go back over here to the notebook, this is where it was uh, left off at. So this was a valid way of constructing, let me get rid of this, um, our data. Excuse me, I must have uh, restarted the notebook. Okay, so uh, I'm passing a dictionary of a string mapped to a NumPy array. This is R1. Now, I'm going to create another array, but in this array, I'll just have two elements in it instead of three, and I'll just use the string B to map it to R2. So I've, and I can get rid of this. So data is a dictionary that has two elements in it. It has A mapped to R1 and B mapped to R2. So they're different lengths, so this should trigger that error and it does, good, so it says value error, value error, all arrays must be the same length. So if I go back up here and I add uh, just one more element to this array, so now that they're both three elements in length, this should not trigger the error and it doesn't, so that completes. So this is uh, one way to, uh, to complete this. Now, uh, I forgot, we actually have to run the unit test to formally pass this part, uh, to form formally complete this step. So let's go ahead and copy and paste this. So it's going to go and uh, run the very next test in that uh, test data frame creation class, which is in the test data frame.py file. Let's go ahead and see if we pass, and we do. So we have uh, one pass, so there's only one test that I ran, and uh, it's just a green dot, which just signifies that it has passed. Okay, great, so we um, we passed uh, step two, which was verifying that all of the array lengths were the exact same. Okay, that's it for this step. We're going to move on to step three in the next video. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video we are going to be completing step 3, convert Unicode arrays to object. So back here in our data frame class, we are still in our constructor. So the first step we ran this check input types method. In the second step we ran this check array lengths method and now we're right here so our data at this point is guaranteed to be guaranteed to be a dictionary of strings mapped to one dimensional numpy arrays where all the numpy arrays are the exact same length so in this method what we're going to be doing is converting any arrays that have are of data type unicode into this data type called object so we haven't said anything about the data types of the NumPy arrays that are going to be inside of our um, inside of our data frame. So we are going to allow, allow basically any uh, data type um, except for this Unicode data type we're going to uh, convert it into uh, an object. So if our user gives us a Unicode NumPy array we are going to convert it to an object array. So I want to spend a little bit of time covering uh, data types in NumPy just so that you can have a better idea of uh, what they are. I have a link in the README where you can read much more about them. But I want to show a few examples here. So yes, our data frame will be uh, composed of you know, one-dimensional NumPy arrays. Every NumPy array has a data type. So let's just go ahead and look at some of these. So if we import NumPy as MP, we will be, uh, I'll just create some arrays. 
let's see here. So let's first create an array of some just Boolean values. Say we have an array of true and false. This is a simple one-dimensional array with two elements. And it has type bool. All right, so let's keep going. Let's create another array. And this time we'll create some integers. And I'll use the dtype parameter or dtype attribute once again to access the underlying data type. And in this case, we have a 64-bit integer. So that's what the 64 is, but it is integer. So we can also create floats with NumPy. So here is a NumPy array that is composed of floats. So if we do, if we retrieve the data type with the dtype attribute once again, we can verify that we do have a NumPy array with a, a float data type, a 64-bit float. Now where things get a little bit uh, interesting is the um, whenever we create strings, so I'm just going to reproduce this uh, data over here uh, in the in the readme. So if you create an array of strings, NumPy will return this kind of cryptic data form, data type. It says U5. So this is a the, the capital uppercase U stands for Unicode. Five is the length of the, um, the, the maximum length of string that you gave it. So snake here has five characters, so it's U5. Now, the issue with these Unicode arrays in NumPy is that they are not very flexible. So for instance, if I wanted to overwrite cat with say elephant, so I'm going to overwrite the very first element in this array with elephant. This code completes without an error, but if I look at the underlying NumPy array, you can see that it only captured the first five characters. So each uh, element in this array has a maximum of five characters. The other thing that is not flexible is let's say we want to set this equal to a missing value, say something like none. Well, then this also completes without error. But if you look at the underlying, you know, data, it has turned it into the string none. So that's not ideal if we want to have uh, missing values in our in our arrays. So what we are going to do is we're going to use a more flexible data type called object. So object is a just a catch-all data type uh, in NumPy. So which allows any Python object to be in an array. So you can put any object in there. There's no restriction. Um, so you can put you can mix numbers and strings with you know none or whatever, and that's valid. So we're gonna we're gonna do that. That's actually what pandas does. So we're copying pandas in this instance. Pandas does not have a Unicode um, call a data type for any of its columns it uses the NumPy object. So we're just gonna follow in its footsteps and, um, and do that conversion so that our strings or our, our string columns can be a little bit more flexible. Okay, so one thing before we uh, get there is that um, as you saw these data types, you know, uh, integers, they have the, the bit, the number of bits um, appended to them, um, but so if we want to get a, uh, what we're going to do is get the data type kind to identify it. So this is a single character that will identify, you know, uh, basically just its generic data type. So just so I can show you that, so here's A again, which is a Boolean, but if we use the kind attribute of the D type, you'll get a single character string. So same with integers, we're going to use this kind, we're going to get back i. And the reason I'm showing you this is that it's, it's easier to deal with the kind, which is just a single character, than worry about um, this uh, object like this. this. This is a much bulkier object. And so it's just easier if we check for the kind. So 
Um, and the last one, of course, is the Unicode one is U. So what we're going to do now in our code is if we come across an array that has a kind of U, we are going to convert it to object. And we use the as type uh, method to do the conversion. So the way we do this, so here's uh, D. It's still a uh, Unicode array. So what we'll do in our code is we'll do as type and we'll type in the string object and that will make the conversion to this object array. So if we just uh, call this O, for instance, as object array, then now we can put in anything in here. So I can put in the string elephant and it will um, it, it will put that exact object in there and nothing will get cut off anymore. So hopefully I've convinced you that's why we're using object. Um, it's just a simple way to make our column of strings more flexible. So let's hop down here to this convert uh, Unicode to object array. Now there is a a uh, couple lines of code that have already been written. So what we're going to do is we are going to use this new data dictionary to to take the place uh, to hold all of the new data. So all, actually all of the data for our data frame. So um, instead of changing this dictionary itself, we're just going to simply place it uh, uh, place the contents in this new data dictionary and then just return that and that's what eventually will get stored in the underscore data um, instance attribute okay so what we want to do here is iterate through this uh, through our data dictionary so for key comma value in data dot items so what we're going to do is a simple check if value so value is a numpy array if the kind is u, we will go ahead and uh, assign this to new data, and we'll just use key again. Right? So we're just going to replicate the th same thing, but we are going to use as type here, and we're going to put an object. Otherwise, we'll just keep new data. Um, we won't change the, 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 the data type of our NumPy array. So that's all we're going to do here. Um, and so anytime some, a user gives us NumPy arrays that have uh, the Unicode data type, we're going to convert that array to as type. So this should work. So let's go ahead and run the test at the bottom of here. So it says uh, test Unicode, uh, th this is the test, test underscore Unicode to object. So I didn't give the, uh, the entire test name, so I'm going to have to type it out. So Unicode to object. And let's see if this passes. And it does so that's good. So uh, one passed, and it's green. The green dot. So we uh, we've passed that test. So we've correctly converted our Unicode arrays to object. Okay. So that does it for step three, and we're going to move on, uh, keep on going, and move on to step four in the next one. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project: build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video, we're going to be completing step four, implementing the Dunder Lens special method. So in the last video, we uh, finished right here. We completed these, this convert Unicode to object method. The result of that was stored in the underscore data uh, attribute. So this is where our uh, dictionary of data will be uh, will reside for the rest of the project. So we're going to be accessing this uh, underscore data attribute uh, frequently throughout to find where our data is stored internally. Now you'll notice there are a couple other lines of code here at the bottom of the constructor. So these are actually already implemented for you. 
and we are not going to uh, uh, cover them right now. So, so with that said, the initialization, the Dundere init uh, constructor method is co is complete. Um, so all the methods in here are fully implemented. There's no other things to do. Um, there's no other code to be written for any of these methods. So let's go ahead and skip on down to our current step, which involves uh, completing this method, the Dunder len special method. So this is a method we're going to use to return the number of rows in our data frame. So um, this is a special method, which means this gets called whenever the len function is used with our object. So whenever you use len and then uh, pass in our data frame df, it will return um, the uh, re return. It, it will that's what it'll return. It'll call this dunder len method and it'll run the code and whatever returns that will get returned. So this is a, how, this is what you use to 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 make the len method work with your object or the len function work with your object. Okay, so to do this, we need to uh, uh, get one of the NumPy arrays in our underscore data dictionary and return the length of that array since they all have the same exact length. So uh, I'm going to show you a couple ways on how to do this. Number one, we're going to work on iterating. We're just going to iterate through all the values of the array uh, with a for loop and then return the length of one of the values um, that we come across. So let's go ahead and do that now. We're just going to write a simple for loop for value in self dot underscore data. So this is where our data dictionary is, you know, uh, is stored. And we're going to use the values method of the dictionary, which returns, uh, which creates a, an iterable of all the uh, all all the NumPy arrays in this case. Now we don't actually have to loop through all of them. Since they're all the same length, we'll just write a return statement in here. And uh, this should be good. Uh, this should be good enough. So this should work. So we're just going to begin an iteration through the values and then return the length of that value. Now, you're wondering, well, why can we do this? Well, value is a NumPy array. NumPy arrays already have, uh, already work with the len function. So we are piggybacking off of NumPy uh, to do all the hard work for us. We're just simply return, we're using the len function on a NumPy array to see if that works. So let's go ahead and run the test here. So it's called test underscore len. I'm just going to go ahead and execute that to see if the test passed. And indeed it passed, so we're good to go here. I want to show you how this looks in a Jupyter Notebook. So I'm going to hop on over uh, to Jupyter Notebook the Jupyter Notebook down here. So again, uh, just to quickly cover this, um, we have made three data frames, one for pandas cub, one for pandas cub final, and one for pandas itself. So df is the one in pandas cub. So now when I call len or pass df into len, what's really happening is the dunder len special method is being called and uh, it's right here. So this is exactly what's being called. So um, you can actually call this directly and you typically would never do this since uh, it should only be called internally, but you can do it like this and call it directly. So what happens in whenever Python sees this len, it will translate this into the dunder len method and call that on your object. So that is exactly what Python is doing. So we are good to go into the next step, but I want to um, I want I want to show an alternative way of doing this. So you might think that this why can't we just why can't we just get the the first val the first array by you know indexing it with the brackets and selecting it like that? So why not? Why is it? Why why can't we just do something like this? Well, it turns out. Um, this object that it returns, it's not a list. It's called a dict uh, view, I believe, or some, something similar, and uh, it does not allow uh, indexing. So when I run this, if I try to run this code, 
I will get an error. So this dict values object does not support indexing. So it's trying to do this right here, but it fails. So it is not, uh, it is, does not support indexing. Now we can still do, uh, we can still do this in, in, a, in a different manner. So I'm gonna go back to the values. Now, um, this is an iterable object as we saw. We can loop through all the values in a for loop. But if you don't want to actually write the for loop, you can, um, you can do something a little tricky, and it's a little bit more advanced, um, and that is to create an iterator out of this. So the iterator is the object um, uh, that is actually uh, sort of like doing the iteration, and we can uh, do this with the iter function. So you can actually see here VS Code has popped up. It will return iterator. Um, so this is something that uh, um, you can manually uh, iterate through by using what's called the next function. So iter is a function. It's just a built-in function in Python. It's not used uh, often, but we're going to go ahead and use it now. Um, so to get the very first value in the iteration, we can use next. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, do this. I'm going to pass this into next. So this, now what we've done is we have the very first NumPy array in our dictionary. Okay, so then we can just call, or we can pass this to len. So now we have a NumPy array, and we can return this. And now we can pass the test. So just to uh, unpack this once again, so first of all, self that underscore data is our, our dictionary of strings mapped to NumPy arrays. Dot values is a dictionary method that returns this dict values object, and it does not support indexing, so we cannot use the brackets there. Iter returns an, uh, an, iter, an iterator, um, which is the thing that you can iterate over, and a for loop. So this is actually what the for loop is doing. It's creating an iterator um, so, sort of behind the scenes for you to iterate through. Next is how you can manually iterate through this. So next will get the very next one. And then len, uh, so the very, sorry, sorry, the very next one is a NumPy array. We finally got to that one NumPy array. And then we can just take the length of that and returns the number that we want, which is uh, whatever the length of our data frame is. So now if I run the test again, you can see that it's passed. So we're good to go. So this is a way to do this in a single line of code without using a for loop explicitly. So this is sort of a manual way of setting up a for loop. You can do this with any of anything that's iterable, like a like a list. You can you can pass in a list here and you know or whatever, and it would do the same thing. It would make an iterator. Next would give you the very first uh, object in that list. So it's a sort of a manual way of doing a for loop. And the only reason we want to do that in this case is because we don't want to loop through all of them, and we cannot use this. Um, we cannot use indexing to grab the very first element. So I'll just go ahead and leave this one right here and say that this method is, or this step is now complete, and we can move on to step five. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we're going to be completing step five, return columns as a list. Okay, so we're uh, right here in step five, and what we want to do in this step is make uh, the columns attribute return a list. So whenever, when, when, whenever anyone accesses columns as an attribute, such as df.columns, we would like a list to be returned. So let's go ahead and see how that looks like in the final product. So we're back over here in the Jupyter Notebook. So we already have uh, pandas cub already loaded. So if we do df final uh, dot columns, we're going to get a list of the column names in order. Now this is exactly the same functionality as pandas. Uh, pandas has its own separate object for this, not a list, but it essentially works um, identically. Now you'll notice that there is no, this is not a method, so columns is not a method. There's nothing to execute. You do not end um, the line of code with parentheses. There's no parentheses attached to columns. It simply 
an attribute access and it will return a list. So in order to implement this, we're actually going to define columns as if it were a method. So it's going to look just like any other method, except it's going to be decorated by the uh, by this uh, by by property, which is a um, uh, this is built into Python itself. So I'm not going to spend time in this tutorial talking about decorators or in, in this particular case the property decorator. There are other tutorials that will cover that. Um, all I'm going to say about it is that it will basically transform uh, what a, 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 something that looks like a method into an attribute. So there will be so we'll be able to uh, execute all the code under here uh, without actually you know putting parentheses at the end of columns so it essentially turns this thing that looks like a method into a into an attribute so that's what the property decorator does it does quite a few more things and we'll see one of the other things it does in the very next method so basically whenever someone calls df dead columns it will throw us into this uh, method right here and it will execute all the code over here. So let's go ahead and simply just return the columns as a list. So the column names are now uh, stored in the data, the underscore data uh, dictionary, right? The underscore data holds all the column names as the keys in that dictionary. So all we have to do is just say simply return it. We want to return it as a list and we're just going to return we're going to force our dictionary to be a list now you might wonder well our dictionary is composed of keys and values why will this only return the keys well um, that's just the way uh, so the, the way python created dictionaries was that if you iterate through them one by one you don't get the keys and the values you only get the keys so when you pass this into list like this um, it will turn, uh, di whenever you pass a dictionary into list, it will, it will simply uh, iterate through only the keys and it will force the keys to be a, uh, a list. It will not look at the values whatsoever. You have to call dot .items or dot .values uh, in order to retrieve the values of a dictionary. So it's as simple as this. Um, self dot underscore data is a dictionary list will just simply iterate through all those um, keys in the dictionary and force them to be a list. Now one other minor note here is that um, the order in our data frame does indeed matter. So dictionaries used to be inherently uh, unordered and they're not uh, they're still not uh, uh, before Python 3.6 they were um, inherently unordered. In Python 3.6, internally they became ordered. So whatever you, uh, w whatever you entered into your dictionary first is how it would be retrieved whenever you um, uh, iterate, iterated through it. And so we're going to use this property, this, in, this uh, underlying orderliness of our dictionaries um, to our advantage. Otherwise we would have to use something like an ordered dict from the collections module in order to store our data. But now that uh, the dictionaries have uh, ordered, um, you know, have this orderliness to them, we do not have to do that anymore. So, whenever the user uh, passes us a data dictionary, uh, we're going to assume that is the order that they want the columns is, and that's the order that we're going to preserve. And Python does this for for us automatically without having to get uh, an order dict anymore. So. Um, this should uh, work, and let's go ahead and see if it passes this test underscore columns test. So, and it does pass. So we just implemented it with just a, a very short amount of a very small amount of characters. Let's go back into our into our notebook over here and just test it directly over here, and we can see that now we match pandas. Our pandas cub is now matching the pandas cub final. Okay, so that does it for this one, um, for step five, and we're going to go on to step six next. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. 
In this video, we are going to be completing step six, set new column names. In the previous video, we retrieved all the columns in our data frame by issuing the command df.columns. So what we did to implement this was to write columns as if it were a method which uh, executed code. But we decorated it with the property decorator. So this basically converts columns into an attribute, um, meaning that there's no uh, parentheses that need to be followed here to execute it as if it were a method. So we can still have uh, lots of code executed um, by attribute access if we use this property decorator. So the property decorator also allows us to set uh, attributes as well. And that's what we're going to be doing in this step. So when we issue the command df.columns equals a new list of strings, um, what's going to happen underneath is we'll be able to execute another uh, method. So we have to use a, this, a, another, uh, another decorator. And the pattern for this is that whatever, uh, whatever, uh, whatever attribute that you decorated with the property decorator, use that attribute name dot setter and use that as another, uh, as another decorator to the same uh, method name. So this, uh, this method will get executed whenever our user does an assignment statement to column. So any kind of assignment statement. So anytime you do df.columns equals something, that will trigger this particular method to be executed. So all the code under here will get executed. So this is part of the uh, property decorator. And in fact, the very first one that gets uh, defined is called the getter. So this is how you get or retrieve, you know, some attribute by using, um, you know, uh, with the property decorator. The next part of it is called the setter. And so if you, uh, so this is the uh, code that will get executed whenever someone tries to make an assignment statement. There's also a deleter, so which we're not going to implement. So you could also define a, another columns method and decorate it with at columns dot deleter instead of setter. And that would get invoked whenever someone writes the delete you know, df.columns, they use the delete statement, D-E-L, uh, which is a keyword in Python. Okay, so with that said, we are now going to implement this method right here, this setter uh, method for this property, this columns property. So whenever this somewhat our user does df.columns equals something, that something will get passed into this method as the parameter column. So whatever is on the right hand side of the equal sign will get assigned to this columns parameter. Okay, so there's a few things that we need to do um, to, to, to complete this step. And they're all listed right here in this uh, bulleted list. So the first thing is that is that we're going to require columns to be a list. So it has to be a list. So let's go ahead and do that now. So if uh, not, so if columns is not a list, so we're gonna use is instance to check its type, then we'll raise a type error and say something to the effect that columns must be a list. All right, so that takes care of the first one. The next one is, is if the number of column names in the list does not match the current data team. So we're gonna raise a value error. So we're also gonna force our users pass us a list that has the same length uh, or the same number of columns as our current data frame, which makes sense. So let's go ahead and do that. So if the length of columns does not equal the length of self dot underscore data, so remember, data is our dictionary that maps the column names as strings to NumPy arrays. So the length of that dictionary is the current length of the columns. So we will raise a value error here and say 
columns, we can say maybe new columns must be same length as current uh, data frame. Okay, so maybe that's a little wordy and you can uh, reword this to be a little bit different later. So the, the error message is important to be clear. So, but um, at the same time, you know, um, just getting something down and then moving on is, is appropriate, uh, you know, uh, as well, um, just to complete the step. Okay, so the next piece is we're going to raise a type error if any of the columns are not strings. So we are only going to allow strings to be column names. So what we're going to do here is we can um, go ahead and loop through them one by one, which is fine. So we could say for call in columns. And now if these are not strings, so if the column name is not a string, then we'll raise a type error and say, uh, all column names must be strings. Okay, so that takes care of that one. The next validation we have to do is to check to see if any of the column names are duplicated. So we're not gonna allow duplicates um, and we can't allow duplicates because our dictionary, we are using a dictionary to store the data. So um, dictionaries can only have keys appear once. So um, just by that alone, we're not allowed to have duplicate column names and it wouldn't make sense to have duplicate column names either uh, to, as it would make it very difficult to know which one you're referencing. So what we're gonna do here is, well, we could do this, we could continue in this loop and that's fine, that's, uh, uh, you, could, you could add some logic in here to, to check and see if there's uh, any duplicate column names. But we're going to go ahead and use a, a little bit more clear statement. So we're gonna say if, if the length of the columns does not equal the length of the set of the columns, then we're gonna raise an error. So we'll raise a value error and say that uh, you know your columns have duplicates. This is not allowed. Okay. Now the reason this works is because when you say set of columns, sets can only have unique values. So if there are duplicates in the columns list, then the set command will remove them. So if we say the length of that now non-duplicated sequence of items does not equal the original length, then <clears throat> then we have a problem. So uh, then we'll raise the value error. Okay, so that actually does all of the checks. The very last bullet point says to update the data. So we obviously need to figure out a way to change the keys in the data frame. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna update self.data and we need a new dictionary. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna zip up the columns which now have been validated as strings that are not duplicates uh, or a list of strings that are not duplicates that are the same length as the original and we're going to get just the value so we're so what we're doing here this zip is zipping up the columns with all of the numpy arrays and then uh, this dict whenever you give it a zip object it will use the no the the uh, the very first sequence as the keys and the second sequence as the values. So this will make a, this will, uh, you know, reassign the data for us with the new column names. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the test, test set columns to see if this is actually working appropriately. And I've already written it in here. So we have test set columns and we can see if this passes. And good, it does pass. So let's go ahead and, uh, before we end this video, let's go ahead and see how this works in the notebook. So here we are again in the notebook and we have DF over here and this is from some previous work. So let's go ahead and reassign df.columns to be, uh, we'll just make it simple. Looks like there's five columns right now. So we did that. 
And if we just look at the underlying data, since we don't have a visual representation, you'll see that in fact our underlying data now has A, B, C, D, E instead of the original, which was you know these over here. So in fact, we were able to reset the columns, it looks like correctly, and our tests verified that. And in the notebook, we've just done some manual verification to do that, uh, to see it as well. Okay, so that concludes step number seven, or step number six. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we are gonna be completing step seven, the shape property. So the shape property will return to our users the number of rows and number of columns of our data frame as a tuple. So we're going to return a two item tuple of the number of rows and number of columns. And we will we are going to make this again a property just like columns was a property. So our users don't have to write df.shape with parentheses following it like a method. Instead they'll just be able to do df.shape now we could have implemented it by doing uh, by making it a method without the property so um, but we're following uh, pandas lead which treats it as a property so you know our data frame class is meant to be very similar to pandas so we're going to just uh, follow uh, exactly what they've done with the shape property keep it as a property and not as a method Okay, so this is actually going to be a, quite a simple uh, task. So we're going to turn, return a two item tuple. We can actually do this in just one line of code. The number of rows. So we already have implemented dunder len, which returns the number of rows. So we can just go ahead and call len on ourself. That's going to return the number of rows. And the number of columns. Well, we're just going to use len again. And we'll just say the length of the dictionary. Uh, which has has uh, which has contains a number of columns. Now we could do self dot columns, uh, which will return a list of columns, uh, and that is perfectly valid too. But this just sort of saves us um, just a little bit of uh, computational uh, time because this is exactly what uh, columns returns. It just uh, a, it forces us to be a list. So there's no need to actually go ahead and call dot columns which will call this instead we can just get uh, length of the uh, data itself directly so this will save us a little bit of a very small amount of computational time but if you I guess if you did have a data frame with a ridiculously large number of columns converting it to a list would be expensive so this would uh, save some time there okay so uh, this should work let's go ahead and run this test so the test is called test shape. Let's see if we pass. So indeed we pass, so everything looks good. Let's go back to our Jupyter Notebook and look at that. So now we'll have df.shape should work. And this data frame has three rows and five columns and it's returned as a tuple. So that looks good. Now, we're there's not gonna be any setter for the shape property. There's only gonna be a getter because we don't want our users to just set the shape um, unless they are going to you know, um, you know, delete rows or delete columns. So we're not gonna let our users just uh, set the shape with the shape property itself. So this will not be settable. There will be no way to, to set this. So there will only be a getter here. Okay, so that does it for step Seven. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we are going to be completing Step 8, Visual Notebook Representation. I want to just hop right into the notebook first before we uh, do any coding. So if we just look back up here at the top of our notebook, we'll see that uh, Pandas Cub currently has no visual representation in the notebook. We simply get this, you know, garbage, just uh, a display whenever we try to look at the contents of our data frame. If we just put DF as the last line of a cell in a notebook, we just, yeah, get this garbage. There's just the, you know, location in, at, in your memory where the data frame is located. 
DF final, that's when pandas cub will be complete. And after this step, this is what your data frame will look like. It'll uh, be a nice, have a nice representation in the notebook. Pandas is represented almost identically as pandas cub. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to produce some nice visual representation so that our users can see what's in their data frame. So what, um, what we're going to do is we're going to return some HTML um, that will represent the notebook. So um, this is simply this, uh, what's good, what, what this representation is, this is not some a way that panda or, or the pandas cub will store the data. This is simply a sort of visual front end, if you will, uh, representation of our data frame, and it will be HTML. And if we inspect the, you know, if you look into our browser, so I just right clicked in, uh, and clicked inspect on Google Chrome, we can see exactly what is being returned over here. And so if you know any HTML, and I can zoom in right here, you'll see that what has happened is that there is a, so if you look over here on the left-hand side, you'll see that it is a, all the HTML, our data frame is highlighted, and this is, looks like it's a table class, so, so we're using the table tag, excuse me. So we're making an HTML table that has a header and a body, and it's rendering as such in the notebook. So you can see the contents. Um, you can look in here and look at all the contents of our data. You can see that, um, you know, here are the column names. Uh, you know, here's a row name. We actually have the zero over here, and then we have Penelope, Texas, 3.6, true, and 45. So this continues for all the other, uh, I guess there's just a couple other rows in our data frame. And so we can inspect those values as well. So this is it. So that's what we want to do. We want to somehow represent this as, a, as HTML so that our Jupyter Notebook can render it nicely in our notebooks. So let's go ahead and uh, look at, inspect our, our file. So this is something, uh, the, the, the method we're going to work on in this particular step is this wrapper HTML method. So this is a, a special method that is only available, uh, that only gets triggered inside a Jupyter notebook. Okay, so um, this is specific to, uh, so IPython has actually uh, given us access to this. So this does not work outside of the IPython Jupyter system. This is very special. So I have, there's a link in the documentation right here where you can find out more. And there's other wrapper methods too that IPython exposes for, you know, uh, different representations such as LaTeX um, or PDF. There's some other ones I believe that are exposed and you can read about them in the documentation. So what happens is what we need to do is we need to return some nicely formatted HTML um, from this method so we, as a string. So we're going to return a string that contains HTML and so uh, Jupyter will pick that string up and will use it to show us uh, our data. Okay, so this is a, um, this is going to be uh, quite a difficult task if you don't know any uh, HTML at all. So, in fact, what I'm going to do here is I'm, I'm not actually going to code this one live. I'm going to cheat here and just simply copy and paste the solution that I already have and uh, go through that a little bit instead of trying to uh, live code it here. So um, this is in the doc strings. So before we get there, I want to cover a little bit about the structure of the HTML that I uh, want to produce. So uh, you, you, again, you have to know some basics of HTML. You don't, it's not a whole lot, just, a, just a, a some basics in order, to, um, in order to complete this step. 
So we're essentially going to create an HTML table. There's going to be a header in the HTML table, and um, that header will um, just have the column names in them. And then the body will just have all the values of our data. So whatever the NumPy arrays have, that's going to be it. So TR um, stands for table row, and each individual value is going to be in this TD tag. So TD just simply stands for table data. So it's, it's a very simple HTML table that just has a header and a body, and within the body are the rows. So that's, that's all that it is. So I'm going to um, open up my file explorer and go ahead and go into the answer sheet uh, and go grab all of the code that's in this repr HTML of the answers. So it is quite a long, uh, quite a bit of code here. And I'm just going to simply copy and paste this and go back over here to the current pandas cub and just paste that right in here. So we have this and um, this is gonna be the final answer. So this will in fact work. So let me just, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna step through this just a little bit, uh, perhaps not all of it, but just so you can get a sense of what's happening. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create just some variable within this method, just called HTML, and this is exactly what's going to be returned. So I'm going to return this HTML, and it's going to be a string. So notice that I've begun the string by creating a table and then the header, and then uh, began with one row in the header, and then TH just stands for table head. So I'm just starting some HTML. Um, and you know, in this header, I'm going to simply uh, one by one, you know, add columns uh, to the HTML inside of a header tag. Now, in here, you'll see that I'm using a lot of f strings, or uh, which are available in only th Python 3.6 or greater. So these are formatted strings that allow you to use these uh, braces in order to put in Python variables in strings. So this is a a popular feature so basically this is just saying put the column names in here um, and this is uh, giving it some formatting with at least uh, 10 spaces um, for each column so uh, I go through that um, and then I start uh, going through the actual data so um, and going one by one and or going through row by row and getting the data and putting the data inside these uh, table row and table data tags, so TR and TD. Um, one thing that I also do is that I limit the output in the in the Jupyter Notebook to 20 rows. So um, I'm not so for instance, if there's a thousand rows, I'm not going to print out all 1,000 rows in HTML. That will actually dramatically slow down the Jupyter Notebook. So I limit it to 20 rows. So if the data frame is more than 20, then it'll only print out the first 10 and last 10 uh, rows. So I uh, don't clog up the notebook uh, with a tremendous amount of output. Instead, we just at, at, a, at most going to put the first 10 or 20 rows. So basically, all this code does is go one by one through each row, and we select um, you know, the value for that particular row of that column and put it inside one of these, uh, you know, TD tags, this table data tag, which is going to be inside a table row tag. So that's all that method, that's all this does. And so if you want to read through here, um, it basically just does this. And at the very end, we close our tags, our body and table tags, and we just return that string of HTML. So that's all we've done. So if we can, uh, there's actually no tests, I believe, uh, for this. So we will just manually test this in the notebook. So if we go back here, DF will now have this Dunder wrapper um, already completed. So now our all of our data frames will have a visual representation. And you can actually get 
you can actually call this private method if you would like, just like this, so nothing is going to stop you from doing that, since nothing is technically private in Python. And you can see um, it'll return the you know return the HTML string which you know Jupyter uses to display um, your object. Okay, so that's very cool um, that we're able to you know create some HTML in here and give our users a very nice representation. Um, of our data frame. Okay, so that does it for step number eight. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we are going to be completing step nine, the values property. So whenever somebody accesses values as an attribute, we are going to return to them a single NumPy array with all of the columns. So this is exactly what pandas does whenever you do something like df.values. It returns all of the underlying data as a single two-dimensional NumPy array. So we're going to be doing the same exact thing. So let's go ahead and see this, uh, how this works in pandas, and then we will implement it ourselves so if we look at uh, dfpandas.values, you'll see that a single one-dimensional, or excuse me, a single NumPy array with all of the columns put together are, is returned. And that is what we're going to do. So currently our data resides in the data attribute, the underscore data attribute. So what we need to do here is collect all of those um, collect all of those columns and simply return, uh, uh, stack them together one after another as columns into one single NumPy array. So the way to do this is simply, there's a, we're going to rely on NumPy here. So there's a column stack function where if you give it a, a tuple or really just any sequence of uh, one-dimensional arrays, it will stack them one after another as columns into a two-dimensional array. So our data is in this underscore data parameter, but we don't want the data, we just want the values. Now we're going to have to force this to be a list, so it is not, uh, it's not an object that NumPy can deal with just by itself this dict view we from from a few steps above so uh, we have to actually force it to be a list of numpy arrays so when you do this you'll get back a list of all the numpy arrays we need to add a return statement here so this should do it we can check it in the notebook df dot values and it looks like everything is correct let's go ahead and run the test for this Excuse me. So let's go here and do test. The test is test values over here. So we're in this section, step nine. Let's go ahead and run this. And we've passed, so it looks good. So this is all we need here is to use this column stack function and pass in a list of all the NumPy arrays in order to return a single uh, two-dimensional NumPy array. So even if we have one column, um, it will return a single one-dimensional NumPy array. All right, that's it for step number nine. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we are going to be completing step 10, the D-types property. So this video will cover another property, D types, which will also act very similar to how the pandas D types property uh, behaves. So whenever somebody makes a statement like df dot D types, what we're going to return is a two column data frame. The first column is going to contain just all the column names, and the second column is going to contain their data type as a string. So we're going to use this dictionary 
to map the column kind, the numpy kind, to the data type string. So we talked about the kind of the data type, which is simply a single character string. So this data type uh, name dictionary is going to be used to sort of translate uh, the kind into um, a more readable data type for our users. Okay, so let's uh, let's see an example of this before we get started. So if we look at uh, the pandas data frame and you type in D type or excuse me D types, you will get back you know the original column names are over here and then their data type is right here. So if we look at the final one, we can see what is supposed to be returned. So it's going to be a a data frame that has two columns. The column names will be called column name and data type. So those we're just going to fix and set. And then we just simply have the old column names over here as the values of the first column. And then the data type as a string as the second one. So let's get started with this. So what we're going to do is, first of all, let's create a new uh, a dictionary that's simply going to hold um, all of the the new data and then we'll, re, we'll, we'll we will use this to construct an entire entire new data frame okay so we have that we've defined a new dictionary this will be the, the new data so let's go ahead and get the keys of the dictionary so this will be the column name so this will be in the first column of the dictionary so we're gonna uh, we want to make this a, so our dictionary needs to be composed of strings mapped to one dimensional arrays. So backing up just a little bit, this new data is what we, we are going to pass this to the constructor. So actually, you know what? We can go at the bottom and say return data frame of new data. So that's what it's going to look like. This is, I'm going to use this to uh, hold a dictionary of strings mapped to one dimensional arrays. And I'm going to use the data frame constructor that's already defined up above to uh, return an entire new data frame. So this needs to conform to the rules that we set up in the first few steps, you know, where the strings or the keys are strings and the values are one dimensional NumPy arrays of all the same length. Okay, so the first thing, let's go ahead and uh, just create our columns here. So this keys, uh, we'll just return the keys, but uh, to create a, a, a NumPy array out of these, we're going to use uh, NumPy itself. We need to convert this into a list to formally make it a list. So we will do that. And so we can actually start this out inside this uh, dictionary definition. So we'll call ahead and say column name is uh, NP array. So this will be the values of that first column. So we'll go ahead and get started with that. So that takes care of the very first column. Now, when you're already at this juncture, you can go ahead and test to see if this is actually working. Without actually running the unit test, you can go into the notebook and see how this looks. So if we look at df.dtypes in its current state, we can see that, all right, we have one column. And the column, uh, it's actually, number one, it's working. There's no error. We have a single column data frame with the old column names as the values for this single column column name. Okay, that looks good. So we just need to add one more column and that's the data type of each column. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna loop through all the values in our old data. Okay, so we're gonna loop through all these values. So every value is a NumPy array and what we want to do here is we want to figure out the the kind number one and we're going to use this kind to look up a more readable data type name so we're just going to make it simple and return either string int float or bool so those are the only possible data types that we're going to allow in our uh, in our data frame so let's go ahead and uh, make this conversion so this is a dictionary so we're going to put the kind in there and we'll need a list to hold this. We'll just say dtypes equals this. 
and we'll just say uh, d types dot append this new string. So we're going to loop through here one by one and get this. So we could actually combine this into a single, we could do a list comprehension. So we can actually go ahead and do this in one single step here. Okay. So let me go ahead and delete this. So it looks like we can do this in one line of code, D types. Okay, so that looks good. And you know what? Maybe we can just go ahead and go one step even further. Put this before here, so D types is that. And maybe to make for some clarity, we can take this out and say, let's call this uh, call names array. So that'll be that. Okay, that looks good. And we'll have to convert this to a NumPy array. So let's go ahead and make the conversion here. Okay, good. So we have now column names. This call I made a new variable call names. That's going to be a NumPy array of all the column names, the keys of the array. D types. Well, first we'll just make it into a list of all these strings. Um, so we loop through all the values, all the NumPy arrays, and simply use this uh, pre-constructed data frame or this dictionary to map those kinds to better looking strings for our users. Then we need to convert this to a NumPy array. So we've done that. So that looks good. So we will map column name to column names, and then we need to do what it says over here, it says use data type as the other column name. So we'll do that. Data type, and we'll map it to our our NumPy array D types. So that looks good. And then we already have a return statement. So I think everything is looking good. Let's go back over here and rerun this. And it looks like it matches the final. So hopefully our test will work. So let's walk through this one last time to make sure everything looks good and it explained well. This D type name dictionary was already provided for us and maps the kind to a string that's easier to interpret by our users. Call names is going to be a NumPy array of all the, uh, all the old column names which are held in the keys of the uh, data dictionary. Then we use a list comprehension to iterate through all the values of our data dictionary, which are NumPy arrays, we get the kind of each one and we do a lookup with this D type name dictionary. So this is returning all the you know, either string int float or bool. We need to make this a NumPy array. So we pass that list into a NumPy or uh, we, cr we force that list to be a NumPy array. And then the last or the next thing we do is we finish creating that dictionary, the all important dictionary of the data that we can pass to the data frame constructor, which are strings mapped to one dimensional NumPy arrays. And then we call our own constructor here. So this is gonna go back up and call our, that constructor, run all those checks again, and then return an entirely new data frame. So that looks good. And let's go ahead and run this so the test is called test D types and see if we get it correct. So, all right, we got it passed. So it says one passed, it's one test. So that looks good. All right, so that is it for the D types property um, and concludes step number 10. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video, we are completing step 11 select a single column. So we want our users to be able to select one or more columns from our data frame. In this step, we are just going to have them be able to select a single column. And we are going to use the brackets operator in order to do this. So the selection will look something like this, df, open brackets, then the column name as a string, and then the end of the brackets. Eventually we will allow our users to select 
in a number of different ways. But this, but in this step, we're only going to we're only going to do selection for a single column. So we will get to the other column selections in a little bit. But for now, uh, we will just do a single column selection. So in order for these brackets to have these brackets work with your object, this is again part of the Python data model that is just built in. You know inherently into Python. So if you want these brackets to work with your object, you need to define this get item special method. So this get item special method is triggered whenever somebody uses these brackets directly appended to your object. Whatever object is within these brackets gets passed to this variable right here, to the very first parameter. So we're just going to call it item. You can call it whatever you want. But we're just going to uh, assign it to as the variable name item. So in this step, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to handle the case whenever a user gives us a single string in here. We will return a single data or a single column data frame of just that column. Okay, so let's go inside here. And what we're going to do is if, if item is a string, so if the user has passed us a string, we are going to return a data frame of just that single column. So this is actually going to be a fairly simple thing. Um, we're going to use our own data frame constructor, which requires a dictionary of the column name. So in this case, it's just uh, item. And it's going to be mapped to a single one-dimensional uh, one numpy array. Well, we have our uh, we have our one-dimensional uh, numpy array in uh, by accessing it through our data dictionary. So we'll just put in item like this. So this should work out. So here's our inner dictionary that we're just giving we're passing to our data frame constructor. We're simply creating a one-item dictionary. And we're just returning uh, within here. We're getting that that uh, array. So that's all we want to do. We can go ahead and see how this looks in the notebook. So I like to test this out manually. So here's our data frame. That's our pandas cub in its current state. So if we want to get the state column, it looks like that's working. We want to get the school column. That looks good too. So it looks like it's working. Let's go ahead and run the test. It's called test one column. So here we go, test one column. And it doesn't look like this has actually uh, worked. So there's no such name as test one column. So it looks like I've actually uh, must have changed the name of this. So let's go in here and correct that. So if we go in here and test select, oh, okay, that's why. Because it's an entire new class, so I made a mistake here. So now, if I actually read the instructions, I would have known this. It's in the test selection class. So I improperly called uh, PyTest. So if we look up here, and so this is a good, uh, uh, a good segue to actually take a look at the test data frame.py file. So the tests are broken out into different classes. So I've used classes to categorize different tests. So we've finished the test data frame creation part of the, you know, of this file. So I put all of these selections inside of a new class called test selection. So let's go ahead and let's get this back up here. So we're no longer in this test data frame class. We're in test selection. So improperly called the test, and now it found it, and now it passed. So, um, um, and you'll see in the notes exactly what class it's under. Uh, anytime there's a new class, I will uh, write that in the notes. So I just was not paying attention to my own notes. Anyway, so um, I fixed that, and it looks like I passed the test. So that completes step 11, where we select a single column from our data frame by placing a string within the brackets operator.
Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 12, select multiple columns. So the last video we looked at the get item special method. We tested whether or not our users pass us a, a single string and then we return just a single column data frame, <clears throat> assuming that string was one of the columns in the data frame. Now in this video, we are going to select multiple columns with a list. So this is exactly what pandas does, and we're following pandas here. So the syntax will look something like this, df, and then within the brackets, we start a brackets, which is the universal selection operator for, for Python. We're going to place a list of column names as string in here and select just those columns. So we're just going to continue on here and if our users if the item they give us is a list then we will branch off into here so what we're going to do again is just going to return a data frame and again we're going to map from the columns that they pass us to the um, arrays that uh, the underlying NumPy arrays. So let's go ahead and write a for loop in here. We'll do a dictionary comprehension. So we'll say for column in self dot data, let's call it the uh, column dot values and column dot data dot items. So we'll iterate through both the column and the values. Actually, you know what? Let's take that back. So we'll say for column in item so we're going to iterate through exactly what the user has given us so item here is a list so we're going to get that column we're going to map it to data of column like this i think that's a better way of of uh of doing it so we're just gonna we're only going to iterate through item which is a list so column is going to be a string name and we're going to say make a mapping of column to that data. So that's all we're going to do is we're going to return that. So that uh, that should work. Let's go test it out manually. I really like testing this out manually. So here's a DF again and let's say we want to get uh, school and uh, wait and see if this works. Okay that looks good. What if we want three columns? So school wait and state Okay, that's looking uh, that lo that's looking good. So it's just a one line. We're doing. Let's just explain this once again. So we're doing a dictionary comprehension. We're returning a you know a call to our data frame constructor, which takes a dictionary. So here's the dictionary of strings. So column is going to be assumed a string. So if this is not a string, so if someone passes in bad data, then it will fail the constructor. So we don't have to worry about taking care of that case. It'll be taken care of by the constructor. And then we're going to map it to that NumPy array that it is um, already mapped to. So let's go ahead and run this. So it's test multiple columns is the name of the test, multiple columns. And let's see if it passes. And in fact, it does pass. So we have completed this step of selecting multiple columns with a list. So that is it for step 12. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we are completing step 13, Boolean Selection. So Boolean Selection is where we select data based on the values themselves. We're not selecting based on the column names. So for instance, if we wanted to select uh, call, uh, select all the rows that had you know a height greater than um, you know 30 or just some value greater than 30 then that would be something called boolean selection so let's take a look at this with pandas just so that we can have an idea of what a better idea of what I'm talking about so we go back up here we'll use the pandas data frame and do some boolean selection with the pandas data frame so typically the way uh, pandas we show pandas boolean selection is that you select a single column 
So let's just go ahead and use this height column. And we're going to use one of the comparison operators. All right, and we'll say if this is, say, greater than 4. So for instance, uh, we're only going to select here the one person that's greater than 4, or the one row that has height greater than 4. So there's two false and one true. So we can assign this to some variable called filt, and then we can pass in filt to DF pandas, and it will select um, all the rows such that uh, filt is true. So here we just have one. We can change this a little bit. Let's do uh, 3.55 just so we can get two rows. So there's two rows, two people that have a height of greater than 3.55. So that's an example of Boolean selection. So we're going to make our data frame uh, work similar um, to that. So what we're going to do is we're going to check if the user gives us a data, a single column data frame that has nothing but Boolean values, we will then do Boolean selection. So that's going to be the requirement. So we're going to test that out. So um, we're going to make another case here. So the first case was if the user gave us a string within the brackets. The second one was whether the user gave us a list. And in this case, we're going to check if the instance is a data frame. So if in fact it is a data frame, then we have to do uh, a few other things first. So here are the items we need to uh, to check to see if we can actually process this data frame. First of all, we're only going to allow for data frames to be one column. So you, you the user is going to be forced to give us a single column data frame. So let's go ahead and do this. So if item so we already have this shape parameter that returns the number of rows and columns so that's a tuple if this does not equal one so we're going to force it to be a one column data frame we're going to return or we're going to raise excuse me a value error and say that item must be a one column data frame okay so we've handled that case so if it passes that we're going to extract the underlying numpy array so let's go ahead and call this array. We're going to get the array of uh, underneath item. So it's stored in the data uh, underscore data parameter. And it's going to be under the values. Now remember that we can't just use the brackets like this to select a single you know, value uh, from here. So instead, we are going to force it to be an iterable and just say get the very next one. So again, this is just uh, because uh, when you call values on your dictionary, it doesn't return something that you can just uh, use the brackets to select via uh, like the index of it, you know, using integers like 0, 1, 2, or 3. So it is uh, iterable, so we're going to make an iterator. And then we're just going to uh, get the very uh, next one of that iterator. So this is the underlying array of that one column data frame. So we've done that. So we're only going to be able to process this if it is a Boolean uh, array. So the type must be Boolean. So if array.dtype.kind, if this does not equal B, we will raise a... Uh, well, we probably should raise a type error, although it says value error. But uh, since um, it says that, we'll just say value error just to be consistent with the notes. So we get, we'll just say that uh, uh, item must be a one column, we'll say Boolean data frame. Give it a little bit more descriptive. So if the user did not give us a Boolean data frame, or excuse me, a, a data frame that had one column with a Boolean, that, with the column being a Boolean, then we are going to raise an error. Okay. Now, so now we're guaranteed that this array, ARR, is in fact um, Boolean. So it's a one-dimensional NumPy array. So now we are going to simply uh, create um, some new data and iterate through all of the columns and only select 
those rows where in fact we have a true value. So we're going to rely on NumPy here again. So let's go ahead and uh, iterate through every single one of these. So in fact we can actually just go straight to a return statement and use a dictionary in here. So we could say uh, call a value of array or call comma value in self dot underscore data dot items. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through our data, through our current data. So the, the data frame that we want to make the Boolean selection for. So we're going to iterate through each column value pair. And basically we're just going to um, pass this Boolean array that our user has given us in which will allow us to do the selection like this. Okay, so this is, uh, this is NumPy acting for us. So you have to know a little bit of NumPy. So NumPy does Boolean selection. So ARR is a Boolean array. Value is also a one-dimensional NumPy array. So this will, so, uh, this will do Boolean selection via NumPy. And it will return also a one-dimensional NumPy array and it'll get mapped uh, from this column string. So this should work right here. Um, we could uh, break this out into two steps, so maybe that's a little bit easier. So we could just say, uh, this is the new data, and we're gonna return uh, the data frame constructor of this new data. So maybe that can shorten the, the line, that single line, and break it out. So hopefully this will work. We can test this out now in our in the Jupyter Notebook. So again, here is DF. This is our current state of pandas. Now, we don't, uh, we have not yet implemented the greater than or less than uh, operator, but we do have a column of Boolean values. So let's go ahead and just use that as our filter. So we can actually select a Boolean column like this. So we'll just call this filt and we've assigned uh, this school column to filt. So we should be able to pass in this filt into here, and there's true two true, so the very first and last rows should be returned, and it looks like it has done just that. So it looks everything looks good. If you give it a one column data frame of Boolean values, you will in fact uh, you know return this. So we it's also good to check the errors sometimes. So let's just do some other column we'll just call it state let's select state as a column and see if we can force an error here and give it this so we do in fact invoke a value error saying item must be a one column boolean data frame okay so everything is looking good and when we give it a one column data frame of boolean uh, that has a boolean column it will do the boolean selection properly Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. It says step 13 is going to, we need to run test simple Boolean. So we are going to test simple Boolean here and looks like we've passed. All right, so <clears throat> that does it for step number 13. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video, we are completing step 14, check for simultaneous selection. And what I mean by simultaneous selection is that we will be checking to see if there is simultaneous row and column selection from our data frame. So it's nice to be able to uh, select columns like we did in, in the previous few steps, but our users, uh, but but it'd also be nice if we, we granted our users the ability to, to select rows as well as columns. So we're going to allow them to select rows and columns simultaneously by, uh, by, by giving the brackets two items separated by a comma. So this step, in this step, we're just going to check the, we're just going to make a check to see if the user wants to select rows and columns simultaneously. So whenever you pass the brackets uh, objects like this separated by a comma, what's going to happen is that 
the get item special method will receive them as a tuple. So that is the type that Python uses inter internally to uh, pass around comma separated values within the brackets themselves. So if item is a tuple, that means that the user is trying to send us um, one or more items uh, separated uh, by, a, comp by a, a, a comma. Sorry, I just double clicked that. Let's hop on back down. Okay, so um, I have here that the, the next step, steps 14 through 18 are optional. They are difficult, so if you want to skip them, you're perfectly um, okay to skip them uh, and you won't miss out on too much but these next steps 14 through 18 so these are five steps that are all going to deal with simultaneous row and column selection so there's a lot that needs to be covered in order to sort of give our users a complete um, ability to select rows and columns simultaneously so with that said uh, let's move on to the actual step 14 um, again, so we're just going to check that our user is trying to do row and column selection simultaneously. So uh, here we are. We have in we're inside the get item special method. The uh, we first checked whether or not a the user passes a string. Then we checked whether the user passes a list. And in the last step, we we checked whether the user passes a one column boolean data frame. In this step, we are going to we are first going to check whether or not the user gives us a um, a a tuple. So if it get, if the user gives us a tuple, then that means that they are we are hoping that they're trying to do row and column uh, selection simultaneously. So if the user if item is a tuple, what we're going to do here is we're gonna we're actually gonna call a separate method so we're gonna separate out the logic uh, of this so we're gonna return the result of the get item tuple method that I have defined right below this so get item tuple will um, we're gonna pass it the item right here and that's what we're gonna return so this method will be implemented in a later step okay so um, now, if now so this is uh, if if we do not receive a tuple, so if, if we have uh, if the code reaches to the end of uh, is not a string, is not a list, is not a data frame, is not a tuple, then we are going to raise a type error, so and tell the user that they must they must give us. A, either a string, a list, a data frame, or a tuple. So those are the options. So if one of these if statements is not triggered, if not turns out to be true, then we are going to just uh, yeah raise the raise the type error and say um, you must pass either a string, list, data frame, or tuple and I'll just press enter here so we can get a new line here uh, to the selection operator okay so I think that's fine we'll put a space there so that's gonna raise a type error you must pass either a, a string list data frame or tuple to the selection operator so that completes that part we're gonna raise a type error so, so all of these branches are taken care of. So if we have a string, we do we return a one item data frame. If we have a list, we're going to return um, a data frame of just those columns. If we receive a data frame, we're going to ensure that it's a one column uh, Boolean data frame and do Boolean selection. If it's a tuple, we will go ahead and actually call this method and we will implement this later. And if it's not either of those four types, then we are going to raise a type error. So all of these, um, all, all of, uh, so so every uh, everything is covered. Um, so it has to be either one of those four types. If it's not, we are going to get uh, an error. Okay. So one last thing inside here. So now we're guaranteed that item is a tuple. So 
The only thing we want to do here is verify for the, to complete this step is to verify that in fact we get, we're getting a two item tuple. So so if you're going to give a pass a tuple to the brackets uh, selection operator, it needs to be exactly two items. And if it's not, we are going to raise a type or excuse me a value error. We'll just say if the length of the item is not two, then we will raise a value error. Item tuple must have length two. Okay, so that should do it. So that is the end of this. So we'll say run this test, run simultaneous. We'll say run simultaneous tuple test and see if it passes. Okay, great. So it passed uh, this test. So just a recap of this particular step of step 14. All we're doing here is we're checking to see if our user has given us a tuple. If it has given us a tuple, then we're going to call this method down here, which we'll uh, uh, work on for the rest of uh, problems, uh, steps through 18. If it's not a tuple, we'll simply raise a type error and say you have to return, we, you have to pass us a string list, data frame, or a tuple. Okay, so this sets us up for simultaneous row and column selection. Um, and we'll uh, get to the actual selecting in the next step. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we will complete step 15, select a single cell. So we are going to allow our users to select a single cell of data uh, using the brackets operator. So to select a single cell, you need uh, the user needs to give us both a row selection and column selection. So the very last video, we began this method get item tuple, which handled the case whenever a user would give us a a, a a row selection and a column selection. So this is a this is what we're going to be working with. We're going to write the code within here. So if the user does give us a single row and single column selection, we will be able to process it here. So the first thing that uh, this step requires us to do is to create a variable called row selection and another variable called column selection and, uh, and uh, assign row selection to the first line of the tuple and call selection be assigned to the second item. So what we're going to do here is simply unpack our tuple so let's go ahead and write this equals item. So item is guaranteed to be a two item tuple at this stage, which means we can use unpacking to put the very first item in row selection and the second item in call selection. Okay, so let's go ahead and keep reading over here. It says if row selection is an integer, reassign it as a one element list of that integer. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. So if row selection is an integer, we are going to reassign a row selection to be just simply a, uh, an a, a one item list of that particular integer. Now I'm going to uh, do this. If column selection is an integer, we're going to reassign it to a one item list of the string name of the uh, column it represents. Okay, so if call selection is an integer, so we so for instance if it's if the user has given us say two comma three, well two will become a list of just two and three instead of just being the list of three, it will be the column name. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna reassign this to be a list, but we're going to actually use our columns property and select it like this. So this will return to us the column name of that integer. So columns we implemented earlier. So we're just taking advantage of our earlier code that we've already implemented. And then we're going to put that inside of a list. Okay. Now, if column selection is a string, then we're going to assign it to uh, an, el uh, an element, uh, a one element list of just that string. So if it's already a string, then we're going to be um, you know, it's going to be okay uh, the way it is. So let's do an if else statement here. So if 
call selection otherwise if it's a string we'll just reassign it as just a list of that string so we're going to assume the user is passing us a column name that is a string there okay so yes now row selection and column selection are all lists containing um, one single item in them um, um, uh, after after they've gone through through this now um, what it says to do here is that we're going to write a for loop to go through every uh, to, to go through every uh, column selection <clears throat> and then make a new dictionary new data and return just the rows for that particular column selection in this case there's only going to be one row per column selection and in fact there's only going to be one column selection so this for loop will actually work for the uh, all the other steps in this get item tuple so this is going to be a generic for loop that we're going to build that will be used for the rest of the um, for the rest of the problem so um, they, they will all uh, all of the other problems that uh, uh, 15 through 18 will be able to be solved will be able to work with this particular for loop okay so let's go ahead and uh, create uh, the new data dictionary okay so again um, a lot of these methods are going to use this new data so we're going to create an entirely new dictionary and then pass that to our constructor so let's go ahead and iterate through column selection so for call in column selection here's just one member we're going to update this, so we're going to say new data of that call. We want it to be a NumPy array. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and uh, get the NumPy array by just doing call. But we're going to use the row selection here. So row selection is, uh, we're going to go ahead and say, we're just going to select just those rows. So this returns us the underlying NumPy array. And NumPy arrays have, are able to use the brackets operator. So within the brackets, we're gonna pass it the row selection. So this, uh, this should work. And uh, let's see what it returns here. Um, so let's go ahead and return a data frame of this new data so this so our code should only work right now whenever uh, the row selection is an integer and the column selection is either an integer or a string okay so let's go ahead and look at the Jupyter notebook here and see if we can test this out live so here is our pandas cub df so it should work if we're going to select say like the first row and maybe the second column so this would be here this is row number one it's zero indexed column number two or with index two zero one two would be height so this hopefully should return 3.5 and it does so that looks like it's working there let's go ahead and select a different one so let's use a string like weight for one of the columns and so that works as well okay good so everything looks like it's working and let's go ahead and run the test that we need to run and this time the test is called uh, right here it's test single element and let's see if it works okay good so it passed everything is green and I have passed that test so let's go back and make sure we understand that um, so we're simply uh, taking the case whenever row selection is an, is an integer, we're going to make row selection a one item list. If column selection is an integer, then we're going to uh, make column selection a one, one list string, a one item uh, or a list containing one item that's a string. Um, if it is a string, then we'll just leave it as it is, but still make it into a one item list. So the end result is that row selection and call selection are both lists. So we're going to iterate through all of the columns like this. We're going to create a new dictionary that's going to contain our data. And then we're going to make entries in our dictionary that have the column names, which are now strings, and we're going to map them to one dimensional arrays. So this is the original array over here. 
this, uh, you know, we're going to select the original array, but we're only going to select these rows. And in this case, it's just a single row. But uh, we're going to use the brackets operator to put the row selection in there. And then we'll call our own constructor with that new dictionary, uh, which will return a completely new data frame. Okay, so that's it for uh, for part or for, uh, for step 15. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 16. Select rows as booleans, lists, or slices. So in the last video we only handled the case when our user gave us a single integer for the row selection. For the column selection we allowed our user to give us either an integer or a string. So we're going to go ahead and give our users even more choices for rows in this step. So we're going to allow our users to give us a, a single column Boolean data frame, a list, or a slice. So we're going to allow our users to make selections by those three things at the end. So here's some examples of, uh, of selection with either a Boolean, a list, or a slice uh, over here. So when I say a Boolean, I'm saying a one column Boolean data frame. So it'll look something like this. Now there's some sort of comparison operator. Uh, you, we'll able, we'll, our data frame will be able to work with either uh, a list like this, two, four, or one, like this is just selecting the rows, two, four, or one, or a slice object. So a slice is used with the, so this is slice notation with the two, with the colon, saying going from uh, row two all the way up to row five, but not including five. So we're not gonna do anything with the column selection here. We're gonna allow it to, to remain the way it is. So if someone passes an integer or a string, that will be fine right now. We'll, we will handle more complex column selections in a later step. Okay, so we handled the case whenever row selection was an integer. Let's look at whether, uh, if, it, if this is a data frame. So let's say if row selection is a data frame. So if it is a data frame, then uh, we're going to do the same checks that we did for the Boolean selection a couple steps above. So if row selection, um, if it's not a one column data frame, then we will raise a value error. And that's exactly what that note says over there. Say, uh, we could say row selection data frame must be one column. Okay. Now, uh, so if it passes this, then we will extract row selection again. So we did this up above. Um, we're gonna, sorry, we're going to extract the underlying NumPy array. So now, that we are in this branch, we are guaranteed that row selection is a data frame. It also has exactly a one column over here because we did that with shape. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the uh, this kind of awkward thing to get the very the only uh, the only value in the dictionary. So row selection dot underscore data dot values. So that gets the very first one. And we're just going to reassign it to row selection itself. So now row selection, we don't care about the name of the column. We just care about getting that uh, underlying NumPy array. So row selection is now an underlying NumPy array. Okay. And we have to do one check here. So it has to be a, a Boolean NumPy array. So if row selection, uh, the D type, the kind of it is not B. So we did this same exact operation. We will raise a type error, and that's the error I meant to raise in the other one, but it's fairly minor, so we're just going to keep on going. And say, um, row selection data frame must be a Boolean. Okay. All right. So that, case, that takes care of the case whenever row selection is a data frame. But what happens if it's a list or a slice? Okay. So... Let's do that. So this is what this says. If row selection is not a list or a slice, raise a type error. So LL if, so let's do another branch here. So if row selection is not a, 
you know, list or a slice object, okay, then we will raise a type error. So we won't actually change row selection. We so it's perfectly fine that row selection is a list. So our our uh, dictionary builder over here will work out just fine. So NumPy arrays ha or handle just fine when rows when when you select via a list or a um, or a slice or a boolean uh, array. So I, either one of those three are okay. So that's why we don't have to do anything here if it's a list or a slice, but we do need to raise an error. So I should actually say if not, if it's not an instance of row of list or slice, then we will raise a type error and say that the row selection must be one of those, must be row selection must be uh, an int uh, list slice or data frame. Okay. Okay, so that should handle all the cases correctly. So let's just review this really quick. So at the end of last step, we were right here. So we handled the case if someone gave us an integer as the row selection. Now, if someone gives us an, a data frame, we're going to raise an error if it's more than one column. Otherwise, we are going to extract the underlying NumPy array, which we do here. If that NumPy array is not a Boolean, we are only going to we're only going to uh, accept data frames that have Boolean uh, columns or one column Boolean. Okay, so row selection, if it passes all these tests, it will be a, a uh, you know, one dimensional NumPy array. Now, if row selection, uh, otherwise, if row selection is a list or is not a list or a slice, then we will raise a type error. So and we will just keep it, keep the list or slice, uh, whatever it was. So we're not going to actually change it here like we did over here. There's no reassignment on this branch over here. Okay, so that's all we've done here. We simply added uh, this code right here, this block of code. We're not going to touch the columns selection over here until the next step. So let's go back to our data frame just so we can see this in action now. So what we did here was we allowed um, our data frame to handle uh, lists. So let's go ahead and allow it to handle a list. So we, here we have a list, 0, comma, 1. So this just gives rows 0 and 1 along with column with index 3. You can, uh, you know, of course, put the column name over here. So that's one way. We can use slicing. So say we want to slice from 1 to the end. That will also work. We want to slice from the beginning to one. That also works. Slice from the beginning to two. That works. And we can also use Boolean selection here in the rows. So let's go ahead and use that school column, which is a, a Boolean uh, column. And we'll assign it to the word or the name filt. And it looks like we have an error, so let's go ahead and look at here. It says row selection must be a Boolean. So, hmm. So let's look at filth. That certainly looks like a Boolean. This should work. Row select, so let's go look over here. Oh, so this should be not equal to. That was a little bug in our code. So if it's not a Boolean, then we will raise a type error. Let's go ahead and do this. And we might have to, um, let's go ahead and restart the kernel. And let's just run all. And now let's go down here. And it does in fact work. Okay, so the reason I had to restart the kernel is that this auto reload from above, so this is a good chance to talk about this. So the auto reload is not a 100% foolproof. Um, in fact, what happens is it messes up whenever you're checking for an uh, is instance of itself. So when you auto reload, um, it doesn't like uh, reset the instance, so it doesn't know that is it's actually an instance of itself. So it'll it'll call the auto reload doesn't always work when you do is instance of a data frame. So it actually thinks that the you know 
uh, the, the instance that you're checking is a com is of a completely different type when it is not. So you'll, that's the one time you will need to reset the kernel uh, when, uh, when you're checking for is instance of a data frame. So uh, that's a little bit of a bummer, but that's something that uh, uh, will crop up. So if, if, if you're getting these weird errors and you don't think you have an error when you're manually testing, then you just might need to go ahead and restart the notebook. Okay, so we have not actually formally tested it with PyTest, so let's go ahead and do this. And let's look at the test. It says test all row selections. So test all row selections. And it looks like we are good right there. So we passed the test. All right, fantastic. That completes step number 16. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 17, multiple columns simultaneous selection. So we are going to allow our users to be able to select multiple columns with a list whenever they're selecting rows and columns simultaneously. So again, this, this entire section right here, uh, we're in this get item tuple, is whenever the user has attempted to select rows and columns simultaneously with this particular syntax. So they have their data frame df, they use the brackets, and within the brackets they're passing in two separate objects, a row selection and a column selection. Thus far our row selection, we've able, we handle the case whenever a row selection is either an integer, right here, um, <clears throat> or a data frame, a one column data frame that's a boolean, or a list or a slice. If it's not any of those, then we will not be able to handle it and we'll raise a type error. On the other hand, whenever the, the user has given us a, a column selection, we're only able to handle the cases right now whenever the column selection is either an integer or a string. So we're going to add the additional case such that uh, if the user has given us a list. So we want to uh, we want to be able to process this. So, so far, nothing's going to happen if the, the user has given us a list. So let's go ahead and make a specific case for this. So if call selection is indeed a list, what we want to do is allow users to give us either integers or strings within this list. Okay, so uh, in the notes it says, let's create a an empty list called new column selection. So we'll just go ahead and do that new call selection and we'll make this equal a list. So the final value of new call selection will be a list of strings. We only want to accept, we want to turn any integer into a string. So we're going to iterate through each element of call selection and check if it is an integer. If it is, then we'll do, we, we will go ahead and do the conversion and uh, select the actual column name. So let's go ahead and do this. So for call in call selection, if um, if call is an integer, then we'll go ahead and append to this the value of that. So we'll do self dot column. We'll get the string of that call. So if it's an integer, we will append. We will have to dig into the columns, find out that string name, and append it to new column selection. Otherwise, we're just going to take a shortcut here and just assume that our user has given us a string. So if they haven't, we're not going to handle the case. Um, we're just going to assume that this is a string. So you might want to write a little note here, assuming call is a string. Okay. So. Now, uh, new call selection is a list, but um, our little for loop here that returns our actual data that's responsible for making the dictionary is using uh, call selection. So let's go ahead and reassign, reassign call selection to equal this new call selection. So we basically transformed uh, you know, call selection by, by, by iterating through here. Um, and that's what uh, this is. This is what this asks to do. So reassign call selection to it. Okay. So our our original loop that we defined in problem fifth or in step fifteen should still work. 
So, um, the, you know, it requires that call selection be a list of strings for it to work. And then row selection can be any of the four other types that we've already discussed. Okay. Or actually, row selection will end up either being a list, a, or, or a slice, or a Boolean uh, array. Okay, so let's see if this works. Let's go ahead and take a look at this in the notebook itself. So let's go down here. So we have df. So now we're going to allow df to be, or allow column selection to be a list. So we could use uh, like name and then height. And we can actually allow it to be uh, integers here. So negative one just grabs the very last column name. So it looks like it works. Um, the row selection here is a list. The column selection here is a list. They both seem to work. We can make this a slice, an empty slice. So this just selects all the rows. So uh, everything's looking good. Let's go ahead and run the test. So we have PyTest over here, and then the test is called test list columns and we passed the test. All right, fantastic. So all we did here was we handled the case whenever the user gave us a list for the column selection when doing simultaneous column selection, and we turned any integers into strings. And then we just assumed that the user was hopefully intelligent enough to give us uh, the correct column names as strings for the other ones. You can do some type checking here, but I've decided uh, against it for simplicity. Okay, so that uh, completes step 17. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 18, column slices. So, we, we are going to handle one additional case for column selection when we're doing row and uh, column simultaneous selection. And that's whenever, and that's the case when column selections are slices. So all three of these selections over here on the right-hand side, where I have my mouse hovering over, are column selections that involve slicing. So all of these have the slice notation for the column selection part. So we are going to allow uh, uh, the slices to either have integers or strings in them. So if column selections have integers, like here, they will be exclusive of the very last one. And that's exactly what pandas does. So for instance, this first slice will go up to, but not including, uh, index 3. Whereas uh, slices that do include uh, column names uh, as strings will be inclusive of the last one. So in this case, uh, if f happens, uh, f will be included as long as it's a multiple of two. So this is the, the step, of course, of the slice. All right, so if we look back up here, we're still in this get item tuple method. So we've handled all the cases for row selection for our data frame. So we've handled the case whenever the row selection is an integer, a data frame, or a list, or a slice. So we're done with all those cases. If it's not any of those cases, we will raise a type error. For the column selection, we've handled the case whenever column selection is an integer, a string, or a list. Now we're going to handle one final case, and that's whenever column selection is a slice. So the column selection has uh, you know, three attributes, start, stop, and step. So I'm going to go ahead and define three uh, variables with inside here that are simply equal, have take on the same name as those attributes of, uh, of a slice. So start, stop, and step, I'm going to make separate variables for them. So it'll be easier to handle. Okay, so that's what this does right here. We're going to define new variables with the same name to hold those attributes. Okay, so uh, before I get any further, it says if column selection is not a slice, raise a type error. So let's step out of this um, this part of this branch right here. So let's end this. So if, if it's not an integer string list or slice, then we will raise a type error and say column selection must be one of those, must be int 
string, list, or slice. Okay, so that'll handle that. So continuing, if, str if start is a string, reassign it to its integer index amongst the columns. So let's check. So if in the case that we do have a string here, we are going to uh, we are going to go ahead and reassign it to the integer index uh, uh, where it's at. And now this will become more apparent uh, later on. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll say that if if start is a string, then we're just going to go ahead and get its index. So we're going to reassign it. That's what this says. We're going to reassign it to the integer index. So start dot um, uh, index. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So we're going to find the column number here. So we're going to find its index. Okay, so the columns is a list, and we'll simply get the uh, the index of that start. Now, with stop, we're going to reassign it to the integer index again, but we're going to add one since we're going to include um, the uh, the stop column if it is a string. So we're going to add one to the stop one. So let's go ahead and do this. So if stop is also a string, if stop is a string, then we'll do a reassignment. So we're going to get the index of this so and we'll just add one to this all right now we're not going to check the step we're going to assume our users have given us a correct step which should be an integer or just will be left blank uh, as it is in most cases and when it's not given it's just uh, the step size is going to be one by default so we won't mess around with that we'll just hope the user uh, gives us a correct step so start, stop, and step should now be integers. This is not entirely true. Step um, could be anything, but we'll just uh, assume it's the default in, um, in B1. So now we're going to uh, reassign column selection as a list. So let's. So now that start, stop, and step are uh, integers, we're going to reassign column selection. We're going to go ahead and make. We're going to go ahead and grab columns again, and we're going to do start. We're going to give it stop and step. So we're going to go ahead and slice the columns for exactly uh, what we need here. And this will, uh, this will get us the correct column selection as a list of the columns we want. So we simply uh, broke down start, stop, and step if they were strings. We put them, we change them to integers. We use those integers uh, start, stop, and step in our slice notation of the columns, and that will allow us to choose column selection as a list, which is what our little um, for loop re requires. So we need column selection to be a list of the strings of the exact columns that we want. So that looks like that should work. If, if start is an integer, we're not going to go into this branch. So, you know, it'll just go... Uh, directly here. If stop is an integer, uh, it'll just go here as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at, let me exit out of here. Let's go ahead and look at this in action and see if we can get this to work. So here again we have our data frame. So let's uh, slice all the rows, keep all the rows, and let's slice from state all the way to school. Let's see if this works. So that looks good. So it's state to school. So state uh, all the columns between state and school and an included school. So that looks good. So let's do this again. Let's go from uh, 1 to 3. Let's use integers and see here uh, the third column is not included. So this grabs columns with index 1 and 2, which are simply state and height. So it looks like column selection is indeed uh, working for us whenever we give it a slice. All right, so let's formally test this with test call slice. And it passed, so it looks good. All right, so that is, uh, we have completed a subset selection, and uh, we're going to move on to 
Um, actually, we have one more small section on subset selection, and then we're going to move on to something else um, after that step. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 19, tab completion for columns. So this is a step that will simply help out our users uh, correctly type in the column names whenever they're doing uh, whenever they're selecting a single column of data from their data frame. So let's just see how this works in the Jupyter Notebook. So if we're down here, and let's look at how it works in Pandas. So here's Pandas, and the way Pandas works is if you want to select a single column, say like height, and you start typing it in, uh, here I've just typed in the first three characters, and you press Tab, so if you, you have to pay attention very closely, see if I can go back one character. So if you press tab, okay, so if there's more than one um, option available, then it'll bring down a drop down menu and you can go down or up and select uh, the correct option. So I believe there's actually a, a bug with IPython at the moment and it's showing too many options here because obviously help or hex are not uh, column names. So that's unfortunate and it sort of pollutes the drop down menu, but hopefully that will get sorted out at some point. Regardless, you still have help available and you can just press enter to select the column that you want. So there's a little bit of tab completion help. Let's see if, uh, yeah, so weight is a little bit more unique. So I'm right here, WE, and I press tab and I get weight completed instantaneously. So uh, to do this, um, you have to fill out, uh, fill out this, uh, this sort of uh, method that's special just to IPython. So it begins with a single underscore, so IPython will pick up on this, and it's called IPython key completions. So when you, uh, what, need, what you need to do here, and if you read the documentation um, in uh, IPython, is that you're, you need to return a list here of all the possibilities that you want um, your users to be able to choose from whenever they're putting a key into the the brackets so this is specifically whenever you have the bracket somewhere when you're doing some sort of get item operation that you want to give your user choices on what to select from those brackets so here we just want to want our users to select the <clears throat> you know uh, be able to select the column names so let's go ahead and do that. Um, we're just going to return the column names, so the, the, which are already a list. So we're just going to return self.columns, and that should do it. So let's go ahead and see. So here's our data frame. It has the same exact columns. So if we do it, okay, good. So I just pressed tab, and I checked it out live, and it looks like it's working. So that looks, uh, that looks very good. Okay. So let's go ahead, there is a test here, uh, test tab complete, and uh, let's see if we get it right. So test tab complete, and everything looks good. Okay, so that does it for step 19. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 20, create a new column. The past several videos had us selecting subsets of data with the brackets. And the way Python allows us to do this is gives us this special get item uh, method, this special method, dunder get item. So in this, uh, in this video, what we were going to be doing is uh, creating an entire new column, uh, or in fact, uh, overriding an old column as well. So for instance, this is what our syntax uh, is going to look like. We're going to be able to do something like this. df, and this, using the same brackets, put the name of the new column, or it could be actually an old column and we're overriding it. But regardless, we're going to allow our data frame to take in a, a single column or append a new column to it. And uh, we're going to force our users to use a NumPy array to give us uh, the values for the for that new column. 
So this uh, is not done. This is we're going to be doing an assignment statement here. So this is done not with the dunder get item, but with dunder set item special method. So here it is over here. It's already defined, and we are going to complete this. So this method gets triggered whenever you do an assignment statement to the brackets operator. So it takes two parameters that are sent to it. So first is the key. This is the value inside the brackets. And the second is the what's called the value. And this is on the right hand side of the equal sign. So those are the two values that are passed over here to the set item special method. So it's our job uh, to, um, to implement this right now. OK. So let's just follow uh, the instructions over here and knock this out one by one. So it says the key, oh yeah, so the key is new column and the value is whatever is on the right hand side of the uh, equal sign. So here's our first sort of task. It says if the key is not a string, raise a not implemented error, stating that the data frame can only handle uh, a single, uh, can only set a single column. Okay, so we're going to limit the functionality of set item to just setting a single column. Now pandas allows you to select to set multiple columns or even set uh, subsets of your data. So we're not going to do that. It's actually fairly complex. We're only going to handle the simple case. So with that said, we'll say that um, um, if the key is not a string, so if We'll say uh, not is instance. If the key is not a string, then we're going to raise a not implemented error. And we'll say that um, setting columns is only done only with a single column. Okay, so you can maybe make a better error message there, but that'll get us started for this. So if it is not a string, we're just going to say we haven't implemented that yet. Um, and we're going to give the, the user a message for that. So we're not going to handle the cases if the user gives us a list or an integer or anything like that. We're simply going to force our users to give us a string. Okay. Now let's move on to the value. Let's check. Let's do some checking for the value. So if the value is a NumPy array, uh, we're going to raise a value error if it is not one-dimensional. Okay, so now let's look at the value. So we're going to uh, force the value here to be a num well, not necessarily a, one uh, a NumPy array, but if it's not a one-dimensional NumPy array, we will uh, raise a value error. So if let's just say if it is if value is a NumPy array, so the underlying data type is ND array, then we will check if the number of dimensions is not one. So ndim is an attribute that returns the number of dimensions of your NumPy array. So it better be one dimensional NumPy array. Then we'll raise a value error over here. I think I just uh, ran a command I didn't mean to. All right, so we're going to raise a value error and say the NumPy array must be one dimensional. Okay, that handles that. And I'm hopping all over the place here. All right, so the next thing is raise a different value error if the length is different than the calling data frame. So if we, if we are setting a new column, then the new column length better be the same exact length as all the other columns. So let's go ahead and do that now. If the length of the value if it does not equal the length of the current data frame, which is simply length of self, so if that new column that you're setting, that new NumPy array, is not the length of the self, then we will raise a value error. Uh, length of, say, length of setting array must match uh, length of data frame. Okay. So we'll have that error message for that. Okay, continuing. So if uh, if we do have a NumPy array, it has to do these two checks. 
Now let's keep going. So if uh, if value is a data frame, let's do LF. So if value is, if we, we're gonna allow our users to give us the data frame. So if value is a data frame. Then we're gonna uh, enforce that this data frame is a single column. So we're right here. So if value is a data frame, we're gonna raise a value error if it is not a single column. So we'll use the shape parameter here. So if this does not equal one, then we'll raise a value error and say that, uh, we'll say that the setting data frame must be one column. Okay, great. Now it says raise a different value error if the length is different than the column data frame. So this is the same thing as what we just did above. So if the length of value, so uh, does not equal the length of self, then we have another problem. We're gonna raise another value error and say, setting data frame must be the same length. Okay, good. And now, so if it passes those two tests, then we will actually just reassign value to be the underlying NumPy array of that column. So let's go ahead and get that, let's reassign value to be that NumPy array. So what we did here, we're gonna do the same thing as we've done in the past. We're gonna do create an iterator of the, the next one. So the, the underlying values are stored in the data parameter and we'll call the values method on this underlying dictionary to get uh, those values. Okay, so value equals the next one. Okay, that looks good. All right, now, uh, so we've handled the case if value is a NumPy array and the case if it is a data frame. Here's a case where if the value is a single integer float or Boolean or any single value, okay? So if someone does this, what we're gonna do, so if you make an assignment like this, we're gonna make all the values just this single uh, number or string or float or Boolean. So if you give a scalar value, so this is called a scalar value, so this is not a list or NumPy array, it's just a single scalar value. So if you give it an integer, string, float, or Boolean, we will repeat this for every single value in the, uh, for every single row that you have. So, uh, let's handle this case. So if we have, if value is a integer, a Boolean, a string, or a float, then we will repeat this. So what we're gonna do here is, we're gonna say, we're gonna reassign value, and we will repeat, np.repeat. So if we look at the documentation, it says, um, here's the array that we'd like to repeat. And you can actually make this equal to just a single value, so it's fine. And then the number of repeats. So this needs to be an integer. So we're going to repeat value. And we're going to repeat it, uh, the, the how long our current data frame is. So it's length of self. So this is going to return a one-dimensional NumPy array of our scalar value repeated that many times. Okay, good. So if it's not one of these, then... Uh, so if value is not one of these, and maybe we should put a space there to separate the keys from the value logic, then we will raise a type error, and we can say that um, setting object must be array, data frame, int, bool, string, or float. Okay. Okay, good. So now value is guaranteed to be a NumPy array. So each one of these cases will make sure that it is a NumPy array. So if it is a NumPy array, it'll just stay a NumPy array. If it's a data frame, then we're gonna get the underlying NumPy array. If it is an integer, Boolean, string, or float, then we're gonna repeat that value and create a NumPy array out of that. Okay, so it says, after completing the above, value will be a one-dimensional array. Uh, okay, one last thing. If it's data type kind is U, so we need to do the, we need to actually change uh, any data types that have U into object. So let's go ahead and do that here. So if, 
value.dtype.kind equal equals u. So if it's a unicode array, we will reassign this to object like we did in the constructor. Okay, so that'll handle the case that we have strings. So if we have a string, a new column that's, that's strings, we will take care of it and make sure it's object so that it is more flexible. Okay, so finally, we're just going to make uh, one more assignment. And that's, well, we have to overwrite the data or, or write in a new data. So what we're going to do is we will take whatever the key is. So hopefully this is going to be a valid column name. It must be a string. And we're just going to assign it the new data, which is just value. So all that work now, we can just make this assignment directly. So key is going to be the string and value is going to be a NumPy array. And this should either reassign an, uh, reassign an old column or add a new column to the data frame. Let's go ahead and do as we've done before and check how this works in a Jupyter notebook. So let's look at DF again. So let's go ahead and make a new assignment here. So let's just make a new column. We'll just say, um, new. we'll just call it new column and we'll say np.array so we'll just go ahead and give it uh, some values 199.98 make sure that it is the same length so it's three so that actually completed and when we look at df all right it looks like we have a new column let's make another new column say new call two and lazy so let's just give it a string and see if this works okay good so they're all the same three strings so it's been repeated let's overwrite a column so let's say df of state equals let's just make it all five so let's look at this and so now we've overridden state with all five so everything is looking good uh, when we manually test in the notebook let's go back over here and test this so we're going to run the test new column uh, test, test new column, and see if this works. And good. Okay, we passed. All right. So we passed the test. Excellent. So that completes step 20, which is either uh, assigning a new column or overriding an old column with the set item special method. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 21 head and tail methods. So these methods head and tail are going to return either the uh, the first n or last n rows of the data frame where n is uh, defaulted to the integer 5. So these are actually quite simple methods that won't take much work. And these are the same exact names that uh, Pandas uses uh, to do the exact same task. So let's go ahead and complete the head method, which will simply just return, uh, yes, the first and last, or the, sorry, the first n rows. So all we're going to do here is uh, we've already used, we already have implemented the get item uh, special method. So uh, we're going to take advantage of this and use our brackets here. So uh, to select just the rows, we will do uh, use slice notation here. So uh, for the rows and the columns. So this is something we, we just worked hard on in uh, some of the previous steps. So we're going to use this to our advantage. And we're just going to return uh, this is going to this is row selection comma column selection. So the columns we're not going to do any selection with the head method. We're just going to keep all of the columns. The rows we're going to slice when you slice notation to select the very first n rows. So let's go ahead and check this out in the Jupyter notebook. So I went ahead and um, you can just go ahead and, and restart this and run all of them. It's been a while just to kind of clear out some of the old data. So df uh, pandas uh, df is pandas cub again. So if we do dot head, 
well, that's going to give us the top five rows. Well, there's not actually um, even five rows. So we can't even tell if this works uh, properly. Um, so if we put a two in there, that's going to return the first two rows. If you put a one in there, it's going to return the first, just the first row. So that looks good. So we use slice notation here. Now for tail, let's go ahead and do the same thing, but we would like to get the last n rows. So instead of doing colon n, we'll do from negative n to the end. So we'll just reverse you know, n. So if it's five, it'll say from negative five to the end. So that is valid slice notation. And then again, we'll just select all of the, all of the columns that go along with it. So if we go here and manually test this out, if we want the very last row, that should get this one right here. If we want the very the last two rows, then that'll work as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the test for this. It's uh, called test head tail. And it's still in the test selection since this is still selecting data. And test head tail. Uh, works. We have passed it and have completed step 21. All right, fantastic. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 22, Generic Aggregation Methods. Okay, so we've finally done all of our subset selection. We've done setting new columns and now we're going to implement uh, about 10 methods all at the same exact time. So we're finally give our data frame power to do basic statistical aggregation. So yes, this step is called generic aggregation methods. So by the end of this step, our data frame will be able to compute the min, max, mean, median, sum, var, standard deviation, all any arg max and arg min for every column. So these will only work column wise. These are all what I call aggregation methods. So technically an aggregation method returns a single value um, when it's given a sequence of values. So in this case, our sequence of values are each column that um, we will call this on. So for instance, if we use the min method, if we say df.min for instance, this will return a, uh, a single value for every single column. So all of these methods, so, so whenever we call any of these methods, they're going to return uh, just one row for our data frames. So all of these, um, when we call them, will return a single row. Now, each individual method is actually already implemented. So if we take a look here, uh, min, min, mean, median, and so forth, um, you can see that they all have return statements. You will not be editing any of these. Okay, these are already done. You will notice that they there is a call to the private ag method, and to and what is uh, sent to the ag method is the numpy function. So we're actually sending it a function, and it will have the exact same name, I believe, for all of these. As the actual method name. So the underlying function or the underlying method that you will that we will um, that we will edit is this underscore ag method. So we're gonna this is basically greatly simplifying our lives. So all of these of uh, you know all of these methods, all of these aggregation methods essentially work the exact same way. They return a single value uh, for each column. So, um, so that's exactly what we're going to uh, what we're going to do here is, is just use, use instead of doing instead of uh, doing implementing each one by themselves, we're going to implement just one generic method that's able to handle all of them. Okay, so let's see uh, how this works. Um, so basically, what we're going to want to do is we're going to iterate through each column of the data frame and then pass the underlying array to this aggregation function, so this numpy aggregation function. 
and we're going to return a new data frame with the same number of columns but with just a single row. So the columns won't change, but every column will be aggregated into a single row. Now, not all aggregation columns work for strings. So for instance, if you try to take the mean of a string or the median of a string, it's not going to work. So whenever that happens, a NumPy will raise a type error. So instead of having our program error out for the columns that it cannot aggregate, we are simply going to not return those columns. So the string columns won't be returned whenever we call like something like mean or median on them. So we are going to accept a type error and basically just do not do anything uh, when we get when we get an error uh, when we get an error of, uh, during the aggregation. Okay, so let's go ahead and implement this. So they're all going to look uh, the exact same. So this is the generic underscore ag method, and we're being given this ag func. So this ag func is a numpy function. So numpy is again going to do the hard work for us. So let's go ahead and iterate we'll just uh, through our data for call comma value and self that underscore data again that's where our data is held so let's go ahead and create a new data dictionary and let's add to our dictionary let's try to do let's uh, this ag func so ag func we will pass it value so ag func is the aggregation function the numpy array okay great now the only problem here is that it will return a single value. So we need to actually force it to be a NumPy array for it to work with our data frame constructor. So what we're going to do here is just force it to be an array and we're going to put it in a one element list. So this will uh, take care of that for us. So it's a little bit, um, a little bit convoluted here that we have to force it into a list and then again force it into a NumPy array but that's how it's going to work. Now, this function will fail whenever uh, f for strings, uh, for, for some string method, for some string columns, it will not work for, for particular methods. So what we're going to do is, this is the first time we're going to accept an error. So you have to know a little bit of NumPy and know that whenever uh, you do an aggregation method on a column that uh, doesn't work, it's going to it's going to raise a type error so let's accept this exact error and if there's a type error then you know what we're actually just not going to do anything we're just going to continue on with our program and instead we're just going to return a data frame of new data so we'll just say we'll pass we will not do anything we're not going to add to our dictionary we'll simply just move on to the next iteration of the loop so we're going to try this if it does work, that's great. If not, we're just going to do nothing. We're going to assume that the uh, the column is just, it's not able to be processed. So we're just going to uh, move on to the next column and just not return that, uh, that particular column into our, our return data frame. All right, so let's go ahead and test this out manually in the notebook. So we have DF, here it is. So if we take, if we just want to sum all the columns, well, it looks like this works. So sum actually is a method that works with strings. So it looks kind of bizarre. So every column has been summed up. So you can see here what sum does for strings is simply concatenates all the strings. For height, it's a float. It simply adds all them up. School is a, uh, a Boolean. So Booleans are evaluated as zero or one. So there's two true values there. And then integers are simply added up as well. So let's try an operation where there is no string uh, ability to do that. So if we take the mean of every column, then only the numeric columns, and uh, it actually also works for Booleans, um, since they're treated as numeric, they will work as well. So that works, and the two string columns, name and state, are dropped out of the final data frame. So that looks good. Let's go back over here, and um, all the... Uh, uh, there is one test for every single uh, method, uh, but instead we'll just run all the aggregation tests at once. 
So instead of running individual tests, we're just going to run this test uh, aggregation class. And hopefully that will work. So there was 11 tests, as you can see here, and all 11 have passed. So that completes uh, step 22, these generic aggregation functions or aggregation methods. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 23, the isNA method. So in this step we will be completing a single method, unlike the previous step where we completed 11 methods uh, with <coughs> a call to a single method. So this is a specific just to isNA. So isNA is going to be a method that takes accepts no arguments and all it's going to do is it will return a data frame with the exact same size as the original, meaning the same number of rows and same number of columns, but it will return all Boolean values. And the way it derives its Boolean values is whether or not uh, each value in the data frame is missing or not. So uh, if it is miss if the value is missing, then it'll be true. If it is false, if it is not missing, then it will be false. So every column will be a Boolean array uh, at the end. Okay, so we're going to use NumPy again to help us out. So the isNan function of NumPy will help us determine whether or not we have missing values. Now, uh, this does not work for string columns. So when we have a string column, technically data type of object, then we are going to test it, we're going to make a comparison to the uh, none object. So we're going to assume our users are going to use none, the Python none, to as missing values for strings. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and do this. Uh, let's create a new data dictionary that is empty, that will contain our data that we pass to the constructor. And let's, again, uh, iterate through our underlying data dictionary. So we have column is the column name, value is the numpy array. So the f we actually need to test what whether or not is it an object array. So we're going to go ahead and look at the kind. If it is uppercase O, which is what it will be if it's object, then what we need to do here is we're going to make a new entry into our dictionary and we're going to say value equals equals none. So this will test whether every value is none. And that's why I use the word vectorize equality expression. So we're going to say um, wh whether each value in this numpy array is equal to none. So this will return a, an array of all Boolean values. Otherwise, so if it is not uh, object, then np.isNan will work. So we'll just say new data will now be we'll, we'll just able to will be able to directly use isNan and put that in here. So that should work uh, just like that, and we'll just return the data frame of new data. Okay, so if we look at that, um, that looks good. And let's test this out to see if this is going to work. So let's go hop on over to the test notebook. Uh, we don't have any, it doesn't look like we have any missing values over here. So we might want to create some missing values over here uh, for some missing values. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's put a none right there. And let's put a nan right here. So now we'll have nan right there. And we'll have a none over here. Okay, so let's test this out. So do df dot is na. And it looks like, okay, good. So we have a true here for a state that is none and a true here for a height when it is missing. Now, one quirk of NumPy is that there are no missing values allowed for Boolean columns, for Boolean arrays. So school can never have missing values and there are no Boolean, or sorry, no missing values for integers. So weight will not have any missing values either. 
because this is an integer column. Okay, so let's make sure we uh, pass our tests. So now we're going to use um, test in the this, this new class of tests, test other methods. So let's go back up here and type in test other methods. And let's use test is an A. That's the test we're going to do and see if we pass this. And great, so it looks like we've passed the test. So is an A uh, looks good. All right, so that completes step 23. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 24, the count method. The count method returns the number of non-missing values per column. This is an aggregation method. There's going to be one integer returned per column. So when you call this method, the number of columns will not change but the data frame return will have a single row of integers. Okay, so let's get started here. We, this method actually uh, requires the isNA method, and we're gonna take advantage that we have just implemented isNA, um, and then uh, use, use that as our data frame that we are going to be uh, calculating with. So let's just go ahead and call isNA on ourselves so on the current data frame so this will return a data frame of all true or false values uh, whether or not um, wh whether or not each value is missing and then we'll let's just go ahead and uh, create our new data dictionary as we usually do so let's iterate through the columns and the numpy arrays in DF so it's just a regular, so DF is just another data frame. We simply just created a, a data frame from our, uh, you know, the current data frame. And so value is a NumPy array of all true or false values. So if, uh, so it's a Boolean array. So when you sum a Boolean array, Booleans are evaluated as zero or one. So this would actually return the number of non-missing values, or excuse me, the number of missing values. So since I called is n a, so this would return the number of missing values. But that's not what we want. We want the number of non-missing values. So what we can do here is get the number of rows first. So we'll get the number of rows, and we'll just simply subtract. Well, uh this sum, which is the number of missing values from the total length. So that will leave us with the number of uh, non-missing values. So uh, let's go ahead and add this to our dictionary. So new data call, that's the string, that's the column name. And it will equal this. Now this will be a single integer, but we need to make it a NumPy array to follow, to, to, to match um, to match how the data const data frame constructor works, so that's all. That should uh, that should do it. So we just need to return the constructor uh, passed with this new dictionary. So let's walk through this one more time. The first step is to call is n a, turning the entire data frame into true or false values, whether or not each value is missing or not. We then initialize our data dictionary. We get the number of rows for each uh, of the current data frame. And then we're going to iterate through this uh, Boolean data frame that we created in, in the first line. And what we're going to do is simply subtract from the total length of the rows the, the number of missing values. So that we're calling the sum method on value, which is an array of Booleans. So let me sum it up we'll get the number of missing values and we subtract the length, uh, we'll get the number of non-missing values. So let's go ahead and see this work manually. And from before we have a couple of rows or a couple of columns that have missing values. So we did this right here. So here's df, df final, df pandas. So let's go ahead and do df count and 
So name has no missing values, so it has a count of three. State has one missing value, so it has a count of two. Height has one missing value, so it has a count of two. And school and weight don't have any missing values, so they have a count of three, which is just the total number of rows. So that looks good. Let's go ahead and run the test for this. So let's do test count, and we passed, which is great. So this completes step 24. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 25, the unique method. So the unique method is going to return all the unique values for each column. Specifically, it's going to return one data frame per column, and that data frame will have one column and only unique values. So if we have a five column data frame, we're going to return the unique method will return five data frames in a list. Each data frame will have one column and it will have just the unique values. So this is a little bit different than pandas. So the data frame in pandas does not have a unique method. Instead, only series have unique methods, have the unique method. And a series is simply like a, a, a one column uh, object. It is not a data frame, but it's very similar to a data frame. So there is a unique method, but it only works on a single column of data. Okay, so our, our unique method will work on entire data frames and return a list of one column data frames. So let's get started here. The first thing we can do is just create an empty list to contain our data frames. The next thing we can do is just start iterating through our data. So call value in Let's go through our data dictionary again like we normally do. So within here, we're going to create new data frames, a, a, a new data frame for every iteration. So let's get started and let's create a empty dictionary that will hold our data. Now, we are gonna rely on NumPy here. Uh, and NumPy has the unique function. So we're gonna use that to be able to uh, create um, this dictionary. So the, the so again, we're heavily relying on NumPy. So we're gonna call np.unique, and we're simply gonna pass it in the uh, one-dimensional NumPy array that's stored in our data dictionary. So this is gonna create a single element dictionary with a column, uh, with a string the same as their column name and then we'll want to go ahead and append a new data frame of this data. So we'll, we'll call our data frame constructor and we'll pass in this data frame, uh, uh, we'll pass in the, 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 this uh, dictionary that has one uh, column in it and we'll append it to this list. Now there is one other note here, it says, if there is a single column, just return the data frame. So we won't have the users get troubled by having uh, to look inside of a list if there's just a single column data frame. So we'll say, if the length of DFS equals uh, one, so if it's a one item list, we'll just return the very first item in the list, which will be a data frame. Otherwise, we will just return that list itself. Okay, so that looks good to me. Let's go ahead and test this out over here. So I changed up the data a little bit uh, to make sure that there were some columns that had uh, s some values in common. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, restart the notebook here and execute things from the top. Okay, so our data frame is a little bit different. Um, we have some unique values, say for, uh, or some some values in common, like weight only has one unique value, uh, school has only two unique values, and so forth. Name and state each only have two unique values. So let's go ahead and call the unique method and see if we uh, see if it works. So it looks like 
we have uh, five data frames that's returned in the list. Let's go ahead and assign this to some variable. So if we, uh, if we select the first item in this list, it's just a one column data frame of the unique values. So Eleni and Nico. And we can do this continuously. So we can get for the second column, state, we get just California and Texas. For height, they're all unique. Um, and then let's do it for the last one for weight. And we see that weight only has one unique value, so that is 40. Okay, one caveat here is that this will not work if there's any missing values in your string. So we're, we're not going to cover that case. So unfortunately, if there are missing values uh, in your string columns, it will not cover that. You could use a Python set instead. So the so NumPy is unique function doesn't work with uh, with uh, if you have none in your object columns. So we're, we're just not going to deal with that. Uh, and instead, just uh, just leave it as it is. Keep it simple. So you can take care of that case if you would like to. Let's go ahead and run this test unique and see if we pass. And all right, good, we passed. So um, looks like we can move on to the next step and that completes step 25. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project, build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 26, the nUnique method. So nUnique stands for number of unique. So this method will return the number of unique values for each column. That means it will return a, a data frame with the same number of columns as the original, but with a single row. That row will contain uh, only integers, and the integer will represent the number of unique values for that column. So this is going to be fairly similar to the unique method, which we just, um, which we just completed up above. So we're going to follow a, a fairly similar procedure, but um, all we are interested is in the length of all the, the unique values, so the number of unique values. So let's start off by creating new data as a dictionary, and then let's iterate through the column names and their uh, associated one-dimensional NumPy arrays. So let's loop through here. We're going to use items again to uh, extract the strings and, and NumPy arrays from, uh, from the dictionary. So what we're going to do here is pretty simple. We'll just say new data. We'll say column equals. What we want is just the length. And we're going to use unique here of the value. And that's pretty much what we want. So we want the length of the unique values. Now we have to ensure that this is a NumPy array. So we are going to go ahead and wrap this around uh, and make it a list with this uh, with these brackets right here, and then Put it into the np.array function. Um, okay, so that looks like that should work, and then we just need to simply return a, our data frame constructor and pass in this new data dictionary. So let's go ahead and see if this is going to work. Um, let's go ahead and look at it in the Jupyter notebook. And go ahead and restart the kernel just uh, because I tested this out on my own, but. Let's just do it right here again. I'm going to just run through here. Okay, so we have our data frame, We've got five columns, and the data, some of the columns have repeated values. So let's go ahead and see, it's called not unique, but n unique. And if I can get the syntax right, you'll see that, okay, so name has two unique values, state also has two unique values, height has, they're all unique, so there's three, school has two, and weight just has a single unique value. So everything looks good there. Let's go ahead and run the test, test n unique, and we pass. So that looks good. So this is a, a fairly simple method and we just iterate through every column, we run unique on it, 
we find the length of that, we turn it into array, and then we just return uh, the new data frame. Okay, so that completes step 26. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project, Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 27, the value counts method. So the value counts method, its primary purpose is to simply uh, look at one column of data and count the number of times each value appears in that particular column. So if you have, say, a column and there's 100 values in it, say 10 of them are unique, it will return just those 10 values and their associated counts, meaning the number of times that they occurred in that particular column. So our value counts method will, will act on every single column and will return one data frame for every single column. And it'll return the results as a list. So if you have five columns, it's going to return a list of five data frames. The only time it's not going to return a data frame is if there is one column and then it'll, uh, or sorry, the only time it will not return a list is if there is one column and then it will return just a single data frame. So each data frame that it returns will consist of two columns. The first column will have the same name as the original and it will have just the unique values. The second column will be titled count and it will hold the frequency of each of these uh, values. So that's what we're after is a, a, a data frame with the first column of the unique values and the second column uh, holding the uh, counts or the otherwise known as the frequency. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, go ahead and do this. So we're going to start off by creating an empty list to hold our data frames. And then we're going to iterate through our data, which is always stored in, or it's continually stored in the underscore data dictionary. So very interestingly, we're going to, so we're going to use the numpy unique function here. And this doesn't intuitively, uh, you would think, would have this ability, but it does. So it actually has this other parameter called um, return counts and it's a little difficult to see because it's all jumped up uh, jumbled up here but if it is true by default it is false then it's also going to return the number of times each unique item appears so it actually returns two arrays as a tuple if you set return counts to, to true so the first uh, the first argument will be just the array that you want to get the unique values but then we're going to set unique counts as true, and this will return a tuple of the unique values. So we'll just call it uh, uniques, and then we'll say counts like this. So we're going to unpack this tuple into two separate variables, uniques and counts. So that's, uh, that's the bulk of the work is actually done by this unique function. The only thing that we want to do here is that it says return the data frame uh, with counts sorted from greatest to least. So we could sort counts independently, but we also need to sort uniques um, along with it. So to do this, we're going to rely on NumPy again, and we're going to use the arg sort function. So the arg sort function returns the order. Of, uh, uh, of the data from lowest to highest. So it returns integers um, as the uh, order. So if there's 10 values in count, the counts array, it will return uh, numbers between 0 and 9, giving us their order. So um, the very first integer will simply re uh, correspond to the very lowest item uh, in that array. So it might be a good idea to see how this works in the notebook and I already have an array here that I like to look at so let's say we have defined this array a it's just some values 10 to uh, 10 5 23 2 99 so if we do arg sort and 
we go ahead and run arg sort on our array, we will get back the order from least to greatest. So just to see how this works is that, so this first entry is four, which just means the, uh, the element with index four is the smallest. So if we count there, zero, one, two, three, four, we'll see that uh, indeed two is the smallest element. And it just builds from there, goes from least to greatest. We can verify that five, which is the very last item in the array, 99, um, corresponds to the largest item. So let's go ahead and uh, assign this array to just some other variable like b. And if we pass b into the brackets, it will select items in that order. So it will select the items in that order and it correctly sorts it. Okay, great. So uh, that works, and the reason we need arg sort is because we need to use this um, this order not only to sort the counts, but to sort the uh, you know the first column, which are just the unique values. So let's go ahead and get uh, a variable called order, and we'll say arg sort, and we'll pass in counts over here. Now, by default, it ret it will sort from least to greatest. So one way to sort from greatest to least is to actually make this a negative value. So that will sort it from greatest to least if we turn all of them negative and we can verify this over here. If we put in a negative value, you can see that we go, uh, we have sorted it now from greatest to least by putting that negative sign. So this just simply multiplies all the values by negative one. All right, so that's how we get the order. And then we're just going to simply reassign uniques and counts uh, by with that uh, new order array. So let's go ahead and do this reassignment. We're going to uh, sort it. So that looks good. Now we need to create a data frame out of this. So we want to create a new call, a new data frame. So we're going to uh, put in the dictionary here. Uh, if you want, you can go ahead and do new data as a dictionary, and we can create a separate variable. So the very first column, we'll just, we'll, we will keep the same column name, and we will map it to uniques, which is just a, a one-dimensional array of the unique values. And the second column will be called count, and we will put the counts value over here. So if we pass this new data dictionary into the constructor, we will have successfully uh, completed or created an array or created a data frame out of this. Let's go ahead and just append this to our list and that pretty much does it. So the only thing we need is left to do is check and see if the length of DFS, the list, is one. If it is, we'll just return the very first one. If it's not, we will just, uh, we don't actually even need an else statement here. We'll just say so sorry, we need a return statement. We'll just say return DFS. So that looks good. And we need to verify that this works. So let's go ahead and run our new, uh, our new test, which is actually in the test grouping class. So this is not a new, uh, a new testing class for value counts. And the test is called test value counts. And we can see that it indeed it did pass. Good. So that completes step 27, value counts. All right, fantastic. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 28, normalize value counts. So we're going to remain in the value counts method for this step. And you can see that there's a single parameter that we that we are going to allow our users to pass to the value counts method, and that is normalize, it is defaulted to false. So what we implemented in the last step is the default uh, choice, which is to simply return the raw counts. Now, instead of returning the raw counts, in this step we will return the what's called the relative frequency, or just the percentage of the values um, that are in that column. So not the raw counts, but the uh, relative frequency. So if you sum up all of the relative frequencies, it will add up to one. 
Okay, so we only need to change one small thing in this uh, particular, uh, for this particular step. So, and that is counts. So we don't have to change the order. The order is not going to change, but the actual values of counts will change. So if the user has given us normalize, what we will do is we will reassign counts. We'll simply uh, divide all of the counts by the total. So uh, that should do it. And in fact, you could probably, um, you know, you should be able to just do length of uh, DF. So that will do it as well. So if we just take the, the length of the data frame itself, um, that would do it since all the counts should sum up to the uh, length. Either one um, will work. So let's go ahead and run this test. Test value counts normalize. So test value counts uh, normalize. <clears throat> And, oh, not length of DF, but length of uh, self, okay? So DF, DF is, would not be correct anyways, the info is defined. We're looking for the length of the original data frame. So it looks like, uh, all right, good, so that passed. Let's take a quick look at how this um, functions in the Jupyter Notebook. So here we have our data, DF. So if we run uh, value counts on it, we will get back a list of data frames. And if we want to look at, say, the first one, we can do that. So that's for the name column. We have two Nikos and one Eleni. So that's how that operates. If we want to look at, uh, let's say, weight, for instance, we can look at the very last one in our list. So there's only one value of weight. Now, um, that's with normalize equals false, but if we say normalize equals true, this should return us the relative frequency. So here we have two thirds are Nico and one third is Eleni. And for weight, well, this is simply just 100% of a weight of 40. Okay, so we already passed the test, and so that completes step 28. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project to build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 29, the rename method. So the rename method will allow us to rename the columns of the data frame. So it's pretty simple. It's going to accept a single parameter. This parameter will be a dictionary mapping an old column name to a new column name. So both the key and the value will be a string. So let's go ahead and begin this. Now, uh, there's one uh, uh, check here. So we're going to force our users to give us a, a dictionary. So we'll raise a type error if columns is not a dictionary. So if columns is not a dictionary, then we'll raise a type error. So if not columns is a dict, so columns is the name of the parameter, we will simply raise a type error and just say uh, Columns uh, must be a dictionary. Okay, good. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to actually return an entire new data frame with the columns uh, renamed. So uh, we're not going to assign anything in place. So this will actually, it will return a new data frame, as we can see here. So let's go ahead and create that new data dictionary that we typically do. And we're just going to go ahead and iterate through every column and value pair in our data. And so the values are not changing. So this is not going to change. But we are going to update the new column name. So columns is a dictionary. So now what we're going to do is use the get method of a dictionary. So the get method allows us to attempt to get a particular column. So we'll try to retrieve the new column name from the dictionary that the user gave us. So columns is the dictionary that the user gave us. Now the user doesn't have to give us uh, new names for every column. We could just have one column name at a minimum. So we're going to try to get uh, the new column name. 
and if that column does not appear, it will just keep that same column. So this will just be the new column. So we'll just say a uh, new call, we can just say that. And then we'll just add this uh, to our new uh, data. So we'll say new call, and we'll say equal value. So this, uh, this will, this should uh, exchange the old column name for the new column name, which is inside of columns. And that should work. So let's go ahead and return the data frame, call to the data frame constructor. And we can go ahead and test this out. Now, this test, test rename, is in the test other methods class. So this will, um, we'll have to go back here and go into the test other methods and do test rename and see if this works. So everything looks good. We passed it there. Let's go ahead and check it out in the Jupyter Notebook to see how it looks live. So here's our data frame. So to rename, so we're going to go ahead and call the rename method. And let's just say we want to rename uh, the column name. Let's just make it all caps. And maybe we want to uh, change, uh, I don't know, school to uh, university or something. So we can see this. So it looks like that's worked. So name has been renamed to all caps name and school was renamed to university. So that looks good in the notebook. So you give it a dictionary and it simply goes through and replaces those particular column names with the new name. All right, that completes step 29. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 30, the drop method. So the drop method will accept a single parameter, columns, and this, uh, this parameter will be either a string or a list of strings, and it will contain all the columns that we will drop from our data frame. So the end result will be a data frame without the columns that are passed to the drop method. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin over here. So the first thing is, is um, if, if columns is a string, we're going to go ahead and turn it into a list. So this will be make it easier to process. So if columns is a string, then we'll reassign columns as a one item list of itself. So if it is not a list, then we'll just raise a type error, and that's what it says. Raise a type error if it's a string, uh, if it's not a string or a list. Okay, so if it is not a list, then we will simply raise a type error and say um, columns must be either a string or a list, either a string or a list. All right, great. So now we're guaranteed to have a list. Um, we're not going to uh, verify whether everything with inside the string or with inside the list is actually a, a string. Um, so, what we what we will do is we're going to create some new data, a new data dictionary, and we're going to iterate through all the all the data as we normally do. So dot items here. So, if call is uh, so if it's in the list we won't do anything so we'll say you know if it's not if not call in column so what this is going to do is it's going to check whether column is in the column column so if it's not in there then we will keep it in our data frame so we will make a new entry into our uh, dictionary and we'll simply do this so this is um, this is actually uh, you know checking whether or not it's in the the columns that the user has given up. If it is not in there, then we will make a new entry to our dictionary. So we'll only return those columns that are that are not in that uh, not in the list that the user has provided. So we should be able to return 
our data frame constructor with this new data dictionary. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. So this is in the other methods. So it's called test drop and it passed. Okay, good. So let's just see this in action over here. So if we have df over here, and let's say we want to drop, uh, I don't know, the state column. Okay, good, that worked. And let's say we want to drop, now let's use a, a list of strings. So say state and, uh, I don't know, wait. And that looks like it has done it correctly. All right, so we verified in the notebook. We formally tested it with PyTest with our unit test, so it looks like everything is good for step 30. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 31, non-aggregation methods. So we're at this portion. I have a comment here. It says non-aggregation methods. In a step above, we completed uh, a bunch of methods that that were aggregation methods. So just a little recap on that. An aggregation method is simply a method that returns a single value for every single column. So min, median, max, sum, these are all aggregation methods. They all returned a single value for every column and the end result was a data frame that had one row and um, you know, just the kept the original columns for those that it could actually uh, do the aggregation on. So these non-aggregation methods are simply uh, are essentially the opposite of the aggregation methods. These are a group of methods that will all work the same. They will all preserve the shape of the data frame. So there's no aggregating going on. So for instance, when you take the absolute value of you know a column, all the value your Every single value is going to remain in its place. Um, the only thing that's happening is that the absolute value of that particular value will be returned. So all of these, come min stands for cumulative minimum, come max, cumulative maximum, and they're all, they're all listed over here, come sum, clip, round, and copy. So these all work, so they all have a similar functionality in that they will just sort of transform the data, uh, but they won't aggregate. So the shape of the data frame will remain the same for all of these methods. So if your data frame has a shape of 100 rows by 10 columns, the final result will also have 100 rows and 10 columns. So if you notice for all these methods, they are all implemented very similarly. There's a single line of code, and that is a call to the non-ag method. And with inside the non-ag method, each one of them passes a numpy function. And that is the numpy function that um, the underlying non-ag method will use. So let's just take a look down here. They're all calling non-ag. They're all returning the result from non-ag. So it is this method non-ag that we are going to edit in order to complete this step. Okay, so as you can see here, non-ag takes two parameters actually. So it will take the function name, but it's also gonna take this other very strange looking parameter, has two stars in front of it, and it's, and it's kw args. So there's two, uh, so this is useful whenever there's other parameters that you wanna pass to a function or a method. So we do have two methods here that will pass additional keyword arguments. So the clip method uh, is going to pass two additional arguments, a min and a max. So this determines, you know, um, how to clip the, uh, the numerical column. Uh, round is going to pass one parameter, decimals. So uh, this is a Python way of giving, Python gives you some flexibility when, when calling uh, other methods in that you can pass any number of extra arguments, or in this case, keyword arguments, um, like this. So these two stars denote that all the keyword extra keyword arguments that you pass to this non-ag method will be stored in this uh, kwargs variable as a dictionary. So whenever we're making this call, 
um, actually a dictionary will be created and it will be assigned to this KWR. So the dictionary will have a min as a key and it will map it to a lower, uh, whatever value that is, and a max uh, will be mapped to upper. So uh, this is just Python's way of providing uh, developers a way to, to pass around extra arguments, uh, extra keyword arguments to methods or functions. Now, if there was just a single star preceding here instead of two stars, then this then you would uh, then it would collect the extra arguments as a tuple um, and not as uh, and not as a dictionary. So you wouldn't be able to give it um, keyword arguments here. You'd only be able to give it say just value comma separated values, and those would all be collected uh, as a tuple. Okay. So regardless, we are going to use this to pass these extra keyword arguments to the underlying NumPy function. Okay, so let's go ahead and complete this method. So we'll begin, as we usually do, by creating a dictionary, a new data dictionary, and then we'll just iterate through our underlying uh, data dictionary. Now, one thing I have not mentioned yet is that all of these methods, besides copy, only work on numeric columns. Or I guess you could make a case that, that some of them, like come in, could work on a string column. But we're for, for our purposes, we are not going to allow them. We're not going to uh, worry about them um, working on a string column. So we're going to write an if statement here to handle this case. So if the data type kind is uppercase O, which stands for object. So if we have a string column, we will just not process this. Okay, so we will not process this. And we'll do one thing here, and we'll actually technically just make a copy of the of the underlying array, so it won't be equal to the exact array. And we honestly probably should have been doing that uh, in some other steps, is copying the data so that we have entirely new um, data uh, for, for different data frames. But uh, anyways, this also allows us to uh, make this copy method work um, as well. So this is the copy method. Actually, you know, um, it does work with strings. The other ones don't really work with strings. So this will sort of uh, allow us to cheat a little bit and, and have it work uh, with the copy method. Now, otherwise, so if we don't have a string column, well then we're gonna just we're gonna do a calculation. So we will go ahead and take that function name, whatever we gave it. Now the first value to these functions will be the underlying array. So we're going to give it the underlying array and then we are going to pass it this dictionary, this underlying keyword uh, uh, argument dictionary. Um, and these two stars will allow us to pass a dictionary such that each element in the dictionary will be read in as, you know, uh, one parameter equal to some value. So this sort of unpacks the dictionary for us within a uh, function call. So let's just take this for instance, um, let's say we call the round method. So our non-ag method gets past this np.round function. This np.round function becomes a func name. So this is now equivalent to np.round. Value is simply the underlying data, the underlying NumPy array. And then kwargs here will simply be um, a dictionary containing this uh, decimals mapped to whatever n that the user provided. So, um, and that will be unpacked within this function call. So it'll be exactly like calling np.round on this NumPy array with decimals equal to n. So the last thing we need to do is return our data frame and we'll just give it new data. So that's, that's, all, that's all we have to do here. So just implementing this one single method allows us to complete all these other methods at once. So they all follow the same pattern. So we're taking advantage that they all follow the same pattern and um, you know this one for loop will should work for us. Let's go ahead and uh, test this. And what is the test name? 
called, uh, oh, so they're all in the test non-ag class. So this is a totally new class. So test non-ag. And let's see if all of these uh, work. Um, so they don't. Okay, let's see here. Which one did it fail? Ah, okay. Okay, so I see what happened. So there's actually, we can't just run all the tests at once. So, and that's because there's a couple other, uh, there's a couple other methods that rely on this non-ag method. So we need to test them individually. So it's a little bit of a pain here. So, but if we go in here, they should all have the same name. So let me, uh, they should all have the same name. So if I'm gonna go back down here, let me clear this up. So they'll be called like test, um, test abs, for instance. Let's just test them one at a time, so that looks good. Tests come in. Okay, that looks good. Come max. That looks good. Come sum. Uh, and then we can test clip. That has passed. And test round. And then test copy. All right, so it passed all those tests. So there's a few more tests in the uh, non-ag one um, that will get run, and that's for the, the upcoming steps, which is why it, it failed in the beginning. Let's take a quick look in our notebook to see how this looks. So we have df. So if we do uh, df dot, let's say, come min. Um, so this will not work for any string columns. It will work for Boolean. So Booleans, you know, are treated as, um, you know, zero or one. Oh, uh, so come in. Uh, it does not work if you. Uh, it stops working after you have a nan. So, um, so it just will fill out nans the rest of the way. Uh, and for weight, well, you know, they're all forty. So that is actually the come min, the cumulative min. If we do come sum. Well, you know, uh, name and state will be ignored. But uh, height, uh, once it hits a nan, it will uh, stop uh, accumulating. Uh, school, you know, zero, one, that works. And weight gets accumulated. So that looks good. So, um, so the tests, uh, we manually tested our data frame and it appears to work. And we formally tested it with PyTest and passed all those tests. So step 31 is now complete. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 32, the diff method. So the diff method subtracts the current value in a particular column from the nth value above it. So by default, uh, n is going to be equal to 1. So whatever the current value is, uh, it'll just look right above it, and it'll subtract that and report that as the difference. It will return a data frame with the same number of rows and columns as the original. So this is actually a good one to see before we embark on it, since it's a little bit uh, hard to explain. Let's go ahead and go into the Jupyter Notebook. I've created a new data frame that's similar to the one that we have been using for the entire project, but it has one more row, and I got rid of one of the string columns, and I got rid of all the missing values. So um, here it is. So I'm going to call the diff method on this one, uh, not df pandas, df final, called diff. By default, n equals 1. I will go ahead and put that in there just so we can see that indeed n equals 1. And I'm going to run this. So what happens here is that, uh, say, let's take the height column for instance. It's going to go through one. Uh, it's going to go through every, you know, value at a time, and it's going to subtract whatever the value is above it, and it will return that as the value for the new, uh, uh, for the new column. So for instance, uh, you know, 3.6 has no value above it. 
which is why there's missing values for the first uh, for the first row right here. 8.5 uh, does have a value above it, so 8.5 minus 3.6 is 4.9, and then 5.2 minus 8.5 is negative 3.3, and so forth. So booleans are treated as zero or one. You know, weight is a little bit going to be a little bit easier to calculate um, since there's just whole numbers over here. So 50 minus 40 is 10. 45 minus 50 is negative 5. And 100 minus 45 is 55. So all of the columns will be turned into float columns, as you can see, and that's because of these NANs. And there is no uh, NAN or you know missing value representation. For, um, for integers or for Boolean. So we have to convert them to floats. So let's take a look at what happens when we say n equals 2. So when n equals 2, the first two rows will be filled with NANDs because they are, we're going to make a, we're going to have to hop back up two, uh, two rows in order to make the subtraction. So here, 5.2 is the first uh, value in height where NAND can be, or, or where the diff can be computed. So 5.2 minus 3.6 is 1.6, 10 minus 8.5 is 1.5, and so forth. So that's how the diff method works. So let's go ahead and fill this out. So what we're going to do here, there's actually a function uh, defined in here. So this is the function uh, that we're going to pass to the non-ag method that we completed before. So um, we're going to use, uh, you know, diff is a non-aggregating function, um, a non-aggregating method, but NumPy does not have a, there's no diff uh, function in NumPy, which is why we're going to create our own and then we're going to simply pass that function into non-ag. Okay, so um, this will take, let's say, uh, some variable called values, which will just be a single column, or we've been using value. I think in my solutions I use values, but um, either one is fine. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is actually we're going to convert this to a float. So if it's a Boolean, we're going to convert it to a float. Um, if it's an integer, we're going to convert it to a float. So we're just going to force this to be a float, um, a, uh, a float column or float array. That's the first thing we're going to do. So we're just going to reassign it as a float, and that's because of those NANDs. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to shift. Uh, we're going to shift this array using the roll function of NumPy. So I'm going to call this value shifted, and I'm going to go ahead and roll this function. I use the roll function, so this will uh, do kind of what it sounds like it's doing. It just shifts uh, an array, um, and you give it the number of the shift over here. So let's go ahead and do uh, value comma. We're going to shift this over n, so whatever n it is, is going to roll that, and then we'll just uh, you know perform a subtraction here. We'll say value minus value shifted. And that should work. Now, when you roll this function, so the roll function in NumPy, and it's probably good to just see what happens here. So let's go back to the Jupyter Notebook. And let's go ahead and roll like the weight array so you can see this happen. When you roll this, so we'll just roll it one, what happens is, is the very last item actually moves to the front. Um, and uh, the others get, just get shifted down one, you know. So if you roll it two times, then the last two values now become the first two values. You can also shift by a negative number. You can shift this way, so the first value goes to the end, and the other ones get shifted to the left. So um, we will go ahead and just reassign this to value. So this is what we want to return, but it's not quite right because this will not have any NANDs in it. So we're going to have to replace the first uh, few values, or the first N values with NAN. So we could do something like this value, we could say the first 
n values will be np dot nan. So we're going to make it equal to we're going to make them nans. But uh, we are going to allow n to be negative. So this will work if n is uh, you know greater than or equal to zero. We'll say um, if it's less than zero, then we will have to go from so if n is negative, so like negative two, then we'll go from the end uh, all the way, or the, from n to the end, and we'll make that equal to np dot nan. So there's different logic based on whether n is positive or negative. Which one will be? Um, which one? Are we, which values are we going to force to be nan? Okay, so I think uh, that looks like it works. And then we will just return, in this case, just the value, which is that array. So again, this is a, uh, an internal function underneath the diff method. So this is going to uh, sort of be written in place of a NumPy function. So we don't have, NumPy does not have a diff method for us. So we're, we're sort of creating our own. And then we're going to pass it here. So, um, you know, uh, n is in here it's also over here so uh, the scope of Python allows us to do this so once we define func uh, n will get transformed to whatever variable our user gives us so we don't actually have to uh, pass it along here uh, as n it will uh, already be uh, carried with it uh, correctly um, so this looks like it should work let's go ahead and test it out in the notebook so df and not df final. So this is what we just implemented. So if we do df dot diff, it looks like that looks good to me. We could do it uh, with two. So I think that looks good. All right. So we wrote like an internal function, and then we uh, we are. Um, I'm going to make a call to the non-ag, which we did in the previous step. So let's go ahead and run this. Let's say test diff, and looks like we passed. Okay, fantastic. Looks like uh, this uh, amount of code has completed step 32. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 33, the percent change method. So the percent change method is nearly identical as the diff method, which we just completed, except instead of returning the actual difference between the current value and the nth value above it, we're going to return the percentage change. So it's uh, just a, a minor oh, a, a very minor difference. One returns the absolute or the difference and the other is going to return the percentage difference. So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste the function that we just worked on above. And I'm going to make one minor adjustment here. So in diff, the diff method, we are going to return the difference between the current value and the one uh, above it by n. Instead of returning this difference, what we're going to do is return the percent difference. So we're going to divide it by that nth value above, which is the value shifted. And this should get us exactly what we want. So we're just doing one minor thing. We're simply dividing by that value uh, n rows above. So let's see how this works in the Jupyter Notebook. So here is our df and if we do percent change with n equals one we can see that well number one we get this uh, this warning blasted in our face um, and this is this is caused because it looks like it says there's a zero encountered in yeah so there's a division by zero essentially so false evaluates a zero and uh, that's not going to be good when we're doing division so any any place where you have a zero here, you, you'll get a little bit of a you'll get a warning, but um, you know we're not gonna we're not gonna handle cases like this. So we're just gonna go ahead and bypass that um, and not worry about it. What we can do is manually check, say something, say a, a jump from 40 to 50 in the weight column. 
So that's a difference of 10. So 50 minus 40 is 10. And then 10 divided by 40 is 0.25. So that looks like you know there's a 25% jump from there. So that, that checks out manually. And then you know we should obviously check uh, with PyTest. And we have the test percent change test. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. And I have passed that. So this is nearly identical to the diff method. Just uh, make one small uh, division over here to complete uh, step number 33. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 34, Arithmetic and Comparison Operators. So before we begin this, it's vital to know exactly what an arithmetic or comparison operator is. So these are quite simple. The arithmetic operators are simply um, all the common operators that are used to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So for instance, specifically, the plus sign is an arithmetic operator. The minus sign is an arithmetic operator. Uh, there's also the multiplication sign, the division sign. Um, and then you have a few more, like two multiplication signs, which stand for uh, raising to a power. Two division signs are floor division. A percent sign is the modulus operator, which returns the um, you know, remainder of, uh, of, an, uh, of a division. So those are the arithmetic operators. Uh, we also have comparison operators, such as greater than, uh, which is right here, less than, uh, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, equal to, which is two equal signs, or not equal to, which is a exclamation mark and then an equal sign. So in this step, we are going to make sure that our data frame is able to know what to do whenever someone, whenever a user uh, wants to use one of these arithmetic or comparison operators to it. So all of these examples are going to work after this step. So, um, so in order for our data frame to understand what this plus sign does or what this minus sign does, or what this greater than sign does, we have to implement its corresponding special method. So the corresponding special method for the plus sign um, is the dunder add method, which is over here. So this is what gets triggered whenever you have df, your data frame, plus some other object. This is the method that gets called. It accepts a single parameter and that's the other object that it's operating with. So whatever you're adding to the data frame is going to get passed here. So whenever we make this call df plus 5, 5 will get passed to this other uh, as this other parameter, and then the body of the function or the body of the method will get executed. So before we talk about um, the implementation on our part, what I want to do is look at all of the arithmetic and comparison special methods in the official Python documentation. So if we, I already have this open, there's a link to it in the readme. So if we look at this um, under the emulating numeric types in the data model, you'll see all of these special methods and their corresponding uh, operators over here. Um, so for instance, the add special method will be used to implement this plus sign, this you know, this addition operator, and so forth. The minus sign, uh, you use dunder sub. For the multiplication sign, you use dunder mol. For this at symbol, you use dunder mat mol. So we're, this is, uh, you know, typically done when you're implementing matrix multiplication, but we're not going to be doing a, a matrix multiplication in our data frame. Uh, you can, you certainly can. Um, but uh, we're, we're not going to uh, do it with ours. Um, it's a little bit more complex. So yeah, there's a, there's a few more true div, true div for one division sign, floor div for two division signs, and a the dunder mod method for the, this uh, percent, uh, which is the modulus operator. So there's there's several more uh, you know methods that uh, at least from L shift on down that deal with. Um, you know, bitwise manipulation, and we're not going to deal with those either. Um, 
So uh, those are that's how you can find out in the documentation what are the corresponding arithmetic uh, and comparison uh, operators are. If we look down um, a little bit further down, you'll see that we do have um, uh, uh, sorry, we do have uh, the six comparison operators and their corresponding uh, methods as well. So LT stands for less than, LE is for uh, or less than or, or equal to, you know, EQ for uh, equals equals, uh, NE for, for not equals and so forth. So the, uh, the, the documentation is very valuable here to figure out what are the exact names for the methods that you need to implement for each specific operator. Now, one other note is that you'll see that we want our data frame to work regardless whether the operator, whether the data frame is on the left-hand side or whether the data frame is on the right-hand side of the operator. So if the data frame is on the left-hand side of the operator, then the normal, you know, D Dunder method will be called. So for instance, if for, for this particular one, DF plus five, then DF uh, or Dunder add will be called. In this instance, when you have five plus DF or just any object operator then DF, so the data frame is on the right hand side, then you'll see that um, all these methods also have another a, a, a distinct method with an R preceding the actual word. So this just stands for the right, you know, whenever your object is on the right hand side because you might need to do something different whenever your object is on the right hand side. So Python provides a separate special method that has this R in front for these uh, instances. So whenever 5 plus DF gets called, what happens is this dunder R add method gets called and not the dunder add method. So when the data frame is on the right hand side, excuse me, then the R, uh, the, the methods beginning with R get called. Okay, so, um, and you can see that also in the documentation as well. So it's just right below the normal, uh, you know, Dunder add uh, methods. You can see they're right here. So they're the same methods, they just have the, the letter R preceding them. Okay, so let's go on to the implementation. So if we look over here, all of these methods are already complete. They all basically are calling the same thing. They're calling this underlying opera method. That's a private method. And they're passing it two uh, parameters. Okay, so one is a string name of the method name itself. And the other is just simply, what is the other object it's operating with? So, you know, in this case, all of these are, are five. That's the other object it's, it's operating with, the integer five. So if you, if you look down here, they're all already implemented, so you don't have to edit any of these. Instead, we're just going to edit this dunder opera method, or this, sorry, not dunder, but this underscore opera method. So implementing this one method will make all the others work. And the reason we only have one method here to, to do is because it, it just makes the, you know, it makes the work a lot easier for us. So um, instead of trying to do them all like uh, individually, we'll just do this one method since they, they all basically behave the exact same. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started here. So we will allow other, so let's think about what, what other can be. So it'll, it can be either just a sing, just some other, you know, scalar value, like five or, um, you know, float, maybe even a Boolean, or we can allow it to be a, a, a data frame. So this is what this says. So uh, now within the opera method, we're going to check if other is a data frame. So if it is a data frame, then we're going to raise an error, a value error, if it's not one column. Otherwise, we're going to uh, reassign, uh, you know, if it is one column, then we're going to assign other to that one-dimensional array of the values of its column. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So if we have a data frame, 
So if other is a data frame, then we need to check uh, whether it's shape. So if uh, other dot shape, so if it's a one column data frame, so if it's not a one column data frame, then we're going to raise a value error here. We'll just say uh, data frame must be a single column. Um, otherwise, we will now get the underlying data. So if we look, if we remember how to get that, so it's stored in data dot values. And remember we had to do something like we had to get next, make it an iterator, and this would get the very next one, which is there's only one in this case, but this is sort of the uh, a swift way of doing that as we've already discussed in previous videos. So other will simply be the underlying one-dimensional array of that data frame um, um, if someone is trying to like say add two data frames together. Okay so we're gonna force it to it's gonna have to be just a single dimension. So you got, so we're basically just gonna add one column on top of all the other columns. Alright so um, if other is not a data frame so in the instance that it's not a data frame, we will just not check what it type it is. Okay, so we're just going to uh, uh, pass this, uh, you know, this function functionality on to NumPy. So if the NumPy array can add um, whatever the other object is, then we're good. If it can't, then NumPy will throw the error. So we're not going to uh, worry about that. Okay, so now we're here. So we're going to iterate through all the columns of the data frame, you know, of, our, uh, of our original data frame, and then we're going to apply that operation to each array. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and iterate through here. So for call comma value, and we're going to iterate through that dictionary like we always do. So um, we need to apply the operation. So we were given the operation as a string. So if you look back up here, the operation, like for GT, is just a string of that. So why did I give you a string? And, uh, and, and the reason for that is we're going to use this get adder uh, function. So this is a built-in function which will get a method if you give it a string. So what we're going to do is do get adder and it says, uh, you know, it takes two parameters. The first is the object you want to get the attribute for, and the second is the um, up uh, is the attribute name as a string. So get adder is like saying, hey, get this attribute from this object, uh, and 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 what you have to give it is the op uh, is the operations name as a string, is the method name as a string. So this is a this is a way to you know, uh, find attributes and methods of an object via a string. So let's go ahead and call this, uh, we can call this func, for instance. So it's going to get that underlying method. So maybe we should call it uh, method instead. So we'll get that. Um, so that retrieves the method that we want. And then we're going to call that method um, um, with uh, the other, or yeah, with other, like this. So it's going to apply the operation on other. So, you know, it's going to get, for instance, the dunder add method, and then it will call that method on, now we're going to call that method with other. So this will be the result of the, um, the, the new result. So what we need to do here like we usually do, we forgot to do this, is create a dictionary. And, you know, this is, uh, so value is a NumPy array, op is the string, it's going to retrieve that method, and then other is, you know, it could be an integer, it could be anything, it could be another NumPy array, whatever it is, we're going to try to do that here. So we'll say new data of column equals method of other. So it's going to try to compute that operation and um, hopefully it'll work. So let's go ahead and return data frame of new data. 
Okay, so uh, this will work. Uh, this will hopefully work. Um, and if it doesn't, uh, maybe we can debug. So let's go ahead back into the notebook. And let's take a look at our last data frame that we created. Okay. So we have this uh, data frame. Now, if we try to add five here, well, um, we ha well the way we implemented this is that we're going to try to do this to every single column. So uh, it will error out here if your string your column of strings, um, let's say for instance this column of strings is unable to add five to it. So that's fine. We're, uh, this error is, is valid. Um, we're not handling the case when we have uh, a calculation that cannot occur. So um, that's fine. So what we need to do is actually get a data frame that is all numeric. So let's go ahead and use our selection properties over here. So we'll call it this DF1 will be these three columns. So df1, if we add 5 here, well, that works. So it looks like uh, we've successfully added 5. Uh, when you add 5 to a Boolean, well, it's going to just turn it into an integer. And uh, so every value in the entire data frame got added 5 to. So let's do uh, some other ones. Let's say, uh, I don't know, 4 is, uh, let's say df is greater than 3 or something. So we need df1. Okay, so yes, this is going to return us all Boolean values, so that, that looks good. All right, so everything is working out. We can uh, maybe even raise this to a power. So raise this to the second power. Uh, so everything uh, is looking like it is working. Let's go ahead and formally test this with PyTest. And this is going to be in the, it says right here, the tests are in the test operators class. And it actually runs all the tests for all the operators and it looks like they've all passed. So everything is looking good. We tested in the notebook and we tested it formally with uh, our unit test with pi test. Okay, so that completes step 34, the arithmetic and comparison operator. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 35, the sort values method. So we're going to be sorting our data frame based on one or more columns with the sort values method. So this method is going to have two parameters. Uh, number one is the column or columns that we are going to be sorting by. And the other one is whether we're going to be sorting uh, ascending or descending. So by default, we're going to sort from um, you know, lowest to highest. So ascending will be true. That's what ASC stands for, just ascending. And uh, so that's what, those are the two parameters. So let's go over here and let's first do the case. Uh, let's keep it simple just for a single column. So we're going to allow by, this column by, to be either a string or a list of column names. So we'll just, uh, um, so in the case that by is a string, uh, we're, it'll just tell us that we're going to be sorting a single column. So if by is a string, then we know that we're just sorting uh, one. So let's go ahead and sort this by this particular column. So we can get, we have to get the underlying NumPy array. So that's it. So it's in the, we can use our uh, underlying, our, our data dictionary to get the number, uh, underlying NumPy array. And then to sort by this, we're actually going to call argsort. The, we're going to pass it to the argsort function in NumPy, which returns the order. These are integers of the order. So we'll just say order equals like this. Um, and then we will, let's go ahead and return. So we have self of order. So we're actually going to use um, the brackets that we've already implemented, the, uh, you know, with the get item special method. So we're going to pass this order, which is just simply a, an array of, this is an array of integers of the correct order into here. Now, one small thing here is that 
we uh, order is going to be a NumPy array, so we're going to have to use the to list method, which is a, uh, an array method, which just returns um, the values of an array as a list. And this is because our, you know, we only implemented uh, selection with rows with a list, so you cannot give it a NumPy array. So that's unfortunate, but that's what we did. Um, uh, during the implementation. So yes, our data frame, which is self, we will select particular rows uh, by passing in a list. This simply denotes that we will select all of the columns. So remember, you give it two items that are separated by a comma. So here we have rows, comma, columns. It's just going to, uh, it will do simultaneous selection of rows and columns. But in this case, we're going to select all of the columns, which is why we just have a single colon, which is slice notation for saying slice all of them. So let's go ahead and look in the Jupyter Notebook here. And if we say we want to sort values by, um, say, the column weight, so it looks like goes from 40 all the way to 100. So basically the second and third rows just uh, exchange places. So that looks good. Uh, we can sort by a string name. So by this name, or by a string column. So the column name gets sorted from alphabetically. So everything looks good there. So um, let's go ahead and, and make this work if ascending is false. So if not ascending, then what we're going to do to order is simply just reverse it. So if we wanted to sort descendingly, we will just uh, reverse it. So this colon colon negative one, you should know from just regular Python, this is how you reverse a list. It's also how you can reverse a NumPy array. So if we go here, now and say ascending is false, then it'll sort from greatest to least. And we can do this again with like weight. So 100 down to 40. So everything looks good when we're sorting with a single, uh, you know, a, uh, just a, a single column. Now we have to implement the case where we have multiple columns. So this is a little bit different. So we we'll say else if uh, if if by is a list, then we will sort over here multiple columns. So we're assuming by is a list. Now you cannot use arg sort to sort multiple columns. NumPy is a separate function called lex sort. So we can give it um, the columns that we want. Uh, uh, and we have to actually give it in the reverse order. So this is a little bit uh, a little bit tricky here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to loop through all of the values in uh, in the by list. So by is a list. So let's go ahead and loop through here. So we'll say for column in by, and we'll do a list comprehension. So let's go back and do this. And we're going to say, we're going to get the data of that like this. So we're going to get a list of uh, NumPy arrays. And we can, uh, we can call this whatever we want. We need to assign this to something. So we can just reassign it to buy. That's OK. So we'll just have a list of NumPy arrays. But the way Lex sort works is that the um, the 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 array that you want to sort first must come last. So it actually does it like in reverse order. So we're going to give it a a list of NumPy arrays with the uh, the the primary sorting array will come last, which is a little uh, uh, it's certainly not intuitive. So we need to reverse the order of by. So assuming the user will want to uh, use the uh, you know use the first um, item in by as the as the primary sorting column. Um, so let's go ahead and reverse by and then we will get the underlying data 
So for every column in by that is reversed, we will get the underlying NumPy array. So by is now a list of NumPy arrays. And now we'll rely on NumPy to do all the hard work for us. And we will assign this to order. So that should work. And then the very last thing is I say to raise a type error if we don't have a list or a string. So we can say by must be either a list or a string. Okay. So, uh, and then we've already implemented it. So we'll just reverse this uh, in the case that we want to go high to low. So, all right, so let's, let's check this out over here in our Jupyter Notebook. So uh, if we want to sort by multiple values, so let's go ahead and pass in a list here. So if we have a list, well, this should actually still work even if it's a one item list. So we can try that and maybe we'll just get rid of ascending. So if we're sorting by weight, that looks good. Yeah, if we do false, Okay, now we're going from 100 to 40. Okay, that also looks good. Um, let's sort by school. So yes, uh, booleans are one, false is zero. So that's okay. But now what if we wanna sort by multiple columns? So say within school, so within all the true values of school, we will sort by weight. Let's go ahead and do that. So in this case, um, I've done ascending equals true, so it's going to go from false to true. Now within true, then the sorting will happen um, from least to greatest. So that looks good. I can make ascending equals false. So within true, so now we're going this way, it'll sort from greatest to least, so from 100 to 40. There's only one false. So that looks good. Um, the only way it makes sense to sort by multiple columns, the only case when it makes sense to sort by multiple columns is when there's duplicate values in one of the columns, or at least in the first sorting column. So in this case, um, school is the only column that has, uh, that has values that, are, um, that repeat. So this is the only way we can actually verify it visually, or else we'd have to add uh, more rows or more columns to our data. But uh, everything is looking good here with at least that simple example. Let's go ahead and test with PyTest. So there's actually four separate methods um, or four separate test cases that we're going to test individually. So it's going to be in this test more methods class. And within here we'll test uh, sort values. Okay, so that's that test, that passes that one, so that looks good. We can test the next one, test sort descending. And then let's do the next one, test sort values two. Okay, good, that passes. And the very last one is test two descending. And great, so we've passed all of the tests. Okay, good. So that does it for sort values and for step number 35. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 36, the sample method. The sample method will randomly select rows from the data frame. We are going to give our users two choices on how to uh, randomly select rows. One way is by providing this parameter n, will just will simply be an integer as the number of rows to randomly sample. The other way is to provide a fraction, you know, some number between zero and one, um, that will uh, uh, that will select a fraction of the number of rows. So, for instance, if the user provides us a number like 0 0.2. Um, the sample method will return 20% of the rows back. Um, now, there's going to be one other uh, uh, option here, and that's to sample with or without replacement. So that's what this parameter means. So regardless of whether you're sampling uh, with n or with frac, 
you'll be able to sample with or without replacement, meaning that if replacement is true, then the same row can appear more than one time. If it is false, which is the default, then at most every row will appear one time in the sample. The final parameter is seed, which uh, will be an integer and is not uh, required, but will allow the users to set the random number generator seed in NumPy if they so choose. Okay, so let's get started here. We're going to um, first begin by uh, completing the case whenever the user gives us n. So, uh, and to do this, we're going to rely on the on, uh, on NumPy's random module to do the heavy lifting. So again, we're uh, relying on NumPy, but this time we're going to dig into the random module, which contains you know dozens of of, of functions that will help us um, you know do do stuff with with randomization. So in this case, we're going to choose the choice function. So the choice function, what it does is it selects randomly you know, from a collection of objects. So our collection of objects will be the number 0 to n, and not df, but self. So we're going to create a, a range object, which is just a collection that it's able to sample from. And the second parameter here is the size of this, which will be n. That's what our user is providing us. And we will allow our users to, uh, we'll just use whatever the users give us for replace. So um, the choice function also has this same exact replace parameter uh, to sample with or without replacement. Okay, so what this is going to do is it's going to return us some numbers between 0 and n, not inclusive of n, uh, sorry, 0 and uh, the number of rows in the data frame. So, you know, length we've already, uh, you know, computed above. Um, so this will be between 0 and the number of rows in the data frame. We will select n of those rows uh, with or without replacement, determining uh, whether or not the user wants to. So this will return us uh, some row numbers. So we're, gonna, we're actually going to sample the row numbers. So that's going to help us out here on how to... Uh, on how to actually make this selection. So we will just return our data frame of just those particular rows. And we're going to have to actually convert this to a list. So rows is going to be a NumPy array. And just like in the previous step, we had to convert NumPy arrays into a list in order to make the selection since our data frame only works with lists as the row selection. So we're going to do uh, simultaneous row and column selection. So the rows will go there. The columns, we're just going to select everything um, for the columns. OK, so let's go ahead and, and see how this looks in the Jupyter Notebook. So we're down here. So here's DF. So if we want to randomly sample, say, two rows, uh, that looks good. So these will be, I'm just rerunning the same thing over and over again. Now we can make replacement true, and then actually we can actually sample more than the number of rows that we have. So we're going to guarantee ourselves some duplication somewhere. So we can see Eleni and Teddy are duplicated. So those rows have been duplicated. So you'll get duplication, or the possibility of duplication, whenever replace is true. Okay, so that that looks good. Now. Um, so that's working for, it looks like it's working when the user gives us n. So if the user provides us a fraction, so then we're going to have to do a little bit of math here. So if, uh, if the user does provide us with a fraction, so if fract, so if it's not none and it's not uh, zero, then we can, uh, we can actually just use this frac to calculate n. So we'll just say n equals frac times the length of self. Okay, so this will give us some fraction. Now, 
This will not return us an integer, so we're going to have to force this to be an integer by passing it uh, into int. So basically, we're just going to, if, if the user gives us a number for frac, we're going to turn this into a fraction like this, or turn it into an actual whole number n, and that will get passed, will uh, eventually get passed into here. Okay. So let's uh, let's see how that works. So if we say frac equals um, like 0.5, so 0.5 is 50% of four, so it return two rows, and it does. If we say 0.8, which is 3.2, which we rounded down to three, so we return three rows. So that looks good. Now if we place this true, we could say we want 300%. Uh, and that will return here 12 rows, so 3 times 4 is 12, so that also works, it looks good. Okay, so that looks like it's working. Um, it says, raise a value error if frac is not positive and a type error if n is not an integer. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that, so just to uh, complete this, so we kind of skipped over that, so if, if frac is not a oh, not is instance, but if frac is uh, less than zero, not positive, so less than or equal to zero, then we're going to raise a uh, value error here and say frac uh, must be positive. So that takes care of that case. Um, and then we'll raise a type error if n is not an integer. So, uh, so if n is not an integer, say say if not is instance n integer, then we will raise a type error, and we'll just say that n uh, must be an integer. Okay, so we're not going to handle the case that the user gives us both frac and n. So you might be wondering about that. Um, you can certainly add a case for that to make sure they only give us one of those, we're just not going to handle that here. Um, one last thing, um, we, need a, we, need a, we need to do something whenever the seed parameter is given us. So if the user does give us a seed, then what we're going to do is say, nah, we're going to set the seed by doing, uh, calling the seed function and just passing the seed into here like this. So if seed is given to us, then we will go ahead and set the seed. Okay, so that looks uh, pretty good. So let's go through here one at a time again. So yes, uh, if the seed is given to us, we'll set the seed. If we're given a frac, then we'll just check that the fraction is, gr is positive. If it is, then we will uh, create or calculate n. Um, if n is not an integer, so the, the user must give us an integer or give us frac. So we'll raise the type error if n is not an integer. Otherwise, here's where the heavy lifting comes into place. We're going to choose, uh, we're going to use the, the choice function from NumPy and select uh, from the possible uh, number of rows, the possible values for the row numbers. And then we'll also just uh, pass along the replace, whatever the option that the user gave us for replace. So this will return us the, you know, uh, the, the row numbers, and we just have to convert this to a list, and then make the selection and select just those rows along with all of the columns. So that looks good um, for that. And let's go ahead and run a PyTest here. And this is going to be test uh, sample. And looks like we passed it. All right, great. So this, so now we can randomly sample rows in our data frame, in our data frame with or without replacement. And that completes step number 36. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 37, Pivot Tables Part 1. So we're going to be beginning the pivot table method in this step. 
It is the most complex method in the entire project and will take multiple steps in order for it to be complete. So this video will focus on just getting started and um, dis discussing what exactly a pivot table is. So let's go ahead and look at this data I have over here. It's just an image of some city of Houston employee data. It contains four columns, department, race, gender, and salary. So this is the raw data over here. On the right hand side is the actual the pivot table. So in this case, um, a, t a typical pivot table involves two columns that will whose independent uh, whose unique values will form independent groups. So in this case, we are using the race and the gender columns to form groups. So uh, any unique combination of race and gender will form a group. So we. Uh, as you can see here on uh, this vertical uh, grouping column, this vertical axis if you will, the race column has five unique values. The, uh, the gender column is uh, horizontal and has two unique values. So each one of these combinations of race and gender will be represented in the actual data over here and this pivot table shows the average salary for those groups. So for instance, in the upper left hand corner right here, uh, this number represents the average salary for all the Asian females in the group. If we take a look at this cell, this contains the average salary for all Hispanic males in the group or in the, in the data. So that is a, that is a, a pivot table, a, a generic pivot table. So it consists of four pieces. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you have one grouping column. You have another grouping column. Here it's, you know, gender. We have race and gender as a grouping column. We have a third column of values that will get aggregated. And the fourth piece is the type of aggregation. So we could have done some other aggregation besides the mean. We could have taken the max salary or the min, or we could have done like a count. But uh, you have to choose an aggregation uh, for a pivot table. So only one value can be reported for you know each uh, unique combination of race and gender. So let's go ahead and look at the function signature over here the method signature, we can see here that it does have four parameters. So rows is one of the columns whose unique values will form the, one of the groups. Columns is the uh, going to be another column whose unique values will form groups. Values is the column whose values are going to be aggregated. And values is almost always a numeric column, since numeric columns are the ones that are, that are typically capable of being aggregated. The ag func uh, parameter is going to be a string of the type of aggregation. So this is going to be you know, min, max, mean, median, uh, standard deviation. All those aggregation functions are going to be possible here. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the final product looks like in a Jupyter notebook just so you can get a better idea of how uh, Pandas Cub is going to behave. So I've created a, a fake data frame with eight rows it has three columns. So I've actually created it with pandas cub and pandas cub final just so you can see how the final version looks. So this is a very simple data frame. And let's say for instance, I wanted to create a pivot table such that I had the state as one of the grouping columns. And columns would be, let's say fruit, the other grouping column. And I wanted to aggregate weight. And how did I want to aggregate it? Well, I'm going to aggregate it by summing it up in this case. We could choose a different aggregation, but that is a perfectly viable one. Okay, so what this is saying is that Texas has 15 apples or pounds of apples or whatever. Florida has seven pounds of apples, three pounds of oranges, and Texas has six pounds of oranges. So you could go in here and verify that, you know, Texas and apples appears there, that's five, and 10 here, that's 15. Florida appears here for apples four and three, and that's seven, so it looks good. 
Um, and then you can also verify for, you know, for, for oranges as well. So two and four is six for Texas, and uh, two and one is three for Florida. So everything looks good there. But that is a pivot table. Um, that, that, that is the pivot table that we're going to produce um, for Panda's Cup. Now, I'm just going to copy and paste this. We are also going to allow our pivot table to accept just either one of rows or columns. So we're going to allow our pivot table to work with, with just one of those. So in this case, um, we're just providing its state for the rows. So uh, for we're going to get the total weight for all of the fruit, regardless of what type of fruit it is. So all of the Florida fruit weighs 20, 10 pounds. All of the Texas fruit weighs 21 pounds. Now we will allow uh, either one to be um, either one to be observed, either rows or columns. If you do it columns, then you'll get a different uh, view. You'll have just simply the unique values as the column names, and then the aggregation uh, directly underneath them as a single row. And you know you can put any um, you know any value here. So here we put the fruit. We could change it to the rows and change the you know the direction of it, changes orientation. Um, we could change aggregation methods over here. So, um, so there's there's a lot of possibilities that our pivot table will be able to handle once it's complete. So, um, so let's get started with the code now. I have actually just copied and pasted some of the code to get started here, and. Um, this is because um, I don't want to spend time on uh, you know this beginning code. There's already uh, some more interesting code that'll be written in the next step, but this is the this is a step to get us uh, uh, started. So this code, what it will do, it does uh, two things. Number one, it extracts the data into NumPy arrays, so it gets the NumPy arrays out of our data dictionary, and number two, it determines what type of pivot we're doing. Are we doing just rows? Are we doing just columns? Or are we doing rows and columns? So there's three possibilities that we're doing. So we've seen them over here. So this is one where there's rows and columns. This is one where there's just rows. And this one we can change so that it's just columns. So there's going to be three different branches within our program on uh, what's going to happen. So either just uh, you know, uh, it's going to either be all uh, both rows and columns, just rows or just columns. Okay, so let's just walk through this code real quick to see uh, what it shows. So number one, uh, both rows and columns cannot both be none. So if rows is none and columns is none, then we're going to raise a value error. We're going to say well, you cannot do that. That is not uh, that's not valid. You have to you have to at least have one grouping column here. Now. We are going to allow values to be none, actually. So in that case, and I need to show you this, how this works. If values is none, then you certainly can't have an aggregation on values that don't exist. So a small bug in the code, and I fixed it. But the uh, it's still going to return an error here, or raise an error here. You're, uh, we're not going to allow someone to give us an aggregation function if there are no values to aggregate. So that simply doesn't make any sense. So back here in the code, we're in this branch where values is none. So values is none, um, and you try to give an ag func, which is on now in this branch, then we're going to raise an error. Okay, so let's go back up to the case where values is not none. So if you give us a column for values, we're going to extract the underlying numpy array. So we have to get those NumPy arrays uh, into their own variables. Now, if you give us a values, but you don't provide a ag func, then there's no way to know how to aggregate. So that will also raise an error. Now, there is going to be one case, a special case, where if the user gives us no values and no ag func, we're going to assume the user just wants to straight up count the co-occurrences of all the unique combinations in the data frame. So in this case, what we're going to do is make the ag func equal to size, and we'll see um, there's a numpy size function, which is why it's called size. It's not just uh, called that for any reason whatsoever. 
Um, we are going to create just an empty NumPy array as a placeholder for the data. Now we could sort of get around not doing this, but it is actually a fairly inexpensive operation since it just uh, uh, it just it just puts nothing in there. It just uh, sort of creates a, a data with 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 whatever um, in memory with whatever data is actually already in those uh, addresses. So this actually happens quite fast. So you don't have to worry about uh, expensive uh, computation here. Okay, so that um, that takes care of the values and agfunc uh, whether they exist. Now in the next uh, segment of the program, so uh, we're just going to continue to collect uh, our data into NumPy arrays. So so if rows is not none, we are going to extract its data into row data. If columns is not none, we're going to extract its NumPy array into call data. So by the end of this line, we've extracted val data, row data, and call data. The last thing is to determine what type of pivot table are we doing. Are we doing something with only columns, only rows, or are we doing it with both rows and columns, which will be given the string all. So um, I'm actually over here. I should be. Sorry. Um, I was in the final, but it's the same code. So yes, it's going to be either either columns, rows, or all. So if rows is none, that means columns is not none, it must be, then our pivot type will be columns. If columns is none, then we know that rows uh, has to uh, not be none. So our pivot type is just rows. Otherwise, we are going to get uh, both of them, and it's going to be all. So at this stage, uh, there's no more code in this method. We can actually just go ahead and return, and I like to do this so I can slowly check my code. We can actually just return the pivot type. You know, this is just going to be one of these three strings. And I do this just so I could um, check on the fly, um, you know, uh, doing this sort of thing. So let's go ahead and let's make this valid. So if um, I just call, if I use rows and columns, it better return all. If it's just rows, it's going to say rows. If it's just columns, it's going to return just columns. So it looks like it's working uh, right here at this point in time. Okay, so that uh, covers setting up the problem and extracting the data in, uh, from the NumPy arrays and determining what type of pivot table we are going to do. So we just did those two things, and that completes step number 37, part one. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 37, Pivot Tables Part 2. So in the last video, we extracted all the underlying NumPy arrays for the row, column, and value data, if it exists. And then we also classified our pivot table as either having just columns, just rows, or both rows and columns with the string all. So now that we've uh, you know got our data and that we've classified what type of pivot table that we've that we're going to be creating, we need to um, divide the data into groups. So this is a little bit easier seen with by looking at uh, the data itself. So let's go ahead, uh, let me delete these. Let's go ahead and look at our data. So when I say divide the data into groups, so let's just say we are uh, creating a pivot table where we want, uh, we're going to say just the rows are state, the values are going to be weight, and um, the ag func here is going to be sum. So what we want to, to, to complete this successfully, what we have to do is map all of the weights for Texas uh, into you know one list or one array and map all of the weights for Florida into another one. So we have to perform some sort of grouping here. So if we were to do this manually, you would just simply go through this, you would iterate through here one by one, and whenever you encountered state of Texas, you would you know append this value to um, you know the values for Texas, and you would then append this value, for instance, to all the other previous values for Florida. And you would go through and for every single state, every single unique state, at the end would have a list or, or an array of all the values that were associated with it. So we're going to do uh, the same thing here. 
we're going to iterate through the state or the um, you know all, all, all of the uh, columns to form these uh, unique groups and then to um, you know to keep appending uh, whatever the values are for those groups so let's see how this might work first of all we're just going to delete this return statement so we don't need that anymore so let's go ahead and um, uh, iterate through here so what are we going to iterate through here so maybe before we do an iteration we can think about zipping up um, let's just say we're working with only um, only columns so let's write a if statement first so if the pivot type if it's columns then we only have column data and value data so what if we zip up the call data right here and the value data um, so if we if we go through here um, so we can iterate through this so we're just gonna zip this up so if we go back over here it's like zipping up state and weight for instance in this uh, area so if we had columns for instance maybe um, that's just because I have an error here so that'll go away so let's just zip, uh, let's iterate through state or, or through the column data and the value data and we'll call this uh, the first one will be the group so call data we can just say it's the group and the second one is uh, val so these will just be the individual variable names as we're uh, going as we're iterating so what we need to do here is do something like a, uh, a dictionary that has a list and it keeps appending values to that end of the dictionary so we could just create a dictionary but there's actually a good um, you know uh, there's a, there's a good data structure called the default dictionary in the collections module. So we're going to go ahead and, and use that. So from collections, we're going to import this uh, default dictionary object. And we're going to go ahead and create a default dictionary where its default value is a list. So if what this means that is every value is automatically, every key is automatically mapped to an empty list. It, um, if there's if it's not mapped to something already so what we're going to do here is so D will be our data our, our dictionary so for every um, every group we are simply going to append uh, val to it so that looks good um, so we're just gonna we're just literally going to iterate through all of the data um, that we have if it's columns so if this is uh, if this is rows, then we're going to do the same thing, except it's going to call row data. Now, so that looks, this should work for rows, if it's just, if we just have rows. Otherwise, this means that um, one more branch here for uh, the, the case where if we have both rows and columns defined. So this is going to look a little bit different here. So we're going to have two groups here. We'll say group one, group two, and val. And we're going to zip up all three. So we have row, row data, call data, and val data. So we're going to zip these all up. We're going to iterate through each one of those. Now, instead of this just being a group like this, we have two. So we're going to actually make a tuple in here to be the key in our dictionary. So there's group one, group two is going to form uh, this tuple will actually uh, uh, be the group that we're after uh, will be the key to the group so a, a two item tuple will be the key to the group and we will simply append um, val like that okay so that looks uh, that looks okay um, and so it looks like we've collected all of the data so why don't we go ahead and just return this object here um, and return this dictionary right now in its current state just so we can verify that we've collected everything correctly so let's go back here and run this again and look at this okay good so we have a it returns a default dictionary which is exactly what it is and here's Texas Texas is mapped to those values that, that looks fantastic that's great and Florida is mapped to these values that's exactly what we wanted so we're just mapping our group 
to the values. Um, we could have done it with fruit. So fruit would have worked out as well. It should work for rows here. So here's uh, uh, the same thing if we use rows. Now, if we do columns and rows together, well, let's see if this works. And that looks good. So we actually have a tuple. So apples in Texas are mapped to 5 and 10. Apples in Florida are mapped to 4 and 3 and so forth. So that looks good. So we've created this dictionary, which um, has as its keys the group, which is either a single string or a tuple of strings. And the values for the dictionary are simply a list of whatever column is in the values column over here. So that's it for, for this one. I just wanted to collect all the data into each independent group uh, as a dictionary. So uh, yes, that completes part two for step 37. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 37, Pivot Tables part three. So we collected all of the values for each group in the last step. And what we have is this dictionary D that maps every group to a list of the values that we would like to aggregate. So in this step, what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through this dictionary and perform the actual aggregation for that group. So this will actually be a fairly short part of this entire process. What we're going to do is we are going to create a new dictionary called agdict. This will be the, uh, I guess, the aggregation dict. So we're going to map the groups to the aggregation. Right now we have the groups mapped to the, uh, uh, you know, all of the values, all of the raw values. Let's go ahead and uh, iterate through uh, all the groups. So we can say uh, for group comma vals in d dot items. We're going to go ahead and uh, iterate through here. So the first thing we'll do is we're actually going to convert this list. So vals is a list. We're going to convert it to a numpy array. So that is fine the way it is. We've converted it to a numpy array. Now, we need to perform the aggregation. So if we look back up, the user has given us an aggregation over here as a string. So agfunc holds the aggregation, the type of aggregation, as a string. So what we're going to do here is we are going to use get adder since it's a string. So we're going to get the attribute from numpy. So we're going to get the numpy function that... Um, that the user has given us. So ag func is a string, np is the module. So so this get adder will get the that actual function from numpy. We'll just call it func. And what we'll do here is we'll take ag dict and for every group we will now apply this function to that underlying uh, numpy array. So just iterating through all of our uh, previous dictionary we're converting all the values into a NumPy array. We are getting the, met, uh, the function name from NumPy because we are given a string. And then we are going to compute, we're going to calculate the aggregation and we're going to assign it to a new dictionary. Let's go ahead and return uh, agdict right here at this stage to see if it's working. So this is just one little chunk of code that has, um, See, we'll see if it works. So this was the result of the last one. So now if we call this same one, we should see that, um, yes, indeed we have an aggregation that's performed. So five and 10 have now been aggregated to 15. Four and three have been aggregated to seven and so forth. So it looks like um, we've correctly performed the aggregation uh, and, and uh, moved on to a completely new dictionary to hold our data. So we are, we are nearly there. We now have to just transform this into, we have to now do the actual pivoting um, of this data 
uh, to, to, to return a data frame. So the, the way it's right now is, is quite usable and good information, but it is not a data frame. Let me go one more step and uh, pivot this information so that we are returned a data frame. All right, so that completes step 37, part three. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project, build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 37, pivot tables part four. So the last step, we aggregated all of our, uh, all the values in each group into a single uh, dictionary. So the final result, if we just look back here, was this dictionary mapping our group to our, uh, the aggregated value. It's going to be a single value. Um, we could also aggregate just by, you know, rows or just by columns. So this is a much simpler aggregation you see here. You know, if it would work identically if we used columns. So let's go ahead and handle those two cases first. And by that I mean we need to turn, we need to convert um, this result into a data frame. So we're at the point we need to, we need to return the result uh, to our users. So we're going to uh, create a data frame at this stage. So as we normally do to create data frames, we're going to begin by just creating an empty dictionary. And uh, for the three cases, we're going to have a uh, different logic for each of the three pivot types. So let's go ahead and just assume that our user has given us columns. Okay, so if we have just the columns provided, that means what we want to produce is a data frame that has one row and all the unique values are in the columns. So let's just do that. So let's go through our ag dict and create a new column for every entry in there. So the one thing that we're going to do here, we say for column in ag dict, what we're actually going to do is I want to sort the aggregation dictionary. So all the keys, I want to go through in a sorted order. So for instance, if, so all the states will be sorted, all the, uh, if it's race, that will be sorted. If it's gender, that'll be sorted. So all the, all the unique values in the columns, you know, column will be sorted. And this is what pandas does. So this will be easier to read the pivot table. So we're going to, uh, we're going to sort this. So we're going to say new data of call will equal the ag, now we have to uh, uh, select that one again. So this is going to be a single value. So what we need to do here is convert it to a list and then pass it to the numpy array function to make it a, a, an array. Okay, so all we're doing here is iterating through all the keys, the sorted keys of ag dict. So, so just to give you a little bit more information on this, when you pass ag dict into sorted, sorted uh, will iterate through just the keys of ag dict. And so we'll iterate through, 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 through just the keys here. And then we'll uh, extract just that numpy array uh, from ag dict. Uh, or not, it's actually not a numpy array, it's a single value. It's gonna be a single number. We're gonna wrap it inside of a list. Then we're gonna convert it to a numpy array and assign that to the new data uh, dictionary. Okay, so we should be able to return our data frame um, correctly. And let's just see how this looks over here. So see if we can see if we have uh, converted and I'll just type it over here so we can see this. Okay, good. So that looks like it worked. So it turned it, now we have a data frame. We have a formal data frame with the, uh, you know, the, the column names are sorted and underneath them is the, as how they were aggregated. All right, now let's do the same thing, except um, this time we'll have pivot type equal to rows. So in this instance, we're just gonna have two columns. So the first column will have the unique uh, values of the rows, and the second one will have the aggregation. So let's go ahead and extract all of those. So we have ag dict. So the keys contain all of our uh, new values for the, for the first column. 
So let's go ahead and extract those. And what we could do here, we'll just convert it into a list. And then one more time into an array. So, uh, yeah, you can't just convert the keys directly into an umpire array. Um, so we're going to turn it into a list first and then, uh, and then turn it into an array. Okay, so we'll just say these are the uh, row values. Uh, we can just call it rows. And the vowels, we will do the same thing here. Let's copy and paste here, but we're just going to get the values of that. So we have rows and vowels. So these are both going to be arrays. So we can um, we can directly create uh, new data here. So we can say new data of the rows. And actually, we need to use a different uh, word here. Just say uh, row vowels. So rows was our original uh, column name. So we'll say we'll map this to row vowels and new data of, uh, we'll say, we'll use ag func. So this new this column will be the aggregation function name and will equal to the vowels. Okay, so the aggregation vowels over here. Okay, so that looks good. Now, um, let's go ahead and see if this uh, returns something that looks good. So it's gonna just pivot this a little bit. So we're going to have two columns. Yes, the first will be uh, just fruit and the individual fruit. And so that looks good. Now, one thing we'll have to do, what you might want, what we, we want to do uh, to be consistent with pandas is we're going to, we, I want to sort this data. So um, I think we should sort this data frame by the row vowels. So what we could do here is um, we need to sort this. So instead of instead of immediately um, assigning row vowels to our dictionary, we will call arg sort here and get the order of this. So we'll sort it from high to or low to high. So we're going to sort row vowels first, and then we will use that order for both row vowels and for uh, their corresponding vowels. So I think that should sort it so that um, uh, uh, so that we so that we match what pandas does and pandas uh, sorts both the rows and the columns. So there we have uh, the order. We're going to get the um, we're going to get that and then we're simply going to use that uh, to do the sorting. Okay, so that looks good. Um, let's see if it computes over here. And it was already sorted, so we can't, uh, you know, we had apples and oranges, so we'd have to like add another fruit in. But uh, we're just gonna uh, leave that test to PyTest when we get there in the next step, which will be the last one for pivot tables. So this completes pivot table uh, uh, video uh, part four, and we have one more portion and that's when that's to uh, pivot the data when, when we have both rows and columns given to us so we did the simple cases when when just columns was given to us or just rows but the next case will be when uh, pivot type is all all right so that is it for part four of the pivot tables Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 37 pivot tables part 5. So this is going to be the last step for the pivot tables section and in this step we're going to pivot the results of when our user uh, gives us both rows and columns. So when the pivot type is all we are going to return a data frame. So in the prior two steps, or the previous step, we returned a data frame, a simple data frame, whenever the pivot type was rows or whenever it was columns. In this case, uh, I've added actually all the code that will complete this step. So this is already complete. 
I'm simply going to uh, talk about every line in here instead of uh, live coding it. So um, before we get there, I want to show what the end or what the result is right before we get into this branch of the program. So after we've aggregated our results, I want to go ahead and output that result once again. So I'm going to just uh, do a little return statement here, return dict, ag dict. So this is the aggregated dictionary of the keys mapped to that those single aggregated value. So we'll never actually reach this part of the program for the uh, for temporarily. Let's go ahead in the Jupyter Notebook. And what I want to do here is um, let's go ahead and do a pivot table that has both rows and columns. Here we're just going to sum up the values for every combination of fruit and state. So we have four unique combinations of fruit and state. So what we're going to do here is we want to turn this into a pivot table. So we don't have a we don't have our um, we don't we don't yet have a uh, a data frame here. We need to we need to convert this into a data frame. Just so you can see the final result, it needs to look like this. So we need to transform this dictionary, um, you know, into this pivot table. So the way we're going to do this is uh, we're going to uh, the strategy that we're going to employ is we're going to find all the unique values for the you know for the first entry in our pivot table and all the unique values for the second you know entry uh, of of the key portion of this dictionary and then we're going to iterate uh, over both of those lists and then and then fill in the blanks um, accordingly with the actual value. So that's what we're going to do here. Let's go ahead. Let's go back to the code, and we'll remove this return statement. So let's go down here. Um, these are the two branches that we completed in the previous step. So now we're here else. So we've checked whether pivot type is columns or rows, and now we're here in this branch. So this the only other option is when the pivot type is all. So this is when the user has given us both rows and columns. So what we're going to do here to get the unique values of all the um, you know all the rows or all the columns is with a set okay so we're gonna we're gonna iterate through this agri, uh, this ag dict so this is um, it's gonna go through the it's gonna go it's gonna iterate through the keys of the ag dict so this is what this does and we're simply going to um, add every first key to the row set and every second or every uh, uh, second element of the tuple to to the call set. So remember, the groups in here are to, are are two item tuples. So this gets the very first item, and this gets the very second item, and we just add it to um, to each set uh, respectively. So sets cannot have duplicates. So row set and call set will contain all the unique combinations for the rows and for the columns. Okay, so we will convert this uh, row set to a list, a sorted list. So sorted returns a list. So it's going to go through and sort that set and actually return a list. And uh, so I have new data here, so I can actually go ahead and erase that. Um, I must have implemented it a slightly differently elsewhere. So there's new data up there. We don't need it to redefine it. So um, the rows are going to make up, or the uh, the values in the row list will make up one column. So in our new data dictionary, we're going to go ahead and um, go ahead and make that one column. So that will be complete. Then we're going to iterate through every single column, every single unique value of the columns. So we're going to iterate through there. We're going to go one by one over the columns. So maybe it helps to look back over here. So in this uh, instance, our columns were states. So it's going to go by one by one over over uh, the unique values, which are here are just Texas and Florida. So we're just going to iterate over Texas and Florida. And then for every unique value of this, we're going to iterate through every uh, you know every unique value of the row list. And then we're going to look up that value. We're going to look up what was the actual aggregated value here. 
So we're going to pass in the tuple to our ag dict. So we're going to create an, an ag dict. So we have call here and row here. So we're just going to try to get that value. And if it doesn't exist, we're going to say it is missing. We're going to say we're going to return a, a, a nan uh, numpy a missing value. So um, yes. So we'll just keep appending our uh, appending the looked up values in the aggregated dictionary to this new vowels list and then that will form each new column so within here I'm just simply I'm, I'm iterating over each column and then iterating through each unique row and creating a new list and then finally converting that list into an array and then finally that should uh, that should that should create those uh, all the columns that we need to make the um, to, to make the data frame. Okay, so let's go ahead and see if this works now. So we do this. It looks like everything is good. So um, and the last thing we'll need to do here is to run these tests. So let's go ahead and run PyTest. And this is in the test grouping class, so I need to update this so test grouping then we're going to test uh, the pivot table rows or calls test and that passes good and then we have one more test the pivot table both okay and let's go ahead and run that one and that one also passes okay great so this was a very complex method um, you can either do it by just rows, by just columns, or by rows and columns. And you know the, the, the bulk of the work is, is sort of, you could sort of separate it into two distinct areas. One is to gather the data into groups, and that's with a dictionary. The second one was to actually then, then convert that, that gathered and aggregated data into a data frame. So this is sort of the second portion of it. And the first portion uh, was to gather the data into a dictionary, which was this highlighted portion. So that completes uh, step 37, all five parts, creating pivot tables. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project, Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we complete step 38, automatically add documentation. So in this step, we are going to automatically add documentation, which means doc strings, to several methods. So these are the methods that we're going to automatically add the documentation to. And in fact, this, this particular uh, step is actually already complete, so there's no additional coding that will, be, um, that will be needed. But I will explain exactly what happens. So just to give a little rehash on the doc strings before we before I actually go into this method right down here, let me take a uh, let me let me scroll up a little bit to go into the pivot table method, which we just completed. So the pivot table method has a doc string like this. Um, it has all the parameters, has uh, you know a small description, it has a return section. So this is a literal Python string. And this is not just useful for the developers. This is actually very useful for the, uh, the users of our library because the doc strings are able to be viewed as a user whenever you're coding in an environment such as VS Code or Jupyter Notebook or many other environments. So let's go take a look at what I mean uh, when I say that. So if we go ahead and go back to the test notebook, so df, if I call the pivot table method, or if I bring it up without calling it, and I put a single question mark at the end, Jupyter Notebook will pull up this window, this little pop-up window at the bottom of the screen, and it will show us the documentation string. So the users can easily pull it up. So that's very nice. Now. You can also access the doc string by pressing shift tab tab. So if I press shift tab tab, this will um, this will also pop up the doc string. And this is this is a this is actually what I use 
when I'm uh, you know, using libraries in the Jupyter Notebook, I am pressing shift tab tab frequently as it is a great way to quickly get the documentation string. And there's, um, there's no way to memorize you know, all, the possible, uh, all the possibilities for all the methods and functions that are available. So the doc strings are very valuable to quickly uh, get help while you're coding. Now, um, if we look back um, up to the aggregation functions, aggregation methods, you'll notice that there are no doc strings here. So there's nothing under these, oh, sorry, those are not the aggregation functions, but if I go up a little bit, a little bit further up, where we get to um, our previous ag uh, funks, so here we go. So we have min, max, mean, median, sum, all those. You notice there are no aggregate, or there are no doc strings available here. There's nothing that was written here. But yet, if I go and say I want to call the min method, and let me just pull this up, there in fact is a doc string. So how did that get there? How did a doc string get there when it's not clearly visible in the code? Well, the answer lies in a special attribute called dunder doc. So you can actually retrieve the doc strings as a special method, this doc special method, dunder doc. And it's just like any other attribute. This is just a normal Python string that um, it's assigned to this variable. So this is how you can dynamically set your doc strings is with this dunder doc special attribute. And that's exactly what uh, what I did in the code to to go ahead and add all those um, doc strings to all these aggregation methods. So what I noticed was uh, when I was building this code is that you know all these aggregation methods have very similar you know uh, they're they're going to have very similar doc strings. So instead of writing that same thing over and over again, I decided to define a method that will automatically add documentation, and that's what this entire step is all about, is about automatically adding documentation. So the first thing I did was to assign a list of all of the methods that I would like to automatically odd, add documentation to. So these are all these aggregation method names. And then I had a generic doc string, which is a string. So I, I, I assigned it to a variable called ag doc. So this is just a string. Um, it has these braces in here, which signify something important and that is that I can replace whatever the contents of these braces with a variable so that'll come up uh, that'll be important later but this is the doc string so I'm making a very simple doc string find the blank of each column so blank will be um, one of these once we fill it in so what we do here is um, we're going to iterate through all of these names okay so for name and ag names what we're going to do is we're going to from our data frame, we're going to get, we're going to use get adder to retrieve the method um, using a string. So we have our data frame class. We're going to retrieve the method, and then of that meth that method's dunder doc attribute, we will reassign. So we're going to reassign it to ag doc, which is this string. But we are going to fill in those braces. We're going to replace those braces. So this is what the format. Um, uh, format method for strings allows you to do and then we're going to replace it with name whatever the current name is so for the first one it'll say find the min of each column so that's what this add docs uh, method is doing it's uh, conveniently creating documentation automatically to several methods so instead of having to repeat it over and over again we're just going to have one single uh, one single method to add all of this documentation. So this only really works whenever you have methods that have, you know, basically essentially the same documentation, just with, you know, a uh, uh, very small difference, like the name of it. Um, so then you can you can do this and just replace each method's dunder doc attribute with whatever string you want the doc string to be. So uh, you might be wondering when this thing actually gets invoked, and it, this happens in the constructor. So in one of the very first steps, um, we we've, we very quickly glanced over this. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll up to the constructor, 
just so that you can see where this gets executed. And it gets executed right here. So the very last line of the constructor, we're going to call this dunder, or not dunder, but this add docs method, which will go through all of those aggregation methods and add documentation uh, to them by overriding the dunder doc attribute. Okay, so um, that's a, a little special trick on how to, you know, uh, to change the doc strings dynamically and how to automatically add documentation to many methods at once. And that completes step 38. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video, we will complete step 39, string only methods. So the last step completed the data frame class. There are no more methods to be implemented in the data frame class after this add docs method. We are actually going to be looking at an entire new class called string methods. And what this class will help us do is to process columns of data in our data frame that are strings. So we'll, we will be able to manipulate um, strings in our data frame with an entirely new class. So let's just take a, a quick look through this string methods class because this is, um, we're gonna be dealing only with this, uh, you know, within this class for, for, for this step. So if you look inside here, you'll see the names of a lot of methods and these all will do some sort of string manipulation or string calculation. So, you know, there's capitalize, count, ends with, starts with, and so forth. There's many, many string methods that are going to be available to string columns in our data frame. So how does this even become a part of our data frame and how is it accessed? Well, this is this happens during data frame construction. So within the dunder init method of the data frame method or the data frame class, you will see this. So let's go ahead and, and scroll up till we uh, come uh, come back into the data frame constructor. So here's the data frame constructor. And you'll see this line right here. So what we're doing here is we're uh, assigning to this str attribute a new instance of the string methods class so we're 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 um, we're creating a new instance we're calling the constructor of the string methods class right here and we're actually passing it the passing itself as a parameter to that constructor okay so this is exactly where the string methods um, you know uh, class comes in and we create an instance of it and assign it to this str attribute. So let's go take a look at the string methods constructor and see what this self is doing. So this is just the, uh, the current data frame. That's what self is at this uh, right here. Let's scroll back down to the string methods uh, class and go inside the constructor. So uh, during that line, uh, this uh, will get executed. And the, the, the self from above is a data frame. It will get passed to this DF variable and it will get assigned to this underscore DF um, instance variable for the, uh, you know, for the current instance. So there's only one thing that happens during construction of the string methods uh, class, and that is to have a reference to the data frame. So we can sort of go back one level by having a reference um, to the data frame that holds an instance of the string methods class. So this will make more sense when we go ahead and look at a data frame. Uh, and let's go ahead and do this in the Jupyter Notebook. So if we have a DF, which is just some data frame, and we look at STR. So STR is just currently an attribute right now. And as you can see here, it's pointing to a single instance of the string methods class and you can still us uh, so now you can call methods on this um, on this particular object and if you press tab you'll see that all of the public methods become available and there you cannot call them yet 
we have to implement uh, one single method within string methods for, for these to work. So these, these are not working uh, in the, at the current state. But they are available, just not working. So let's go ahead and make them work. Let's flip back over to VS Code and take a look at all of the methods here. And they're all going to look very similar. So notice that almost all of these are going to be a single line of code within here. Um, and they're going to call this underlying uh, str method. So this str method is sort of the generic string method that will handle um, all of the other methods. So you'll notice that the first parameter or the first argument to this method is going to be the, um, the, the, the Python method name for, uh, for the Python string method name. So we're actually going to use the underlying, this is Python right here. This is the Python string capitalized method, for instance. And the second argument will always be the column name that we want to, um, that we want to uh, use this particular method on. So all of these are going to look the same. So, um, you know, center, uh, the first parameter, the first argument is simply the um, the Python sh the Python string method name. The second parameter is always the column name of the data frame. Now you'll notice that several of these methods have extra arguments. So these are all the same exact arguments that come along with these Python string methods. So I've simply copied and pasted them from Python uh, into this code, and we're just going to pass them along. So we're going to allow our user to use the exact same methods that Python allows its users uh, to use on strings. But regardless, the first two arguments are always going to be the method name and then the column name for every single one of these. So it's going to call. So, so basically, this will always be the same for all of the methods. We're, going to, we're just going to pass in the method name and the column name. OK. So here we go. Um, let's just go down here to this string method. So this is what we're going to implement. And this is the only thing that we need to do. And if we implement this one correctly, then the other ones uh, will all work. So if we look at the signature here, the first thing is, yes, the, the method that we're getting um, that we want to apply. The second is the column name. Okay, but then the third is this strange thing called args with a star in front. So we talked a little about this um, in, a, in a previous step. So anything that has two stars is going to capture any arguments as a keyword arguments. Anything with one star is going to capture any extra arguments as a tuple. So we're going to collect any extra arguments like, for instance, here, these last three arguments will be collected in this star args and we will simply pass this along to python and say here just take these and um you know use them to uh, uh to execute the method with okay so we'll see that in just a little bit um so what we're going to do is number one is that we need to get the underlying numpy array for the column so the data is now in this underscore df so we have to go like one level back because self is the you know is the current instance of string methods. Underscore df is the data frame, and then underscore data is the dictionary where it's held. So we're going to go ahead and get all that data. So let's go ahead and get that array. And this says raise a type error if it does not have kind O. So we're only going to we're only going to allow our users to call this if indeed we have an object data type. So if uh, value.dtype.kind, so if the kind is not um, uppercase O, which stands for object, then we're going to raise a type error. Just say the str accessor only works with strings. OK, good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to iterate over each value in the array. So uh, we're just going to go one by one down each value of this array. 
So we're going to just go for val in value. So we can iterate through a NumPy array simply like this. And we're going to, um, we're going to now call, um, we're going to pass in the string. So val is now a single string. So we're, value is a array of strings. So val is a single string. We're going to pass it in here to uh, the actual method. And we are going to give it any extra arguments that we have collected over here. So this is going to be the result. So what I suggest doing is creating an array. So we can say like new values, or you can just use a list and say new vals dot append uh, this result. So it will append uh, this result right here. Okay, so that's, uh, that's basically it. Um, so what we're gonna do here now is uh, we're gonna return a one column data frame. So let's return a one column data frame. So we're gonna return a data frame and we'll just go ahead and use the original column name and we'll have to convert this into a NumPy array and we'll put in new vowels as a list. So that should work. It's actually, uh, you know, it's quite simple. It's just a small amount of code here. So let's go test this out real quick on some actual data. So here's, uh, we'll, uh, we need to get a string column. So let's say we want to uppercase some string column. So the first thing we need to do is, if I press shift tab tab, well I don't actually have the documentation here so that's something we could probably work on. But we're just gonna give the name of the column here and that should uppercase it. So that looks good. So it looks like that is working. Now, one thing you might wanna do is, uh, you know, be aware of missing values. So, um, so if someone has a none, if val is none, for instance, um, then uh, we'll just, um, we can just append none. Um, so we won't actually touch uh, the data. We won't do anything if there's a none. So the, the string methods will just throw an error if there's a none in there. So we can just make an exception for that. So if, if one of the values is none, so if you have a missing value in your string column, we just won't do anything. We'll just append none and move on to the next uh, the next value. But this is the main thing. This is this is what actually does the transformation for us, and um, uh, you know we'll we'll do the string manipulation. So um, yeah, that's basically it. That's the that's the crux of it. You're simply iterating through a single column, and you're applying a string method to it, and you're passing along any extra arguments. Um, so for instance, let's see one with any extra arguments. Let's say df.str.count. So count has uh, you know several parameters here. Um, and oh, we'll just use one of them. We'll say count the number of i's in each one. And this will return, um, there's one i in each name over here. So maybe we can make it more interesting and I don't know, use state. California has two i's, uh, Texas. Um, has none. A is one letter that's in common to both. Um, okay, so that basically does it for string column. So now we have uh, quite a bit of firepower to deal with strings. Um, and that's thanks to uh, Python, which we're relying on. We're, we're, in this case, we're not relying on NumPy, we're relying on just core Python to do all of our string manipulation for us. And, and core Python has uh, excellent uh, string capabilities just naturally built into the language. Okay, so that does it. Oh, we have not actually tested, so um, we will need to do this. So let's run PyTest, and we're going to test the entire class test strings, and hopefully uh, this passes. So there's actually 25 tests that were just run, so probably one for each method, and they each passed. So that's good. All right, so that does it for step number 39.
Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 40, the read CSV function part 1. So completing this step will be the very last thing we do in this project and after it's done then the project will be complete. So it's a fairly difficult step which is why I've broken it up into two parts but the read CSV function is going to read in a comma separated value text file and return a data frame from it. Now the read CSV function is only going to be able to handle very simple data frames or simple text files. Text, uh, CSV text files can be very uh, difficult and there's not necessarily a standard for them. So ours is only going to handle the very simplest cases. We're not going to go and dig into edge cases of you know, uh, of, for CSVs. Um, so one thing to notice before we get started is that read CSV is a function. It is not a method. It is defined at the module level. So this is not part of the data frame class. You will not be accessing it with like df.readCSV. Instead, you'll be accessing it with like pdc.readCSV. So it is a function. It is not bound to any object. Um, and it will return a data frame. So this function has one parameter. The parameter is the, uh, the file location where the CSV is located in your file system. It's going to be a string. So fn is simply going to be where the file is located in your file system. Alright, so we need to begin to create a dictionary mapping the column names to the column values. So what we're going to do here is we're going to assume that the first row in this file, so the first line in this file, is going to contain the column names. So let's go ahead and assume that. And uh, before we get started coding, let's create um, a dictionary to hold all this data. So the dictionary will map the column name to the values. And since we won't know where, when we open the file how long the column is, what we're going to do is uh, create a default dictionary uh, with the default values as a list and just continually append each column value um, to the end of the list. So I'm going to go ahead and import uh, the default dictionary again. Now we could have imported default dict at the very top to the entire module. Um, but there's only two areas where we need it, so we're just going to uh, import it um, relatively, or not relatively, but we're only going to import it within the, uh, you know, the two places where we need it. So you could import it at the top. Uh, it's not really a big deal. We're just going to import it here so it's clear that we only need it in this function and the one other method from above, um, like in the pivot table method. Okay, so... Um, Normally we create some variable name called new data, but um, uh, before we get there, we'll just call it data. Um, new, uh, um, sorry, we'll say it's a, the default dict uh, will be a default dictionary um, of list. We'll just call it data for now because we'll create new data. Uh, we'll, we'll have to iterate through this one more time in order to, to convert it to a NumPy array. So for the time being, we'll just call it data and assign it as a default dictionary. All right, so what we're gonna do here is we need to open up this file. So we'll just say, we'll use the with statement and we're gonna pass in uh, this file name. So this will open it up. Uh, this is how you open up files in Python with the open function. And the with statement allows us to um, refer to this open file as f. So now f is the file and we're going to assume the first line in the file is the um, you know w where the column names are. So we're going to say the first line we're going to read there's a read line method for file for files. So that's going to read this so we're going to read that in. Um, and what we're going to do here, we'll read this in, and we'll just, we'll actually reassign it. Or actually, we could say we can even use a different variable. Say column names equals header. 
So <clears throat> at the end of uh, every line, there's going to be a new line character. So what we need to do here is strip it off with the strip method. So, for, so uh, backing up just a little bit, header is going to be a string of that very first line in the file. Okay, so it's a comma separated string. So it's a string with a bunch of uh, uh, column names separated by commas. The very last character is, is typically going to be a new line character. And we can use the strip method uh, in order to strip this from there. And then what we can do is we can use the split method which will split our string into, um, in, in, into a list. So it'll, wherever it sees a comma, it will, uh, it will make that split. Okay, so let's actually go ahead and, um, let's go ahead and actually just return the column names and see if this actually works with some actual data. So let's go back to our Jupyter Notebook and let's call pdc dot uh, read csv and there is a sample data file okay, it's called employee.csv and that looks good so it returned the very first row of that uh, csv now you can actually open up this csv in the notebook if you wish so if you go into the data folder or not in the notebook but using jupyter to open it up so if you click on this you'll actually able to open up the um, the CSV and you can see that it read everything in correctly that's that first line okay so I'll keep that open uh, just so we can refer back to it and let's go back to our code so we don't care about uh, uh, the column names here so we've opened that we've, we've extracted the column names so what we're gonna do here now is we need to iterate through every other line in the data frame so we have the column names as a list and that's good. So let's iterate through every other line in the file. So uh, files are iterable. So when you do this, a uh, line will take on the very next line in the file. So we read in the first line, so we're already on the second line of this file, F. So we need to basically do the same thing for, um, for the values here. So we could say values equal and then we could just say line dot do the same thing we'll strip away the last character and then we'll split on the comma so we're going to get all these values here um, so this is all the comma separated values and what we'll need to do here is um, so what we can do here is we can actually zip up the column names with the values and we can actually do an iteration here and we can say for call comma val in this zipped up uh, column names and values why don't we just uh, take the data dot call and append the val onto there okay so um, let's just unpack this real quick one more time so we're going to go through every other line in the file. So we're going to assume every other line in the file is some sort of data that's valid. That line is, uh, uh, ends, is going to end in a new line character. So we're going to strip that off. And then we're going to use the split method to split, the, um, uh, to split all the data on, on all the commas that it sees. And it will uh, return that as a list. So values is a list. Uh, same way as column names is a list. So these are going to be the same length. Uh, we're going to assume that they're the same length of the number uh, of, of items in every row of data. So we can zip them up and then we can iterate through each one and simply, um, uh, simply append whatever the current value is to that particular column. So this is going row by row, appending all this um, uh, appending each value one at a time. So um, let's re actually return data over here. So let's go ahead and run this again and I'll just assign this to this data and we can look at this. So here's the keys. So if I look at just the department key, I'll get a list of all the departments. So let's say string and we can look at all of the salaries 
for instance, and notice that they are written as strings here. So, so it looks good. So we've written all the data. It's very close to what we want. We have a dictionary of column names mapped to strings of all of our data in the CSV file. So that's all I wanted to complete in this step. In the next step, we're going to turn those into NumPy arrays and then finally create the data frame. So that does it for part one of step 40. Hey everybody and welcome to the next video for the project Build a Data Analysis Library from Scratch in Python. In this video we complete step 40, the read CSV function part two. Okay, so we ended up last time with a dictionary of the column names mapped to lists of strings. So we're very close to what we want, but we need to convert lists of strings into the correct data type. So if our list is consisting all of, like say, integers, then we, we don't want to have a, you know, a column that is of strings that are integers. We're going to assume that this column should be uh, an integer, not a string. So we're going to try to make this conversion and try to uh, have NumPy do it for us. So the first thing we're going to do is create a new data dictionary like we usually do. And then we're going to iterate through, um, we're going to iterate through these dictionary that we created from the last step. So we're going to go through every single key value pair. So call is a string and vowels is a list of strings. And so what we're going to try to do here is we're going to try to make a conversion. So we're going to go from the strictest conversion to the least strict. So that means that I'm going to try to convert whatever this list of strings into an integer first. If that doesn't work, then I'll try to move up and convert it to a list of strings. And if that doesn't work, I can convert it into, or sorry, a list of, uh, uh, convert it to floats. And if that doesn't work, I can convert it to, uh, you know, leave it as strings. So um, just to see, just to show you how this would work uh, with NumPy itself, So say we have some sort of uh, list, we'll just call it uh, A and uh, put in some numbers, just so you can see how this would work uh, with NumPy. If I, if I converted this to an array, number one, well, um, it's going to convert it to Unicode, it's going to keep it as a string, but you can try to, um, you can try to give it a particular data type. So particular data type. So if we try to do an integer here, it will actually convert it to an int. So that looks good. So if I do b and do b dot d type, it's converted it to a 64-bit int. Now, uh, so that works. Now, what if I had a decimal in here? So say 4.3, and I try to convert it to an integer. Excuse me, I didn't run that line of code. So um, NumPy raises a value error and says it can't do that. So in that case, if this doesn't work, then we'll move up to the next most flexible data type, which is a float, and it will make the conversion like that. So we're gonna begin by trying to convert the list of strings to an integer. So what we're gonna do here is, we're gonna put vowels in here, and we're gonna say d type equals int. So we're gonna to try to convert it to an integer. So let's do that. So we're going to try to make this conversion. And if it doesn't work, we're going to try something else. Okay, so we're going to try to do this. We're going to say new data of call will be assigned to this. So we're going to try to make this happen. If this doesn't work, we're going to, we're going to try something else. So we're going to say uh, new data of call is going to equal, we're going to try to make this uh, vowels into a float. Okay. So let's go back over here to the Jupyter Notebook. Now, if there's like a, a string in here, say somebody, act, there's an actual string in here, and I didn't close this off. So let me just say this for now, just so I can uh, have some working code here. So that's all that big pink mess was saying that there was a bug in my code and I just didn't close off the try except. All right, 
So if I try to convert this uh, list of strings into a NumPy array, I'm going to get another value error. So um, this is where we are going to fall back to the object um, you know, data type, and it will keep everything as a string. So that's our that's our last um, our last ditch effort is to just say we give up. Just keep just keep it as strings. We will not be able to uh, go any further here. So that should work. Now you might be wondering what about booleans? So our data frame is capable of having booleans. The problem is that um, NumPy doesn't do any sort of conversion. You can't even try to, it won't do the conversion if you say dtype equals bool if you have a, if you have a list of strings. So um, you'll have to do that manually after, um, after you read in the file. So there's not gonna be any way to convert uh, booleans uh, as an actual Boolean data type. So they'll be read in as just true and false strings, and then from there you can overwrite it with a Boolean uh, column. All right, so that looks like it should do it, and we just need to return now our data frame class with new data. Okay, so this is going one by one. It tries to do an integer. If that fails, it tries to do a float. Um, if that fails, then it's going to uh, just fall back to an object. So let's go ahead and um, read this in now. So let me, uh, let me delete this stuff. So we're up here and let's read this in so no errors. And lo and behold, we have our data frame. Um, and we can check the D types see if it worked out. So string, 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 and then salary got read in as an integer. So everything is looking good there. Okay. Um, last thing is the test. Uh, last test is read CSV. So it's an entire class. So read test, read CSV. And there were four tests in there and they all passed. All right, so that was the very last thing. So now you can read in simple CSV files uh, with, uh, with this code, with the read CSV function. Okay, so um, let's make sure that we actually can pass all the tests. So if you just type in PyTest by itself, you'll be able to run all, uh, all the tests and there's 96 and they all passed. All right, good. So we got 100%. Okay, all right. So this actually uh, completes uh, this sort of, um, you know, you've checked off all the, the tests and we've completed every single one of them, all 96 of them, all 40 steps. I'm going to have one more video uh, coming up next that's going to uh, sort of wrap this up and, and, uh, and uh, you know, conclude the project. Hopefully it was a, a lot of fun uh, building your own, uh, data analysis library from scratch and um, so that this uh, this completes step number 40. Hey everybody and welcome to the last video for the project build a data analysis library from scratch in Python. I really hope you had a lot of fun uh, building the entire project. It is a lot of work um, but it is a project that you can refer back to and actually continue to improve um, for for quite some time, uh, it's it's one of my favorite things to do is to develop libraries completely from scratch, and um, to just uh, you know really take a hold of, of the, the the ecosystem that Python offers to developers and um, kind of just do whatever I want with with the language. So with that said, there's still uh, quite a bit more to do in this project if you wish. Uh, number one is that. Um, there are many different implementations for the methods that you could probably come up with. Some might be better or even faster than the ones that I developed. So I wasn't necessarily going for the very fastest implementations, but uh, typically focus on the, you know, the cleanest and the clearest uh, implementations during the during the project. So you can go through and. Um, you know, now that you have the unit test, especially, you can feel comfortable going through, going back, 
and rewriting some of the code and you know uh, and seeing if you can if you can get it working a little bit better uh, an, an obvious thing that uh, you should think about doing is just adding more functionality so there's a, quite a lot of functionality that can can be added to the project and <clears throat> uh, one way to figure out what kind of functionality you'd like to add is to simply go to the pandas um, you know documentation and to read up on some of the methods and functions that are available to it and to implement those um, for yourself. For, so for instance, say you want to add in functionality to read in data from a SQL database. Well, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, you can write an, a function for that. Um, you know, if you wanted to write a group by uh, method, you know, that's a very powerful method um, that we did not do, but we, we, we sort of implemented in one scenario with, with pivot table. But um, regardless, there's lots of other functionality that's available, and I encourage you to look into pandas and to take some of the uh, methods that we did not implement and put them into uh, pandas cub. Uh, there's, uh, so if you do add more functionality, you need to write tests. You absolutely need to write the unit tests. And just you can, if you look inside the test data frame.py, um, uh, file, you'll be able to see how I wrote the tests, and you can, uh, you should more or less be able to just uh, follow that pattern of test writing and write your own tests whenever you write more functionality. You can even write tests on cases that were not covered uh, during the project. So, um, yeah, testing is, is a, something you can definitely expand on. There's also many more special methods that we did not, uh, that, that we did not get into. So, for instance, the abs uh, uh, special method, dunder abs, can be used to um, make your data frame object work whenever someone calls the abs function in Python. So, and there's many more like that. Um, so, to do to to figure out what kind of special methods are available, uh, I I've already recommended this, but you really need to look at the Python data model. And actually read the entire document um, from the beginning. It's a very, very long document, but it is an extremely important one, and probably one of the most important ones uh, in the entire uh, in the actual documentation itself. So if you go through here, you'll learn um, quite a bit more about uh, you know what is available in Python itself, and. <clears throat> You'll be able to implement even more special methods so that your data frame can, you know, uh, operate with, you know, other functions and other operators built into the language. Okay, so that basically does it for this project. I hope you had a lot of fun again uh, building it. I'm going to have many more videos to come. Uh, you can also check out my website. I have lots of tutorials on my website. I have a new book coming out called Master Data Analysis with Python. So lots of good stuff. Hopefully you can uh, stick with me and subscribe and stay tuned for lots of other um, projects involving the Python data science ecosystem.